22. So uh, not only is it an incredible day on the calendar, uh, we are getting quite a bit of snow. So everybody be safe out there. It's also uh, the very first meeting uh, for me to take over the chair from our uh, unbelievable ch uh, past chair, Matt Ryan, and also for uh, Geronimo Vasquez to take over the vice chair uh, from Lena Fowler. And, and uh, we will be uh, acknowledging and honoring their past service as chair and vice chair here in our agenda this morning. Uh, but before we get there, uh, let's go ahead and introduce the supervisors. I'm Patrice Horseman, the new chair from District 1, uh, District 2. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeronimo Vasquez, and I'm a supervisor for District 2 and the newly elected uh, vice chair. And District 3. District 3, I get to announce myself as District 3 representative, the best of the best districts. <laughs> Just like men in black, you know? <laughs> And, and District 4. Good morning, everyone. It's always nice to be here and, um, and be um, talking about issues at hand. I just want to say good morning. It's a nice day out there. We needed this. Um, I didn't wash my face with the, the, the snow, and that's what we used to do a long time ago. So I'm up and ready to go, and we do have a long agenda, and I want to thank all the Steve, you and your staff and my other colleagues, you know, thank you for everything. Very good. And District 5, Lena Fowler it did indicate to us that she would be traveling for um, county business to Winder Rock today. And I have a feeling she may have left us a little early, which we're disappointed because we do have a recognition coming up, but uh, maybe she'll join us. Uh, uh, the weather may be bad or we may have some internet connection problems out there. Uh, so with that, uh, members of the board, uh, good morning, and it is time for the Pledge of Allegiance. And Lindsay, can you please put up our American flag since we're doing this virtually? <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you members of the board and members of the public. And now is the time on our agenda, which is call to the public. And as you know, uh, we at every, the beginning of our board me meetings allow the public to address the board on items that are not contained in the agenda. Uh, this is the time for the public to speak on behalf of matters uh, and to address the board. However, the open meeting law, since these are not matters on the agenda, prohibits the board from discussing these items or considering these items at this time. Uh, if, if we can, we could elect to put them on a future agenda for future official action or discussion. Uh, individuals who would like to uh, be heard under the call to the public uh, are allowed to appear virtually. And Lindsay, in just a minute, will explain how to do this. Uh, you are limited to, uh, to three minutes. And Lindsay's our timer on our call to the public as well as our public hearings. Uh, and we do ask uh, that you are respectful and professional in your comments here for call to the public. So members of the public, now is your time uh, to uh, address the board. And Lindsay, could you please ex explain how to do that? Yes, thank you, Chair Horseman. If you would like to make a public comment at this time, you can hover at the bottom of your screen and there should um, be an icon that looks like a hand that says raise hand. If you click on that little icon, that will raise your hand to make us aware that you would like to speak. If you have joined us by telephone and you would like to make a comment, you're gonna hit star nine on your phone and that will essentially raise your hand so that we can see that you would like to speak. So go ahead and hit the raise hand icon or hit star nine if you're on the phone and would like to speak. And at this time, Chair Horseman, I do not see any hands raised um, for public we'll, comment. We'll give one more call. This is the time members of the public for public comment. Uh, if any of you would like to address the board, now is your time to do so. 
Anything, Lindsay? No, nope, not at this time, Chair Horseman. All right. Well, thank you very much. And, and members of the public and members of the staff, uh, you know, now is our time for uh, the recognition of the transition for the chair and the vice chair. Uh, and uh, both uh, Geronimo and I are uh, going to be uh, addressing you all and the public here in just a minute. But before that, and most importantly, uh, and I am going to get rid of my background screen for this uh, so that I can actually, so there, you, now you see my messy office. Um, you know, obviously this has been a very, very challenging year. Uh, and we were very lucky here on the Board of Supervisors to have the leadership of Chair Ryan and Vice Chair Lena Fowler. Um, uh, obviously, uh, they served a little longer than normal, uh, which uh, was, I think, a recognition of the trying times we had. We had a brand new board. Um, we also came on during the middle of a pandemic. Uh, you know, we had the vaccine rollout and our staff did a, a tremendous job as did our board members and really going across the county to encourage the vac vaccines. Uh, testing, first drive up testing uh, in the state here in Coconino County. And then of course, the rollouts of the of boosters. Um, we had to oversee virtual office spaces all across the county and county staff and with the board itself. Um, and of course, we had fires. Uh, in fact, uh, five fires that at one time or another this last summer threatened here in Coconino County. We also uh, experienced post wildfire floodings, uh, both Supervisor Vasquez and my, our, I should say Vice Chair Vasquez and myself um, and our districts uh, had a number of post wildfire uh, flooding that occurred here this summer with our monsoons. Um, and we wrote new written rules and procedures for our board. Um, we had many zoning hearings. Some of them were very contested. Um, they, the chair and our vice chair led us through the budget of last year. They also led us through redistricting uh, and, of course, ARPA uh, and, and helped us with our ARPA funding and adding to the budget. So this last year was unbelievably momentous times. Uh, and certainly being the chair and the vice chair, added additional burden and commitment and responsibilities. And so I know uh, that I speak for uh, my uh, colleagues in giving an extensive thank you so much uh, to both Matt and to Judy for your time, your commitment, your love of Coconino County. So we so appreciate what you've done for us. And, and I know that both of my colleagues would al also like to say a few words on that and then we're going to have some gifts and a little presentation for you, Matt, and, and uh, Lena in absentia. So uh, Vice Chair Vasquez, um, well, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Thank you, Chair Horseman. Uh, I'd like to start off by just saying thank you to Supervisor Ryan and Supervisor Fowler for their leadership over this last year and allowing us as the new supervisors to have time to grow into our position and grow into a, a, the opportunity of taking on a leadership role. And their mentorship has been uh, crucial in preparing both of us and to get to this point to be able to take on this leadership role. And just really wanna thank them for, uh, for all their advice. Uh, Matt, all the times that, that, that the phone calls that you gave me, especially when I was first starting and you know had deer in the headlights and wasn't really sure what I was doing. And your phone calls really helped guide me and, and helped me uh, Help me stay on path and, and understand the role better. So I really appreciate that. And then for, for Lena, for, for her, her uh, taking me under her wing and, and showing me some of the ins and outs of, of, uh, uh, of being a supervisor and how to, how to address certain issues and, and whatnot, uh, again, invaluable. And so I really appreciate both of, both of you for your leadership, both of you for your mentorship and everything that you've done to help prepare us to take on these leadership roles. So thank you. Judy. Yes, uh, good morning, um, <clears throat> uh, everyone. I just want to thank uh, Matt and Lena also, you know, for their um, leadership, you know, and really kind of stepping up and showing us the, the ropes, the ins and outs of, you know, being a, a board member. 
I think you know that um, their expertise and uh, we learn from that and their 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 intervention and you know guidance you know really helped us. And so I just wanted to say thank you to both of them you know for the hard work and. We know it's um, time uh, beyond just being at board meetings and stuff like that, uh, as far as uh, administrative um, working with the um, county manager and stuff like that. So I just wanna say thank you so much. And, you know, there's a reason why people in these positions, you know, they see these same qualities, you know, all the way around the board and, you know, and they they, they believe in us. And, and that's how I, you know, um, accept that, you know, what was coming down, you know, from both, um, uh, the, the, the chair and the vice chair. So I would greatly appreciate them for all the work that they've done. And, it's, and you know, uh, we're all busy and we're, you know, we're trying to, um, with the pandemic here, you know, it's been kind of hard, but, you know, we, we managed to, you know, pull through and continue with the operations. And with Steve coming on back on again, that was a big plus because he knew the ins and outs of the administration way back and so, I just want to say thank you. you know, I think we have a good team and, you know, we understand each other's, you know, as far as getting things done because it's not only the uh, indigenous people that we serve, you know, it's everyone within uh, Cook Community County. And, and that's, that's what's you know, so unique about it. You know, it's just not one thing, it's everything. So thank you, Matt. Thank you for your, you know, and Lena also, if you're listening, I just would really appreciate both of you so much and thank you. And I did just get from Lindsay that it looks like um, uh, both Lena and Miranda are in Window Rock and they're um, having some technical difficulties, so they may not uh, be able to join us here this morning. So um, I'm sorry we're going to miss them. So now we would like to uh, basically extend a small token of our appreciation. Um, first, first, we got the gavel. And I already hit you over. No, already, we've already been playing with this gavel, both uh, a former chair. Oh, he's got, see, he's got one right there. We've had dueling gavels going on. So that was lots of fun. And, um, and I know, uh, chair, uh, former chair Ryan, you've got a lot of these, but uh, we are going to have one that will be also engraved uh, with your leadership uh, from this uh, last year uh, so that you can add to your collection. Again, just showing uh, the, the leadership and the commitment that you have given here to Coconino County. So um, that will be coming. It's going to take about 10 days, but we'll make sure to get it to your office um, for you. And then um, we, of course, in Coconino County are just so um, pleased to have such talented staff members. And, uh, you know, not only do they do a phenomenal job um, here in the county and their commitment to us here in the county, but we also have some that are extremely talented woodworkers as well. And uh, Tom Hanacek uh, is one of them. And uh, uh, Tom, thanks for joining us. Our facilities ma uh, management director um, wanted to do something very unique and special to honor um, uh, both uh, former chair Ryan and former vice chair Fowler. And so I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna show these incredible, beautiful items and Tom, would you mind just talking about them and, ex and explaining how you did this? Yeah. Here is Matt's desk, little uh, pen and desk organizer. And then we have Lena's with Coconino County emblazed across the top. They're really beautiful. So Tom, let us know about these that you made. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, uh, Sue Brown called me a couple of weeks ago because I built various projects for uh, some of our new newer renovations in the buildings, including smaller tables for uh, casual staff areas. So Sue approached me and of course I'd never pass up a chance to, uh, to hand build something uh, in appreciation for uh, my appreciation of both Supervisor Ryan and Supervisor Fowler for the advocates they've been uh, for employees and for the organization as a whole over the years but also as a voice for the rest of the employees in the organization. So of course my brain started going immediately. Sue so was concerned if I didn't have enough time, but we'll always make time for projects like this. So the wood used in Matt's um, holder there is actually from the 89A realignment project that uh, resulted in a lot of trees cut down on the front of Fort Tuthill there. A lot of that lumber was milled 
uh, intended to be used on projects specifically for storage sheds at the Bike Park Archery Range, Sawmill, uh, Friends of uh, Will Willow Bend Gardens, uh, the Wildlife Drinker out of Rogers Lake, a slew of a slew of projects over the years. So I cruised over to Parks and Rec and grabbed a piece of wood, and it turned out beautiful. So that is from District Three. And it is uh, wood that I forget when that project happened. It had three or four or five, seven years ago. I forget now. It's all it's all kind of a blur. So I hope you enjoy it. It does have the blue stain in it, um, which is very trendy these days. So uh, it'll look very hip on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> so for for um, Supervisor Fowler's wood. Uh, that is that was harvested um, back last spring, and that was actually harvested in District Five, about 20 miles south of Page near Copper Mine. Uh, and a big thanks to Robert and Sue Yellowman, who are the um, uh, the in-laws of one of our employees, Sean Williams. So we were able to actually go on reservation land and cut some juniper limbs down and the original intent for that wood was to build a frame for the memorial plaque for Alta Edison that'll show up in the 110 lobby. And I had a couple extra pieces and it's not very easy to get juniper from District 5 so I ended up milling hers out of the District 5 juniper and it is uh, it's a tough wood to work with but it definitely is beautiful. So again it was my pleasure. Thank you for the last year and for the last 20 plus uh, Supervisor Ryan and, and, and for Supervisor Fowler the last 12. So it was my pleasure. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> they truly, they truly, truly are beautiful. And um, I promise I will bring them to the office for, to put into your, <laughs> your office, Matt, and also Lena's, but it's the hard, the hard to part with. They're, they really are wonderful pieces. And, and Tom, thank you for your talent and generosity on that. And, and uh, Matt, uh, we're gonna, now is your time. And we wanted to give Lena some time too, but. Uh, uh, well, that first and foremost, thank you to everyone. And, oh my gosh, you have the, the Renaissance man uh, making the uh, special project. Uh, Tom, uh, you know, uh, just getting to know you over the years, watching all your skill sets. Uh, uh, really, uh, really appreciate it. And how apropos, not only that, but uh, roads and safety. That was the big issue associated with 89 and uh, 89A in this case, uh, uh, a safety project that, that really came through. And now, now it's a great cycling route as well. Uh, kind of out my back door, which is kind of neat. So, you know, I, I, I was going to put this on after I thank you guys, but since we're talking about riding uh, Oh my gosh, I'm doing it wrong. Riding off on my bicycle on cycling on 89A. I better put this on too. <laughs> Appropriate uh, uh, <laughs> wardrobe. Um, I, but uh, and, and uh, Patrice, uh, uh, Geronimo, Judy, uh, really, I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and I, you know, I wrote down some notes. So I'll be a little bit redundant because. Uh, we were in extraordinary times. Uh, and I'll tell you, something that was put on the three of your plates uh, was, oh my gosh, you know, not only did coming through the election, which was really, uh, you know, uh, one that kind of changed people's, uh, I, I, I don't know, there was an increased level of anxiety, I guess, uh, that, that resulted in that uh, coming in. And, and while we're doing that, we're, we're stepping right into uh, uh, the COVID, the crisis, uh, you know, the unknown for the community. Um, you know, it, it was a lot of uh, coordination that we need to shore up. Uh, and and you, you were there, uh, right place, right time uh, to come in. Uh, as we navigated this, everything I kept watching from each one of you was, you would be reading up, you'd be paying attention, be very thoughtful. And it was we as a board, we as staff working together uh, to make the right decisions. Uh, and so uh, COVID, you know, just stayed with us and kept coming back. But at the beginning of the year, we had an unknown budget. We, COVID impacted everything. We didn't even know for what kind of budget we would have. What are we gonna do? Uh, and, and to step in that budget, uh, uh, it was tough. It was tough for everybody uh, uh, for, you know, they, 
we're a service agency. So when you have a crisis, people come to us and we need more people and, and more revenue, but we have less. Uh, and, you know, that, you know, we uh, take credit from a number of years of financial planning, many people contributing. Uh, but uh, fortunately, we were able to navigate uh, through again, as we did with the Great Recession, getting through those uh, uh, tough months. Uh, but, but we went through that. But then we had, uh, you know, a, a sudden uh, uh, change in school superintendent. And again, right decision under unique times. We made an appointment this case, in this case. But we had such a professional, a really good go-to uh, in, in Jerome Mango pageant. So we had that happen. Uh, and, and that worked out really well. So we're just starting to get into our business and get things moving along. And we're trying to figure out, you know, where our, where our best are, what are we going to do? Uh, but then uh, Liz Archuleta got her federal appointment. Uh, and uh, a, a, a loss of somebody that's been here for a number of years and done so many wonderful things, um, you know, a, a huge vacuum uh, in, in uh, having Liz leave us. Uh, and we were confronted with, you know, not quite the Cheryl Mango pageant, how do we do an appointment? But we put together, all together as a board, we put together a really good process. And, and you know, Geronimo, you shined uh, through those interviews. Uh, and so there's a reason we selected you. You really did shine uh, through the interviews. You really cared for the community, very thoughtful, and really great to have you really join us and help us. Uh, walk through what we're doing. But then the whole year continued. We're continuing under COVID for everybody out there. You know, what are we going through? We were on the phone from the beginning of the day to the uh, end of the night, contacting the governor's office, uh, contacting the senator's office, congressman's office. Uh, what is the next thing to do? Who would be the right person uh, to handle what's going on? What's staff getting? Uh, what are the recommendations? How can we advise the community? So we had to work our way through that. Uh, and then uh, management disruption. Uh, Jimmy retired on us. And, uh, and what are we going to do? And how do we go about it? We had uh, a very special guy out there in the community that had been with us uh, before. Uh, but uh, we as a board coming together uh, to you know, pause for a minute, take a look at what our options were. Do we go out to recruitment or you know, we have somebody that we really need it. And, and Steve, uh, to have you come back, uh, you know, really uh, at this point in your career, bringing additional experience back, uh, you were what we all needed as an organization and as a board. So, uh, you know, very special uh, to have you to come back to help, uh, uh, help us uh, transition and, and provide that stability. And as you noted, Patrice, we had the fires, including Raphael, where we're ready to evacuate, potentially Kachina, Mountaineer, maybe Flagstaff. Uh, uh, we didn't know. Uh, and we were very fortunate uh, associated with that. The museum fire, we had been waiting for uh, over a year with bags in place telling everybody, don't take them down. It will flood. And it did flood. Uh, and uh, actually, our hydrology reports, again, counting on staff as well as uh, our contract agents, they were accurate in terms of the, what we anticipated in terms of volume. So uh, uh, really unique cases. Uh, land cases were difficult, uh, challenging, and having them right off the bat, coming right into them, uh, very difficult. Um, and then we have the federal proposals that come rolling through, the CARES Act, and then the American Rescue Plan Act. And then we have the infra that we haven't even gotten to. We're trying to wrap up the uh, uh, ARPA. There's a lot of work that goes on associated with these. And, uh, and the work for anything that we put out there, there's five times as much work that our staff in the background are doing. Um, we have unprecedented times uh, for visitation, which is impact to our public lands. We're seeing it in the summer, we're seeing it in the winter. And it plays into our budget, you know, uh, the impacts to the sheriff's office, uh, you know, trying to just handle the volumes. We have a metro level of impact to a small community, a small tax base. And how do we manage that? 
uh, the courts backed up. We're looking at that and what to do because of the impact of uh, COVID. Uh, and then we're into a, a recovery, but then Delta comes along and then Omicron. Every time we think we're going to be able to come back and meet with each other and talk to each other. And the drawback about that for the sake of this board, and you know, we've navigated it so well, uh, we're doing this virtually. Uh, and you lose that you know, we're, we're humans as creatures. We, we gather together. Uh, we interact with each other. And we had that uh, uh, nonverbal verbal communication, that, that opportunity of just uh, coming together, removed from us, as has happened with the rest of the community. Uh, and yet we had to conduct a, a regular business, but do it in virtual meetings. Uh, and uh, uh, it is an art. <laughs> so Patrice, I think you'll, you'll do quite well with it, but, uh, but it can be challenging to, uh, to work through uh, virtual meetings through the year. So I want to compliment you know, uh, this board uh, you know, for, for working through it, making really good deci decisions to do in your prep work, uh, to really caring about the community. Uh, our staff, that have just been working so hard. There is a fatigue factor out there that we want to pay attention to as, as we move forward. Um, we've, we've also worked through, as noted, redistricting federal and state. We still need to work on our own for the supervisory uh, districts for our communities. To top it off, while we're going through that, we have to make an appointment to a senator. And, and so uh, uh, a really wonderful decision I didn't know if we'd have candidates up until like the day before. <laughs> and then suddenly we had great candidates that, that came through. So it's a, it's a extraordinary times. It was a year of chaos. Uh, and to come on and to be able to handle that, work together, uh, all of us, uh, you know, that is such a key pace. Uh, for Lena as vice chair, she's always been there, ready to fill uh, her mentoring uh, of Geronimo uh, in NACO. Uh, she, she's always been there, and, and Lena, uh, you know, when I needed her to fill, uh, uh, she would she would do that. If I needed to talk to her, it was easy to reach out to her. Um, uh, Steve, uh, you and staff, you rock. You've continued to rise to the challenge. Uh, this next year, you know, I think what we we're, we're moving from chaos to settling, but we'll still work through some some chaos. Uh, comes with the job as well, so uh, that's a piece. So, um, you know, with that, I, I'm very happy to pass it off. We have, you know, next great leaders. I mean, you guys are leaders already. I, I'm not next great or anything like that. Uh, Patrice, you'll do a great job. Geronimo, you'll be there and, and helping out, supporting. And it looks like you're already teaming up with each other. Uh, we as a board, uh, you know, I'm sure we're behind you uh, working on that. So I'll end my chairmanship. And this should be, hopefully, we'll see my final chair chairmanship. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I always say, I, today's the beginning of the rest of our lives. We have everything to look forward to. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, special guests, thank you, uh, Tom, uh, Sue, great idea. And you guys are organizing me too. So uh, that, that's good. Tammy's trying to do that. Oh, and I lost Greg. You know, I, lost, I got to cry, but I got Tammy. So thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, good year. Thank you all. I appreciate it. And Madam Chair? Yeah, yes. <laughs> if I, I could, uh, yeah. Madam Chair, if I could offer just a few words also from the staff perspective. Absolutely. Um, so Madam Chair and Vice Chair and to Supervisor Matt Ryan and Supervisor Lena Fowler, thank you for being who you are. Uh, your roles in, in, in the chair and vice chair positions have helped us, have helped navigate us through some very uh, challenging times. Uh, your, your, your demeanor, your calmness uh, have, have actually kind of helped me get grounded on more than one occasion. Uh, when, when I thought things were getting a little out of hand, uh, Matt was the calming voice at the other end of the phone to say, it'll be okay, you know, we just gotta sort it out and work through it. Uh, and I will miss, and truly the, the daily 6 a.m. calls from, from the chair. Although I don't expect that from the incoming chair, uh, I think that uh, Supervisor Matt Ryan will continue to reach out just to say, hey, but again, it's been very special and to Supervisor Fowler for her guidance and her wisdom in a lot of different situations. So on behalf of the manager's office 
and and in the appointed uh, leadership, uh, I will uh, certainly extend our thanks and appreciation. I know our constitutional officers uh, will wish you the same uh, through their through their uh, uh, channels. But again, thanks so much. Uh, appreciate it, and uh, looking forward to working with uh, Chair uh, Horseman and Vice Chair Vasquez in in this new year that we see ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Any Thank other you, comments from the staff or any other comments? Thank you, everybody. All right. Well, thank you so much and, and uh, really appreciate it. And I know that uh, it's, you know, your your duty in, is not done and we'll be looking to you. You know that, Matt. So we know you're going to be available from 5 a.m. to at least 8 p.m., right? <laughs> and, and of course, this is a symbolic passing of the gavel. Uh, and uh, our new vice chair, um, uh, Geronimo Vasquez, um, want to give an opportunity for uh, you to say a few words as well. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Chair Horseman. I almost said Chair Ryan. I'm still I'm still so used to that. <laughs> uh, I just want to again say thank you for this opportunity and thank you and the trust in the board and electing me in this position. And I'm looking forward to taking on these new leadership responsibilities moving forward. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the staff because the whole staff that I've worked with in the county over this last year has continually impressed me with their professionalism and, and their desire to help service the folks of Coconino County. And so I, I thank you and salute you and, and also uh, look forward to working with all of you moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Vice Chair Vasquez. And, and I think that both Vice Chair Vasquez and I are going to make a very good team for Coconino County. And uh, we have had a, a, a lot of experience working uh, together uh, for the best interests of our county here during the, the Museum of uh, Fire Scar flooding areas. And, and you know, our districts are right next to each other. So we do overlap uh, on a lot. And I look forward to serving uh, with Vice Chair Vasquez. And I know I also have the support of my colleagues. I, I got a call this morning from Judy Begay, who was very clear and she told me, just don't screw up. So uh, thanks, Judy, and, and I know that I can count on you and, and count on you for, for calling and giving me uh, a heads up or, or a, hit, you know, a, a slap across my head if I need one. So I, I so appreciate uh, your input and the input of my colleagues. And, and I also want to acknowledge our tremendous staff because as, as uh, uh, Matt said, you know, for every hour we spend, you know, we've got 100 hours that our, our staff has spent getting the work done, preparing uh, us for what we need to know and being able to assist us in helping to set some direction here for the county. And I also got to call out Lindsay Daly. I, I mean, I got to say, I don't know how we could do this uh, without Lindsay there. Uh, helping uh, the board uh, in preparation for these board meetings and just keeping it all together and keeping it all together with a smile. I mean, how do you do that? But for some reason, Lindsay's able to do that. And, and then, of course, we have such a great administrative team. Um, I'm county manager, Steve Peru. Uh, you know, he has he righted the ship when it got, you know, when it was in stormy waters and helped us through some very, very trying times. And uh, I know that he will be there uh, for uh, us to lean on, for me to personally lean on. And also the other, the deputy uh, county uh, manager, Sue Brown and uh, Lucinda Andriani. I mean, you've always been there. Um, Lucinda, I think you were born at the county. It seems like you've been there a long time. <laughs> Um, and, and I think that it's, uh, I'm really, again, I know that we can count on you and the rest of this great administrative team. And so I said that um, Vice Chair Vasquez and myself make a good team, but actually this board and this administration and our employees, we all make a good team necessary to provide the services we need for Coconino County. So uh, thank you so much. Um, we look forward to carrying on the leadership of uh, Matt Ryan and Lena and uh, look forward, of course, to uh, carrying our great team forward. And with that, let's get back to the agenda. <laughs> uh, so, Madam, Chair, uh, yes. Madam Chair, if I could make a quick comment on the order of the agenda. Yes. Uh, of course, uh, we're going to be doing the consent, but just for the afternoon sessions. 
uh, just for the benefit of the public that may be online right now. So immediately after lunch, we'll be doing the facilities management discussion. And then at 3 p.m. is when we're, we're estimating, we'll begin the discussion on the American Rescue Plan process. And so just for, for individuals that may be joining us today, just so that they can plan out their day accordingly, uh, facilities will be at one o'clock and then the, the American Rescue Plan, the ARPA discussion uh, uh, re regarding the community partnership funding, that will occur at about 3 p.m. this afternoon. So again, uh, just to make that announcement, Madam Chair, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, County Manager. Appreciate that. So, all right. Well, uh, we're moving on with our agenda. Uh, and now we have reached a time here on the consent agenda. Uh, for those of you that may be new to the board meetings, uh, items under the consent agenda are really considered by the board in one motion and in one vote. These are matters that are usually more routine or administrative in nature. Uh, and if any member of the board or a member of the staff is requesting discussion, we will remove it from the consent agenda and that item will be discussed and decided separately. Otherwise, the consent agenda is done through one motion uh, and uh, is considered uh, as, as one matter. So I have been informed by our staff that we need to remove item seven and that will be brought back to us at the March 1st board meeting. So members of the board, are there any other items that board members may want to consider from the consent agenda separately? Any items to consider separately? Then if no items are going to be removed from the consent agenda, I need a motion from a supervisor to consider our consent agenda items two through 13, having removed item seven. I move, I so move. We have a motion to accept the consent agenda. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Vice Chair Vasquez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstention? It, it passes unanimously. Members of the board, we now have another consent agenda item, but this time it is for us to resolve as the jail district board of directors. Do I have a motion to resolve as the jail district board of directors? So moved. There's a motion by Supervisor Begay. Is there a second? Yeah, I'm stand off. <laughs> I'll go ahead and second it. Okay. Yeah. Heard you second Thank you, it Chair Ryan, our former <laughs> Chair Ryan. I appreciate that. We have a second to resolve as the Jail District Board of Directors. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All those ab abstention? It passes unanimously. We are now sitting as the Jail District Directors. Uh, we have item number 14 is the Jail District Consent Agenda, consideration of possible action to approve amendment 004 to inter intergovernmental agreement with the Arizona Health Co uh, Care Cost Containment System or access to change the rates for provided health care for qualified inmates of the detention facility during SFY 22 and the estimated amount of $15,000. Is there a motion to accept the jail district consent agenda? We have a motion. Madam Chair, I'll, I'll go ahead and move that we approve the consent agenda. Supervisor Ryan, thank you for the motion. Do we have a second to that motion? Or I'll director, second. I should say. Director Vasquez has a second. All those in favor of the jail district consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any objection? Any abstention? It passes unanimously. I have now, I need a motion for us to resolve back as the Board of Supervisors. Do I have a motion to resolve as the Board of Supervisors? I'll move. Uh, a motion by Supervisor or Director Begay. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Director Vasquez. All those in favor of resolving as the Board of Supervisors? Aye. Aye. It was unanimous. Uh, we are now the Board of Supervisors. 
Uh, we have a number of discussion and possible action items on this. Uh, number 15, which is where we are, is discussion updates and possible directives to staff regarding state and federal legislative priorities, legislative and administrative updates. Uh, County Manager, um, are you going to handle this or is this Trey? No, this is Trey. Uh, we do need to get him promoted to panelist. There he is. So Trey will provide the next portion of the agenda. Trey. Good morning, Trey. Chair Horseman, congratulations to you and Supervisor, and excuse me, Vice Chair Vasquez. That has a nice ring to it. Vice Chair Vasquez, uh, appreciate uh, being with you here today. I'm just pulling up my presentation. Okay, very good. So let me just. Yeah, I'd just like to point out, former Chair Ryan, we're 15 minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> okay. Madam Chair. Uh, we, the, the chair no longer is coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <you. laughs> okay, Madam Chair, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks so much uh, for, again, it's a pleasure being with you here this morning, supervisors um, and staff, to give you a legislative update. Uh, and just we'll briefly give a, a broad overview of how the legislature uh, has been completing its work, um, and then just go into some bills of interest that uh, the board uh, would like the board to be aware of that are advancing through the process and that we may need to articulate our position on a little bit uh, more clearly. So on, uh, so just as a reminder, it's uh, the, our, our state legislative team is me. My name is Trey Williams. I'm the public affairs director here at Cocomino County. And then we also work with Todd Medeska. Medexa, excuse me, of Elevated Advocacy. Uh, just uh, as I do every update, just wanna give you an overview of the timeline so that you understand where we are at in the session. Uh, we are currently, obviously, just last week was the last day to hear bills in a committee of the originating chamber. So what that means is, is that House bills had to be heard in their House committees, Senate bills had to be heard in their Senate committees as of last week. So we saw packed committee agendas, in fact, the Senate Government Committee um, having to meet twice a week in order to conduct and complete its business. Uh, and so the bills that were not heard or advanced through their standing committees as of last week are now essentially dead, except there are strike everything amendment possibilities in either chamber. What that means is they can take an existing bill at the committee level and before that legislative standing committee can introduce an amendment that removes everything in the bill and then it replaces it with whatever's in that amendment. So we are always looking out for those types of amendments, but this is this week is what they know uh, is what is known as crossover week. Um, so basically, this gives both chambers the ability to first and second read the bills um, that have passed uh, the chamber, um, and then to prepare for the bills that will then move through the rest of the process. And, and head over into either chamber. So um, we are, you know, it's an important milestone in the legislature's work. And so we are moving right along. So just to give you some session statistics, we've had 44 days of session, uh, seems a lot longer, but just a little over a month. Uh, bills introduced, we, so the last time we spoke, I think I had only reported that we had a little over a thousand. Well, we, we went well past that for this session. And since both of those session introduction deadlines have passed, we're looking at 1,678 bills introduced this session. Uh, and one bill has passed, um, and then uh, which is actually related to uh, the uh, special session monies that were passed for wildfire response. Um, during uh, at last year, last June. And so one of the, the bill that has passed is the bill that would allow those property owners to, uh, to private, private property owners to access that funding if they don't get other emergency funding. And that bill was uh, signed by the governor. Uh, and then uh, for more memorials and resolutions posted, we've had 131 resolutions and there have been four memorials or resolutions passed. Uh, as part of this part, uh, portion of the update, um, I also wanted to just note that they did address the alternative expenditure limit for schools that was looming. 
Um, you will recall that the legislature had until March 1st to authorize additional expenditure authority for schools um, in order for them to continue operating. Otherwise, they would have to shutter operations as they wouldn't have that budgetary authority. Um, so the House actually introduced a bill last week um, and were able to move it through the chambers uh, before they completed their work on Thursday, or move, move it through the chamber. And the Senate actually uh, was able to cobble together the votes. Both, both chambers required a two thirds vote to do that. And yesterday the Senate did vote by a two thirds margin to um, advance that resolution, uh, giving that, uh, the, that expenditure limit authority. Um, and so now that has been transmitted to the Secretary of State. So one of the big ticket items that the legislature had to get done this session uh, was completed as of yesterday. Um, however, they still have a variety of other business. And so I wanted to just now go into uh, an update on uh, lists. So I'm gonna have to share a different screen here if you will excuse me right quick. Um, pull up this list so I can just go over some bills of interest and that will complete my update. Can you see my screen that has the list of bills? Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, so I just, this is just a brief listing of bills that are impacting the county. So I wanted you all to be aware of some of those that are on this list. Uh, whoops. Okay, there we go. Uh, and so the, just to go through a few of them, these first uh, two, 2009 and 2276, um, I kind of want to highlight those. There's a bill 2107 that's in the middle of it, but this is these bills uh, recently passed their committees last week. And what this bill, uh, both of these bills would do is um, the one that really would like to call your attention to is 2276. There was a bill, um, HB 2009, um, that was that does deal with this with schools, but 2276 was amended in the House Government and Elections Committee last week um, that expands the scope of. Uh, the particular bill that's in 2009. So what HB 2276 would do is, right now under Arizona law, a city, town, or county can be subject to a complaint by a member of the legislature to the attorney general alleging that the county, city, or town is in violation of state law. And there is a process in statute by which the once that complaint has been issued, the attorney general notifies the county, the county has 30 day once the attorney general completes an investigation to determine whether or not a violation of state law has occurred. Um, then the county attorney or excuse me the uh, county is given 30 days to uh, remediate the violation in the event that the attorney general does find them in violation. And if they do not uh, either repeal the unconstitutional or illegal action, uh, uh, or they take some effort to remediate it, then the city, town, or county is subject to losing state shared revenue. Uh, so what this does is, is it takes that policy and it expands it. Um, and expands it to the Arizona Board of Regents, a community college district governing board, a school district, a charter school governing board, a university or, or a university. Uh, and then what it also does is, is it expands the scope of the action. So right now it was, it's only official action of the county, city or town, which is an action by the board of supervisors or the city council or the town council. And instead what this says is, is that any written policy or rule um, is also subject to uh, a 1487 violation. So what that means is, is that uh, for county administration, any of the policies and procedures that are promulgated under the board's authority pursuant to ordinances would potentially be subject to a 1487 violation. Uh, so this bill did pass its committee um, as of uh, last week. The County Supervisors Association is opposed to this bill based off of the impact that it could potentially have. Um, and so we uh, I just wanted you to be aware of it as this is something that does impact the board's uh, um, governing authority and that will also impact 
um, the way in which we you know, interact with the legislature in that anything the county manager does or any of the written policies would be subject to what are known as, because the, the bill that enacted that policy was SB 1487, so they call it a 1487 complaint. So um, that expansion is there in this bill. Before I move on to just a few more of interest, any questions or comments on that bill? Any comments, any questions? Sounds you know, like- I, just, just quickly, obviously we would oppose this one, you know, yeah. it's, uh, and so, but it's, yeah. it, it sounds like a leave no lawyer behind because uh, it'll, it'll certainly provide lots of lots of opportunities for employment. Indeed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the other one I just wanted you to be aware of that did pass the House uh, uh, by a party margin last week is HB 2316. Some of you may be familiar with this bill in that it's had many iterations over the past 10 years. And it's essentially to allow, they, they used to introduce bills that would require local governments to allow for uh, weapons in the, in the county, regardless of, of whether or not the county notices um, the, the law that allows us to prohibit weapons on county property. So this one takes that and it, um, it addresses it in a different way, which it basically says that if you are a concealed carry permit holder, then you do not commit misconduct involving weapons. Because right now, if there's a sign posted and you carry a weapon onto county property, that is misconduct involving weapons under Title 13. Well, this one says if you have a concealed carry permit, you can enter a public establishment or a public event. Uh, it does provide for a number of exceptions. Uh, so the exceptions for uh, limiting uh, a person with a concealed carry permit holder uh, to either a public establishment or a public event um, is a secured facility, uh, which includes the any of the court facilities, any of the law enforcement facilities. Uh, but there are questions with this bill as to whether or not some county facilities would um, would not meet the definition of secured facility. And in that case, this bill would require uh, the county to allow concealed carry permit holders uh, onto in, into the facility. So it passed the House. It was a uh, single assigned to Senate Judiciary. This bill has gotten through uh, both chambers before and reached the governor. It's been vetoed. Uh, it's, it's failed in the Senate. It's failed in the House. Uh, so we've seen many different iterations of this bill over the year over the years, um, and the County Supervisors Association and the League are opposed, as well as a number of other local governments um, and groups. Uh, so I just wanted you to be aware that this is moving. It, it, it did pass the House, and this could, uh, it's, it's unlike, I, I shouldn't know Pine, but I don't necessarily think that we can count on Governor Ducey to veto this bill. Um, so that's just something I wanted the board to be aware of. Obviously, we do oppose it. And I assume CSA is opposing this bill as well, Trey, is that correct? That is correct. Again, it, it kind of limits local control and local decision-making. So in, any other comments? Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two more, uh, well, I'm gonna do two feel good. Um, one is we are in support of HB 2576, which is sponsored by Representative Walt Blackman. And what this bill does is it appropriates $6 million uh, to allow for uh, NAPTA, the Northern Arizona Intergovernmental Public Transportation Authority. Uh, it, it provides $6 million for the capital costs of the Downtown Connection Center. So this bill uh, did pass House Transportation recently. Um, it has not advanced to the floor yet as a money bill. Typically with appropriations bills and money bills, uh, they, they get held back as the legislature has budgetary conversations and they determine about the discretionary spending and what will be included and what won't. Um, but at this point, it is good news that this bill did pass its committee and just wanted to give you an update on this one since we are in support of it. The other one, uh, unless there are comments or questions, just in interest of time, uh, 1075 is a bill that we uh, indicated in our uh, priorities that we would support. This is the ACO bill um, that does uh, provide for, excuse me, not, not 1075. This is a bill that actually potentially has a, a county fiscal impact. 
Um, that that bill, the bill I meant to put on here is 13. That is a bill to just be aware of. Um, but I meant to highlight another, an ACO bill that actually was able to pass committee um, last week, which deals with public safety guardianships, which uh, addresses the potential public safety issues with certain defendants who are incompetent to stand trial um, and through the evaluation process can't necessarily be be held, um, but uh, who nevertheless uh, require um, a, a response um, so by the state. Um, so this uh, that bill did pass committee last week and will be advancing. Uh, SB 1075 is just a bill that would um, we're kind of keeping on our eye on in that if the the defendant is indigent under this guardian appointment, um, the court is authorized to order the county to pay the reasonable comp reasonable compensation um, there. So something to be aware of. Uh, and then just lastly, Madam Chair, there is a bill that deals with county uh, with uh, constable salaries that we are opposed to that CSA is also opposed to. This bill has a particularly uh, a particular impact on Coconino County in that it increases compensation costs for constables beyond the, the productivity and the uh, workload of, of the justice precincts that we have. Um, so CSA is opposed to it and has been actively lobbying the legislature, uh, explaining the impacts of this bill, uh, but I wanted you all to be aware of it uh, as well. Um, it did pass Senate appropriations last week with an amendment um, that just basically adjusted the salary amounts. And so we are continuing to work with CSA to explain the Coconino County impacts on this bill. Uh, so that way we can uh, find some solution where we can uh, address salaries for county officers while also reflecting the productivity and workload of each office. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions, Madam Chair. That concludes my update. Any questions, members of the board? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say thank you, Trey, for the update. There's a lot of bills, a lot of moving parts. It moves really fast. It's hard to believe there's over 1,600 bills that have been introduced. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a sprint and a marathon at the same time. So I commend you for staying on top of it. And I heard recently you had a birthday. So happy birthday, my friend. <laughs> thank you very much, Supervisor. I'm honored. Thank you. I appreciate You're that. You're welcome. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you for, for the presentation and thank you for, for, uh, for keeping us abreast of all the, all the things happening in the legislature because they do have ramifications here locally. So we want to stay on top of it. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, 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 Supervisor Ryan. Wait, what do you call me these days? <laughs> <laughs> already forgotten all right um actually uh just uh compliment trey this this is in, uh, speaking of extraordinary years uh you know and listening to csa staff taking a look at what we're looking at uh bills that typically wouldn't go through that we would be opposed to they're lumping them together uh it is uh, it's a hard year it's a really hard year we're trying to put our opposition in there uh, appropriately, but uh, uh, but it's hard, you know. They'll they'll you know work on one action that has implications, and then pass thirty bills, uh, and then come back and modify, amend it, you know. So uh, so strikers, you know, obviously uh, you, know, you think that creates a clean slate for new legislation that we defeated to, to come back and and be resurrected. Uh, the other piece is, you know, we're trying as best as possible uh, to align uh, with what we said is our objectives while we're also, you know, let's hear what's going on with the rest of the counties, see how it moves, as you all saw last week. And uh, and uh, it's it's a tough one. Uh, the one, you know, I think uh, not today, but, uh, you know, Trey, you know, I, I think for the sake of the board from an interest perspective is that we just get you know, the bills that are resonating on the short term rentals, uh, just, you know, periodically just give the board an update of how they're progressing uh, to see the implications associated with what we might deal with. That's it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great job, Trey. And see you Friday. Any other, any other comments? Yes, Supervisor Begay. Thank you, Trey, for the update. It really helps us, you know, to stay in tune with. Um, <clears throat> I don't, uh, things that are coming our way and are affecting our county. So I'm really appreciative of your 
you know, time and effort and get reporting to us. And certainly, you know, we, we do trust what you, you convey to us. So I just want to say thank you so much. And then also um, the other thing is um, for anything that comes up, I know that you've been sharing a lot of information with us. So um, certainly, um, you know, we just uh, want to really uh, maintain the focus on county, what, what are our cooking, it's going to be affecting a cooking county. So thank you so much and thank you. All and right. Thank you for your birthday. <laughs> yes. Happy birthday, Trey. So um, always good to celebrate birthdays. So, and thank you also for your update. I do have a question. Um, where are we? And maybe there's been no action on the short-term rentals. I know there's a couple bills that have been introduced. There are, Madam Chair. And actually, so there's probably anywhere from seven to eight bills, um, two of which probably aren't moving. But it, so that's why I didn't want to get, it would take up it would take another 20 minutes, right? My update would be an hour. So what I've done is I've created a list um, that does self-populate and will self-update. So I will send a link to that list. Um, and then basically what there is to know is there's one house bill, um, which is a Kavanaugh bill that does look, we've sent all of those bills out to the community development director. Um, and Jay's been able to provide some great feedback on those. And so uh, I will send that, I will email that to you in, in expediency of time. That will give you an update on the last action. Um, that, that bill did pass committee last week and is, it, is advancing through the House. Um, there is a bill, HB 2711, that we are in support of that just applies to some of the municipalities that are in our county, so Page, Sedona. Um, so between that House bill that would impact the board's authority oh. to regulate short-term rentals, that's the Kavanaugh bill, and then the Brenda Barton bill, which is for Sedona, Page, and other municipalities under the population of 17,000, um, which we are in support of, that will be included in that list. So basically, the, the short answer is those bills are advancing, and they look to be to continue to advance through the process. So Great. I'll send that over. Good. Thank you. And thank you for that link. And, and I think it's, you know, exactly where we are and with 16, over 1,600 bills that have been introduced. Uh, I really appreciate just short, clear, concise, and you know maybe a link for updates on a regular basis. So I really appreciate this trade, a very good presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thanks everyone for the birthday wishes. I sincerely appreciate it. And, and moving on, number 16, discussion, review, and possible direction regarding the Board of Supervisors planning calendar. And this is our County Manager, Steve Peru. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. If I could ask our clerk to put up the planning calendar. I'm just gonna walk through the to two months, I think maybe, you know, March and April. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, we're here today, of course, 22nd. Scroll down to the first, I'll just do some highlights. Uh, Jared Tolman from the county, city county library district is gonna come on, on, on March 1st and provide an update to the to the district board. And again, the Board of Supervisors sits as that district, the County Library District Board as a, as a taxing entity. And it's been, a it's been some time since Jared has been able to, has had the opportunity. So he'll be providing an update. And, and I do want to probably mention, I know there's a question regarding the Library District Board, uh, some of their work uh, that that uh, came from a discussion that Supervisor Begay was having. So that might be a good time to have that discussion with Jared. Uh, we'll also have the standard items, the round table, and then the jail district uh, will be providing an update on jail facilities operations and inmate, inmate programming. And this is a jail district information item to the board of directors of the jail district and Lucinda Andriani and the sheriff will be presenting this particular area, this item. And then on the first, we also have discussion Presentation, discussion, and action on a proposed uh, pay plan for our patrol and detention uh, staff uh, in the sheriff's office. So we are at critical staffing levels in both areas uh, as a result of, of, of just an overall shortage uh, and also competition within the, the communities um, for, for, for uh, qualified individuals to serve uh, patrol and detention. Again, these are public safety, uh, very critical positions uh, that we are going to be uh, uh, working with the sheriff in bringing a pay plan to each to the board members for consideration. Prior to that date, uh, we're arranging uh, briefings 
uh, with the sheriff uh, to go over some of the details of that. But again, we're, we're looking to have that on March 1st. And then a COVID update from Kim Musselman. And then uh, we do have on the 2nd of Jan of March, excuse me, we're having a special meeting at one o'clock that afternoon on our redistricting work at the county level. And you'll recall that we have gone through a number of months with the state and, and congressional redistricting with the independent redistricting commission's work. And now that their work is done, we'll be uh, restarting the county's redistricting process. And so the uh, afternoon of the second uh, will be a, a, a hybrid meeting where the board will be convening in person, but the public will be joining us virtually. And so we're working with uh, the clerk's office, our IT folks, uh, to make sure that we're able to do that. Uh, we'll be convening you downstairs in the boardroom. We'll be spacing you out. Uh, we'll also have um, uh, the sound and technology uh, will be, uh, will be uh, brought to us uh, actually by a third party because we're in the process of installing technology down there this week. But it's, it's too tight of a margin to get a new system in place and go live with the new with a new uh, with a, with a public meeting. Uh, so we're going to be uh, having uh, outside resources come in and do the production part of it, the videography and the the uh, the posting and the streaming. So again, that's happening the afternoon of March second. From there, uh, and if there are any questions, please let me know. I'm just going to uh, touch a few points here. On March eighth is our regular board meeting. We have uh, some uh, ev an evening. That's an evening session. We do not have anything scheduled for uh, during the day. And so at this point in time, we'll be, we'll be beginning at 6 p.m. that evening. And uh, we have at least a, a, a liquor license uh, hearing, um, but we do not have any, at this point in time, any hearings posted from community development. So uh, that uh, may be uh, destined for a short meeting that evening. With nothing, again, nothing uh, on the calendar for the afternoon at this point in time. March 2nd, 20, excuse me, 22nd of March, uh, uh, we do have uh, liquor license hearings uh, for uh, some establishments and you see on the planning calendar. And then um, part three of our facilities master plan discussion will be taking place on March 22nd. Uh, the, second, the second one is actually happening this afternoon. And then the third, as you see on the planning calendar is happening on the 22nd. And then again, another installment of an update from the jail district. This, this time the focus will be on financial, excuse me, the financial uh, status of the district as well as uh, future investments uh, that, that we're programming, of course, with the sheriff and in, in his leadership role uh, at the, within the jail facility. And that's be, being presented at three o'clock on the 22nd at this time. And then following that, a presentation uh, on the community wildfire grant program uh, this is a very much needed program throughout Coconino County, and we'll be providing an update on that program and how it uh, has touch points within several of the districts here at the county. Uh, so with that, that is the month of month of March. Was there any comments on March before I go to April that I can answer? Um, yes, I actually have a question in terms of the um, jail district and the upcoming uh, uh, vote um, for the jail district. Obviously, that's really of great importance here for Coconino County and, and um, it's going to be important to get on top of that as soon as we can. And I know you put a call out, uh, County Manager, for Citizen Advisory Committee members uh, for that. I don't know when they need to be in place and will that be something that we'll discuss on March 2nd? Uh, so, we're, <clears throat> excuse me, Madam Chair, members of the board, we are we are seeking those, those referrals or those suggestions immediately. So, uh, individuals that you have uh, within your districts that you feel would be uh, would be beneficial to be part of the citizens committee, please let us know. We do have a list of individuals that have served on previous uh, um, um, jail, um, uh, as well as the transportation tax citizen committee. So, so we do have some individuals, uh, but we would like uh, again if we could definitely we would unwrap that selection up this week. So that we can seat the individuals, uh, those individuals will be um, um, convened and seated. It's it, we're not uh, proposing this as a board selection board uh, appointment, uh, but this will be uh, an, uh, an appointment that both the sheriff and myself will be taking the prerogative to to establish the committee. So, 
uh, we'll close the loop with you this week, but we really need to have uh, individuals identified uh, by the end of this week so we can get them going uh, as early as next week. So thank you. So you're asking us get get the emails into uh, the county manager with some names. You bet. Um, starting off in April, uh, board members, um, standard items, we are going to be uh, coming back to the board budget presentation and planning. Uh, we all know that budget establishment and planning is, is a months long process, not a month, but months plural. And so uh, our CFO, Suri Mullaney, will be presenting that information. Uh, we'll be having a discussion on, on some of the winter activities that are play, taking place out at Fort Tuthill. Uh, and so uh, not only winter, but year round. So Flag Extreme uh, and, and a couple of other updates from Cynthia Nemeth and the Parks and Recreation team. Uh, following by that, our County Treasurer, Sarah Benatar, will be providing a presentation on the servicing bank and trust services contracts. And this is a presentation that's required uh, by statute to occur no later than April. So that's taking place. And then from there, um, I believe we are then having the fourth of five sessions from, um, from uh, FMD Director Tom Hanacek on our facilities master plan. And that's scheduled for um, at 5 p.m. So again, that is uh, happening at that date. That's the 4th of 5th. And then on, this, on the 12th of April, it's the 5th of 5th, we're going to see a lot of, of Tom and his work uh, with his team's work. And so that'll be the 5th of five installments on our facilities master plan uh, that's taking place and brought to you on April 12th. That evening, we do have a public hearing uh, scheduled for the Walnut Creek Meadows, um, and that is scheduled for the 12th. And then we also are scheduled to bring uh, to the board uh, through your efforts and their deliberations from, from during the month of March, uh, action for the board to adopt the redistricting map for Coconino County, and that's scheduled for the evening of April 12th. And then from there, you'll see uh, quickly on April 26th, uh, routine items, another installment of budget prep planning. And then an important item as we just spoke about is the recommendations, presentation and recommendations from the Citizens Committee on, on a potential jail tax ballot measure. And that is scheduled for April 26th uh, with the um, actual um, consideration of a call for election would be is is scheduled for May 10th, but again, all of the work of the Citizens Committee will be would be leading up to 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 the date we just talked about. And I think I'm just going to end there because I think March and April, we said yeah, March and April uh, have enough information for you. The rest is you can you'll be able to see in your calendars. Very good. So questions or comments that that staff can respond to. Any questions or comments? I have some, but I'm going to wait and see what the other uh, board members have to say first. Any questions or comments? Uh, just a, a quick comment is just a reminder. Uh, you know, we have spring break that's coming. We try and keep that week light because uh, a lot of our uh, our staff uh, need to, you know want to be out with their families, that kind of thing. Uh, and then. Um, uh, you know, Steve, you had in your report trying to get us together on a Saturday or something like that. Uh, right. March, March is kind of difficult, uh, to be honest with you. With uh, I have two, you know, I'm I'm wrestling with my own family uh, pieces with spring break, two different uh, uh, weeks that align with each other, which messes with that. So mm -hmm. just a heads up on that. So thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Supervisor Ryan. So the spring break week in, in Flagstaff is that believe that week of the 14th. And so we do not have a board meeting scheduled for that week. So in, 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 um, in this an observance of. Um, so we could look at that and we could also possibly look at March 8th for the retreat. So again, we'll plan around it, but we know it's a very busy month and we'll plan accordingly, but there is also I think you'll all agree an important need to have a retreat to finish up some of the organizational discussions that we've begun um, from weeks past. So, but we'll be looking at that. Thank you, sir. Any, any other supervisors have any comments or questions? Supervisor Begay, are you popping up here trying to? So I'm just I'm just looking at everything. Dan. I don't have anything right now. Sorry. 
And any other questions, comments? Otherwise, um, I have a couple. Uh, first of all, yes, we do need to make sure we get that board retreat scheduled and get it on the calendar. And, um, you know, March or April, I know that they all fill up. And so if we don't get it on the calendar, it's going to fill up again. But I do also acknowledge what uh, Supervisor Ryan indicated, that that is kind of spring break week. So um, let's try to take a look at March or April to try to get a Saturday for our um, um, board retreat. And um, I also would like to, a couple ideas that I have uh, as the chair, and I have discussed these with the vice chair on uh, just in terms of organizing our agendas moving forward. And, and part of this is to try to streamline them somewhat and to provide more time available for um, discussions um, as we move forward with very, very packed agendas. Um, and that is that we, we go to one time a month for the round table. We include it in just in case there's something that does come up that other board members want to include, um, but that we just uh, designate one month or one week, I should one board meeting a month as our round table discussion uh, for the board members. Have it in there, as I said, in case there's something that comes up that we do need to share. Um, and also uh, one time a month for the state and federal legislative priorities. I uh, think that uh, there's going to be so much movement that goes on. We'll continue to have it on the agenda in case there's something special that is coming up. But hopefully some of that can be handled through emails to the governing board on just updates that are going on on both the state and federal level. Um, if something is of major importance, obviously we want it on the agenda but maybe alternate board uh, meetings, if you will, for the round table versus the state and federal legislative priorities, because sometimes those can really take up a couple hours. Um, and then I I'm going to recommend that we do for some of these long time projects that really take some staff um, time with the board and really require some, uh, some board discussion that we try to put those into work study sessions rather than to try to squeeze them in to a very, very tight agenda where we already have, uh, you know, hours of discussion and review. Um, an example would be the facilities master plan. And I know that we've already had two installments or are going to have more. What I would request is maybe that fifth installment have that as a work study session where we can go through and, and summarize the previous four sessions in a summary fashion uh, because over two months, I don't know, memories fade. My memory fades, it seems, over a week. So um, it would be nice to have a review and then uh, a good uh, time period for board to really look at things and to discuss things. Uh, and that's just one you know, example of others that I think that the board would benefit from uh, work study sessions. We don't want to add all kinds of time for our staff, although it is important for the board to do their work on behalf of the county. So I'm going to recommend that maybe we keep those work study sessions to the extent that we can on the afternoons or the days that we already have an evening meeting planned. Um, I think that'll keep some of the disruption for the staff to a minimum and, and still give us, the board, the time that we need uh, to discuss uh, important items and important business uh, that come before the board and, and that are important for the county. So just some thoughts moving forward. Um, if board members have some concerns with that, you know, uh, please let me know. Um, these are things that we would love to talk about in a retreat, but given the fact that the retreat kind of gets pushed off further and further down the road, I, I think it might be good to try to um, start this process just to help uh, streamline uh, some of our board meetings. So unless there's big objection from individual board members, I'm hopeful we can start doing that. Okay. Any comments? Uh, Madam Chair, if I can, just a quick sure. comment on that. And, and you know, that, that would be great uh, in, in terms of how we fit it in. Uh, but having it posted is good, too, because there are things that come up that a board member wants to alert the other board members of and or it's a way of us reporting that, hey, I've got something going on in my district that's starting to take staff time. I need to give you a heads up on it. Uh, 
you know, so that the other board members are aware and, you know, uh, you know, obviously it'd be coordinated and Steve would be aware of it, but, but that's, that's a key piece of the opportunity with Roundtable as well as making the board aware of those things. And then we can figure out how do we navigate this? Oh my gosh, you know, it might be, you know, something in my district's taking more time than it really should. So anyway, that's just a thought. Yeah, thanks, Madam. Awesome. And I, and I agree. So uh, any other items or, or any other um, discussion from the board on that? Yes, Madam Chair, I just want to say I, I like I like the spread of the meetings and I, I think it's a good plan moving forward, but I agree we do need the retreat and we do need to have some work session time together in person to deal with some of these issues. So, thank you. Other comments, Madam Chair? Yes, yes, Supervisor Begay. Uh, yes, and um, <clears throat> I'm glad that you were going this route, and I I do um, think that this is going to be something that's going to really help us as a, as a board and um, and and trying to streamline and then also to um, really um, take a look at things that need to be really taken a look in work sessions and and um, uh, go from there because um, work sessions do take a lot a bulk of our time within our regular board meetings and. And um, sometimes we're there eight hours, uh, seven, eight, nine hours. At the first, the first meeting I ever had, I think we were in that ten hours. So anyway, um, th that would be great. And um, I just want to say thank you for you know, um, um, you know, trying to uh, for for us talking about this, you know, giving the opportunity to speak about it. And I'm in total in agreement with uh, whatever changes that we need to make that's going to better. Um, convey and you know um, have our our meetings just be as successful as can be and so I do trust my board uh, my colleagues also and in and, 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 and their support and you know their willingness to you know to do the same thing so I just want to say thank you so much thank you supervisor Begay any other comments and Steve anything else of the county manager no, Madam Chair, we'll we'll work. Uh, I'll work with the clerk's office to to uh, begin looking at the current planning calendar and how we can start making those adjustments as you uh, suggested. This Thank today. you, and, and I got to tell you how much I really appreciate you including the um, planning calendar as part of our regular board meetings. I think that's really helpful for all of us. So, thank you for your leadership on that, uh, Steve. And then the other part of that, Madam Chair, to the board members. Uh, you know, for future items, uh, if there are items that the, the chair and the board members wish to uh, consider uh, bringing forward, um, I would ask that, you know, the, we have a conversation to look at what those might be and then kind of, uh, kind of bet those, if you will, not that we're gonna bet because, you know, that's not the role, staff's role, but to support how we would structure that presentation if you can just kind of uh, work through us and then we can bring that through the planning calendar process, et cetera, so. Thank you. And, and just a reminder, I know that uh, Supervisor Ryan reminded us about spring break coming up, but there's a summer coming up too. And so uh, I know plans are already starting for many of us for the summer, uh, trying to get campsite reservations, et cetera. So if, if you are planning to be gone during a particular time in the summer, let's make sure to get that information to the county manager so we can plan that as we move our planning calendar forward. We obviously want, um, to have some time off. On the other hand, it's important that we get the county's business done and some of these important pieces, we wanna make sure we've got uh, a full board or at least a five, uh, four person board. So thank you. So with that, um, county manager, you're still up. Uh, we still have on. So um, Lindsay, can I, I'm gonna share my screen just real quickly if I could. I just wanna bring the board's um, attention to uh, can you see what can you see? Can you see the ERLT update? Yes. Okay. So again, this is just a just a reminder to the board that each week our office issues an update uh, that we also send out to the entire organization. Provides an update on from various departments. Uh, I just wanted to just quickly uh, reference a couple of items. Uh, so the renewable energy ordinance uh, that the, the discussions have begun with the public. And we're looking at, at summer for adoption. So again, this process has, has started. Um, I'm not gonna go through everything. Uh, items of note, uh, we, this week we'll be demobilizing, an EM term, uh, the, the Flagstaff Mall. 
And so we will be relocating um, our, our COVID vaccine uh, site back to King Street. And so that, that's taking place this week as weather permits. So we'll see what's happening there. But that's an important one. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to note is, of course, and Supervisor Chair uh, Forsman, you may raise this during your update, uh, the 180. Uh, so we're working to, to, to look at how we can work up there with traffic and, and safety. And then, of course, Supervisor Vasquez, in your district, actually both districts, uh, two, two and one, uh, the sirens system is, is in progress of being installed. Uh, so again, credit to Wes and Tim and Mark and everyone at EM for doing their good work there, working with the city to get that thing, to, to get that alarm system put in place. And so good work there. Um, other things that are, of course, we're doing um, a couple of items. So facilities appointed uh, Adrian Burke. Uh, as the new assistant director at FMD. And then uh, uh, Kayla Cooper is the new business manager at Parks and Recreation, excuse me, FMD rather. Um, so again, these are just uh, highlights of the, that are important to each of you. Um, I did also send out to, to each of you an update from me uh, related to some of the items that I'm gonna, I'm, I can stop my share here, but uh, just verbally go through very quickly. Uh, redistricting, we're doing uh, taking um, taking that uh, to you all next week, which is an important part. We talked about the jail district, the citizens committee. Uh, that's important to get those individuals and those names uh, to to us so that we can start um, having uh, uh, those committee meetings. Um, ARPA discussion this afternoon. The American Rescue Plan will be presenting the framework uh, for the community uh, partnership distribution process. Um, and then also with regard to uh, things that are happening, winter storm. So winter is here. Uh, so again, um, we've been waiting for it, it's coming. And so uh, our emergency management folks, uh, Credit Public Works, they've pulled all their folks in. Uh, they're gonna be doing uh, great things over the next 48 hours to help us manage the impacts of this winter storm, although it is much needed from a moisture standpoint. It does of course ch uh, pose some challenges with, with, the, with the public's uh, uh, daily lives. And so uh, emergency management, our sheriff's department, of course, all law enforcement will be out doing what they're doing. And for everyone that is out doing things related to snow, we want them to be safe uh, and, and be careful out there because again, uh, you all are out there doing important work on behalf of the public and, and for the county as well. So again, uh, those are just a few of my updates. I think uh, the material that I referenced uh, has information that uh, uh, that you can ask me about um, uh, at, at your leisure. So I can answer questions though. If you have an issue there that you want more information on, uh, please um, give me a, let me know at this time or anytime. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any comments from uh, members of the board? With that, all right, very good. And um, I believe then we are on that round table. So I would would ask just just because he always had to go last, I would ask uh, Supervisor Ryan uh, if if he would lead us off on the round table. I heard he and I thought it was Ryan. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so actually, just uh, quickly on my uh, noting from Steve's report. Uh, uh, filling the facilities uh, uh, position. Uh, it, Tammy's, but she's in two different roles uh, right now, and she'll continue to be uh, uh, substituting and helping out as people are coming on board over there. Uh, she's there for the sake of everybody in the office. Uh, you know, Chris coming on board, uh, uh, you know, Tammy knows, Nina's no stop. So, you know, uh, for others in the office, uh, but, but she is uh, performing two roles too. Um, but she's doing a great job and really appreciate her support. Uh, just quickly on joint land use uh, study, which is now called MIS. Um, they change all kinds of labels at the federal level, so we have to adapt. But anyway, uh, you know, uh, what was it, February 1st, I attended uh, uh, Northern Arizona Military Advisory Committee, which I, I sit on, uh, which is a chamber appointment, 
not a board appointment, but uh, uh, it's in coordination with the military bases, in particular uh, Naval Observatory and Camp Navajo. Uh, and then uh, we had new commander, Major General Curry, uh, Neil and Buck. Uh, they are really important. So we could ask the question associated with them. They seem to be deprioritizing a little bit of Camp Navajo. So we're gonna try and foster that, that conversation. And I think that's, that's a critical uh, point there. Uh, did have a, a community meeting in Munns Park before going down to the CSA meeting. Uh, when uh, it's going really well, you know, I compliment Lucinda and her staff. A lot of it's there, as well as the sheriff's office uh, uh, and I forget the deputy of uh, uh, the area. But they they were giving really good reports on you know what the county's trying to do uh, associated with them. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the big one that's coming up for uh, a lot of our communities with uh, uh, fire danger, the voucher program. But we, you know, we provide the opportunity for vouchers at the landfill and or we have uh, Willard Springs and Moonset Pit that people can haul. But with the fire season coming up, even with this big storm coming, we know uh, we want to encourage people to, uh, you know, uh, make their properties fire wise. Um, uh, hoping. I'm getting uh, requests both in Kachina and Mountaineer associated with speeding, talk to the sheriff about it. Once upon a time, we created a neighborhood watch, but it kind of was taken over by a couple of people with their own agenda uh, with uh, Sheriff Pribble at that time. We decided it was in the best interest of the community that the focus wasn't on the community. We stopped it. I think times have changed. We have people that are really interested in engaging. And so I've, I've talked to the sheriff uh, and we'll be having a meeting with John Paxton uh, to, to, to consider the possibility of a neighborhood watch in, in Mountaineer, kind of incrementally started. And with time, hopefully we can grow it uh, into Kachina or Kachina develops their own, but let's take baby steps first to see the interest engaged with the community. Uh, just a heads up associated with that. Uh, the last one that is consuming a lot of staff time, uh, but we had a very good meeting with our internal staff, uh, uh, with uh, Sheriff's Office, with Public Works, uh, with Emergency Management, uh, is associated with the, uh, it's not just the roundabout, it's it's emergency exits associated with Belmont, it's new people moving in, it's growth. And so it, it brings a higher level of uh, uh, need for communication. I, and that's what we did. We, we talked about, you know, how do we communicate on these different issues uh, to provide uh, information to the community? Uh, and because so much is going on, and people are seeking different sources. Uh, it, it's good for all of us to get together and align uh, our understanding of what we can do and what we can't do. And so they, they pretty much uh, consumed um, uh, most of our time. Uh, as far as my committees, uh, in particular, uh, you can see LPC with a, a CSA update, uh, where we are, recommendations we're trying to make associated with them. Uh, so don't need to update uh, so much on that. Uh, you've gotten reports from Trey as well. Signing ceremony, just from the uh, casting off of the last chair's reports, uh, what a wonderful signing ceremony that we had. Judy did a great job and, and uh, emceeing it, uh, welcoming uh, President Nez uh, and, and doing our update associated with that. Uh, and so I think uh, uh, really it was a special event and, and I think well worth having and, and compliment everybody, the work that went in the background, um, uh, uh, both Lena and Miranda, what they did, uh, uh, Nicole, oh, you, you see these stars that have these experience that come in and step in. Nicole's a, a shining star for, for doing these kind of things. So, uh, uh, but for everybody that did their work on that. And nice and simple, keep it at that. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Ryan. And uh, uh, let's go down to Supervisor Judy Begay. <clears throat> Okay, um, <clears throat> my throat's kind of itchy. Um, again, thank you for this opportunity. And um, as you know, um, I've been trying to really work with um, the Navajo Nation and also the Hopi tribe regarding some of the services they have and trying to see 
how I can get this link going between the county and um, their and, and um, their areas of, of, of needs. And so I know that, you know, it, it's, it's kind of hard, but uh, I'm still trucking along and I've been at this for the last nine months or so. And and I, I hope to get some more soon. But um, and, and so I'm just really concerned um, as, a, as a board member that, you know, I I, I feel um, that there, there's there's a way that you know we can um, uh, really really get involved in um, in some way you know especially from my office since I do represent them you know as far as um, services that they provide so I, I've been meeting with different um, departments and uh, calling them up and even with the uh, president of the Navajo Nation and also my council delegates um, <clears throat> for to the city and um, uh, 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 and also. Um, uh, Cameron area. So, but uh, nonetheless, you know, they're very concerned about certain issues. And I did have a chance to meet with um, uh, Ms. Crotty too. So um, she's in, uh, also a member of the Navajo Nation Council. So I just wanted to, and we were talking about veteran homes and um, also uh, veteran services. We were also talking about um, um, issues that uh, Mental, mental issues, um, how they address that, and behavioral issues, you know, as, as, as how they work with their, their constituents over there and see what the white services are here, because we do um, have Native Americans and indigenous people that are within our court system too, they may need the same services, and how they would deal with that. I always say that, you know, with the traditional cultural aspect of this, um, of the treatment plans are kind of how they know or, you know, um, maybe uh, they, there are some, but how do we enhance it? And that's, that's something that I would like to see. So anyway, so that's what I've been working on, but, um, uh, <clears throat> and then um, I'm still trying to get um, someone hired. Um, as you know, Naomi has left and uh, Yazi has left um, our, she's got a full-time job within the, um, uh, the Flagstaff vicinity. And so, um, because the offices are closed elsewhere, you know, it's hard, kind of hard to get information, documentation to um, release a, a document so this person can come on, you know, and help us, you know, especially to work with the Navajo Nation uh, chapter so that I can, you know, really uh, work with the other areas, you know, uh, of where, where um, like uh, in the southern portion of my, um, my the county, uh, District 4. So, um, so it seems like you know there's there's a lot that is happening and um, and I also did meet with Derek Tolman regarding uh, he's a library director and um, basically just their services and then what their needs are and then also what their wants are as far as um, uh, they will be bringing up their um, their um, their concern to us as a board and um, as you know the districts is probably somewhat run like the fire district where you know once they do their um, paperwork everything they're pretty much on their own and that we try to help them in certain ways but you know I think they there's some authority and I believe that's the city's part of it too so that's where the city and the county are both involved so it's kind of making it harder for them to to really um, operate in certain ways I guess is what it is so but we will be hearing from them also so um, we did have our federal legislative visits uh, within the last two weeks or so and I really enjoyed that. We had Stanton and others here that you know we talked to, and you know they gave us updates and where where certain things are, and that and and also we had our um, both um, of, of um, the people that we work that we work with, you know, that came and they kind of um, help us through the, the whole um, process, and then also with Trey. So I just want to say a lot has learned, been learned, and you know I'm. And I'm looking forward to more meetings like that, you know, so that because there are a lot of legislations going through right now, and you know, a lot of it has is affecting you know county as a whole. Um, we did have a Navajo Nation um, transportation meeting that was scheduled on um, February 11th. That meeting was canceled due to the weather, so um, we didn't have that meeting. But um, basically, I'm really trying hard to get on that because, as you know, I'm still trying to. Um, um, see how we can get some roads um, uh, from the county um, helping, you know, the Navajo Nation routes, just like in 21. And then also, you know, that, that's, that's my focus there too. So I just want to say um, that, but
but otherwise a lot of phone calls a lot of people asking questions and um mainly services and you know it, it's hard you know when you have to work with long families off the reservation and you know and they're, they're, they're they operate differently than we do all our uh, most of our needs are somewhat because a lot of people don't have electricity water i myself included you know i have to have a generator uh, uh, uh you know what turned on you know to light up my trailer and you know carry water with buckets you know from um, from my mom's hold on to my my trailer you know so so it's you know it, it's hard and and with this and with these trying times and we're really faced with the drought so how do I try to help how do I advocate you know so I've been talking about even drought issues um and then some 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 issues are not the same as in, in other areas you know other districts but um, I think, you know, in my area, there's a lot that, that, that needs to happen. So, but all in all, um, you know, I just want to say thank you for listening. And, um, but um, I do, we do get calls, a lot of emails, and um, we're neglecting in some areas, like the area plan, Dolby Park. Um, we used to have me able to go in there, but Cheryl's trying to fit in here and there. So, <laughs> so I just want to say thank you, Gwen. Uh, for your support, you know, as as um, supervisors too, and I'm glad that we're all here for one another. And Steve and your staff, you know, you have a very good staff, and I really enjoy. Um, but one thing I always say is that you know, as, as board members, we're here to <clears throat> to ensure that our policies are carried through, and that we do have um, Mr. Peru here as our county manager, and he should be the one to be um, running the show for us. So and. And I do trust that, you know, he does, he does just that. So, and with board members, you know, um, we, there's a fine line between micromanaging, you know, an organization. And when that happens from the board, it's going to be a chaos. And so that's really why I always stress that I've seen it happen. And that's really why I always say that. So we have to be real careful about that. Just like we're taking care of a baby, you know, that's, that's how, how fragile it is. So thank you so much for all the hard work um, for the staff, Steve, and also the other board members. I know, you know, our job is 24 seven. All our meetings, our planning chapter meetings are on weekends. So that, you know, in some evenings, um, in conflicting with our board meetings and stuff like that. So it, 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 we have to really um, juggle a lot of stuff, but then being with our, being that our offices are closed and other offices that are closed, it's been really hard. It's been really hard. So thank you very much. Thank you, Judy, for your update. And Vice Chair Vasquez. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so it's been a busy couple, two weeks. Uh, been getting uh, involved in, in uh, the NACOG transportation uh, TPAC. Uh, I'm not sure what the TPAC stands for, transportation. Matt, can you help me here? <laughs> transportation advisory. Uh... Uh, it's, I think it's a council. It's either a council or a committee. <laughs> okay. Somehow, huh? so, so I, I attended my first TPAC meeting on February 9th, and uh, at the next uh, general meeting, I should be appointed to that committee uh, moving forward as I, I'm starting to increase my responsibilities with uh, transportation. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, High Country Humane, with Director Ken Lamb, and uh, we talked about the potential of looking for a board member from District 2, so I'm out talking to folks to see if there's folks that might be interested in joining the Board of High Country Humane uh, Society, and, and then also about looking at part, potential partnerships with the Navajo Nations as, as, they, as they serve as strays. Um, I also had the opportunity to uh, participate in the Doni, Doni Park Timberline Fernwood Area Plan, I attended and gave a brief update of the things I'm doing and just stayed on to listen to the discussion and, and decisions made by the group on how to develop that area plan moving forward. Uh, I also had the opportunity to attend to, to Sunnyside Neighborhood Association board meeting. It was uh, expected that the county, uh, county staff would come talk about flood mitigation. However, the, the county staff wasn't able to attend that day. So uh, I was there by myself and just gave an update about where things are at and where we're going moving forward and how the county staff will be there at the next meeting in March. Um, and then I met with uh, the assistant director, Russ Dickerson from the AmeriCorps to talk about programs in the county and potential ways that we might be able to uh, 
partner and look at streamli streamlining some of their efforts and programs that could help support some of our county programs. So we're looking at different ways that we could possibly collaborate with AmeriCorps. I do have to give a shout out to AmeriCorps because I did AmeriCorps in 1995, inaugural season. So I'm always a big champion for AmeriCorps because I believe in, in the service, the public service that it teaches our, our young people. So I definitely want to continue to support AmeriCorps as much as possible. Uh, I had the opportunity of attending the, the MOU signing with the Navajo Nation and just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Supervisor Begay and Supervisor Fowler for, for leading the charge and, and the conversation during that time. And, and so I really appreciate the job you did and it was a great honor to be able to attend that, that event. Um, I also had the opportunity of attending the, the uh, ADAC Open House for County Black History Month event. And I uh, had the opportunity to talk with ADOC about areas that they would like to highlight in 2022, including affordable housing, education, and uh, equity, and also uh, answering questions about how we're going to continue to move forward with diversity and equ equity and inclusion in the county and, and looking forward to, to trying to fulfill some, some positions there uh, moving forward. And so uh, that was a very productive conversation, and, and some in, I received some insight from that conversation. Um, I also been, att attended the monthly Mountain Line board meeting. Uh, we're looking at projects moving forward uh, for up upgrades on, on, um, on bus stops and the, how, the distribution of them through the town. And so we had a good, lively discussion about geographical equity and making sure that all parts of the community are getting the, the proper services. Uh, I also had an interview with the, the Northern Arizona Pride Association. Uh, for their strategic plan and just looking for ways to support their efforts and talking about, you know, creating spaces for uh, people of color to be in leadership positions among, uh, among their association. Uh, and then I, the big one, I, I believe, for in the last two weeks was, well, there were two big ones. One was the Summit Fire Board meeting held on February 16th. I had an opportunity to, uh, to participate virtually. It was a big meeting, great turnout from the community concerned about some potential changes. As of right now, there has not been a decision made on what's gonna happen with the, with, uh, the fire stations, uh, whether or not one, uh, a station will be closed or not, or they're still collecting data. There were lots of public comments, but the board did give a comprehensive look at the revenue losses and why they're looking at making some adjustments uh, and some alternatives. So the, the verdict is still not out, but it was good to hear the public comment and good to see such a turnout for the event for the uh, meeting and look forward to hearing where it goes from here. Um, I had the opportunity to attend the state transportation board uh, meet and greet with, with Chair Horseman and, and we, we got to meet uh, the representatives from ADOT and, and had a chance to, to listen to some of the some of the initial meeting that, that the, the state board transportation board had here in Flagstaff. And then finally, uh, on Friday, I had the opportunity to go to uh, the Athena Awards. It's the first time I'd ever attended those awards. I was very impressed, and, and I was really excited uh, to see who the, the winner, Amanda Gay. She's a community outreach for North Country, and, and I have to give a, a, a recognition for her because she was the one who uh, I worked with in Hermosa Vida 11 years ago at Killup, and I, she was the one that identified me and recruited me for the board of directors of North Country of which I ended up serving nine years. And so I collaborated with uh, Amanda for over 10 years on different projects. And so it really uh, it really warmed me to see her get that award. And I just wanted to put out a, a shout out to all the nominees uh, who, who are doing great work in our community. It was really exciting to see the, these, uh, these women be recognized for their work in our community. So uh, that's, uh, that's in a nutshell, my last two weeks since the last uh, round table, as you can see, it's been a little busy and believe it or not, I did leave some things out, but in the interest of time, I'll cut it short there. Uh, and uh, just thank you everyone, I appreciate the time. All right, thank, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. And uh, I'm gonna, there's not much to say about the chair reports, except we did it, the, the gavel's been, been passed and uh, we, we've given our uh, congratulations and we're moving forward and Judy hopefully I haven't screwed up too much going forward now today so um, and just looking at district one uh, giving a little bit of a report and I also want to extend my um, 
sincere uh, congratulations uh, to the Athena Award nominees. And of course, uh, the winner, Amanda Ga uh, Gay, is, was just great. And I thought she was just an excellent representation of the women in our, our uh, community. So uh, congratulations. This is the first one that I have missed probably in a decade. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you were there, Vice Chair Vasquez, and I believe also uh, Judy Begay, Supervisor Begay was also in attendance uh, and a number of the county staff. So thank you for that. Just a um, quick update, 180. Um, good news is that we went through our three-day weekend, President's Day weekend. Our new six signs, six electronic signs have joined our permanent signs along 180 informing members of the public and the community that there is no parking and no stopping uh, unless for an emergency along this area and that this is not a snow play area. Uh, I understand that the traffic was um, went smoothly, uh, that there was uh, very, very little illegal parking along this area. Um, and I wanna thank very much, we did a coordination meeting prior to the three-day weekend uh, Wes Dyson, our uh, emergency management director, uh, organized that meeting with the sheriff's office, Brett Oxland, a uh, DPS. Um, we had uh, Chad uh, Ocker and ADOT. Uh, we had, I'm sorry, DPS. We had Captain Anthony Girard. And from, D, uh, from ADOT, we had Chad Ocker. Um, we, of course, had the county manager. Uh, we had a number of county staff, and, including Tim Carter and others. So it was really a coordinated effort to make sure that we were all working forward for a safe uh, 180 corridor uh, three-day weekend, and it went very smoothly. Uh, of course, we now have this weather, so we will continue our coordination and our efforts to, to keep our visitors and, and our community safe, especially along that 180 corridor. So uh, thanks for all that were involved in that, and thanks for all that were involved in getting those electronic signs. And one of them we actually had uh, put on uh, in Spanish uh, because a lot of our visitors who come along that area are Spanish speaking. And so we did get one of the signs um, programmed uh, for the Spanish message. Um, so I was very happy to see that. Um, I uh, did attend with Vice Chair Vasquez. We both sit on the Metro Plan Board uh, and did attend a State Transportation Board meeting that occurred up here in uh, Flagstaff. It was a hybrid meeting, but Chair Jesse Thompson, who many of us know and, and uh, was a former supervisor himself, um, uh, was there in, uh, as, as was board member Ted Maxwell and ADOT director John uh, Halakowski was there. Uh, and we had a, a good meeting beforehand with them, got to introduce ourselves, get to meet them. Uh, and they had a very productive state board meeting that. Um, transpired afterwards. Um, and uh, I was also part of our public input and public meeting on the renewable energy ordinance that will be coming before the board. It's a way to get public input on a very extensive pub, uh, renewable energy ordinance that has really been going and been uh, getting input from the community and, of course, our uh, staff for over the last year. And I know it will be coming forward to us for a complete look at that. Um, also attended with the county manager, the CJCC uh, meeting, and we are looking to hire that CJCC coordinator. It is a joint city county uh, position, and uh, there are a number of very good um, uh, app applicants who have applied for the position, and we will be looking to hire the coordinator coming up, I think, next uh, uh, first part of next month. Isn't that true, county manager? So that is um, and that's going to be helpful and hopefully helpful as we move forward and consider the important um, challenges that we're the criminal justice system is facing because of COVID, of course, we've heard about the fact that uh, they have a backlog of cases and a, a backlog of criminal felony cases. Some of us may have read the article in the newspaper and although um, it didn't, they didn't interview any of us here at the county to get our input on that. Uh, it's certainly brought to light that we do have a backlog and we do have a responsibility of maintaining our constitutional mandates and uh, to maintain and uh, make sure justice is served. And, and as usual, the county is doing everything they can 
to proceed and make sure that that is in fact done. And I'm sure we'll be talking more about that as we move forward and maybe as we move forward on the facilities master plan uh, as well. Um, I did attend with the rest of the board. It was all of us, which was really wonderful. The MOA uh, signing ceremony for roads between the county and the Navajo Nation. We were able to be there with the Navajo Nation president, a couple of the tribal uh, council members. And I wanna thank our wonderful MC, Judy Begay, who did it all right. And uh, really appreciated how she got smoothly ran that meeting because there were a lot of moving parts and also to Supervisor Fowler uh, for her great work in getting that set up and uh, getting all of the parties present uh, for that MOA uh, road signing um, ceremony. It was really nice. It was really a nice opportunity for us to be in person and a nice opportunity for us to meet uh, the Navajo Nation president and a couple of the tribal council people. Um, and I also have been part of the Pride a Strategic Plan uh, that they are reaching out to members of our community and with the members of uh, Board of Supervisors on moving forward in the next decade of Pride here in Northern Arizona. So um, I'm sure we'll be hearing more from them uh, in uh, the, the coming months. So it has been busy. Those are some of the highlights. Um, we also had NACO, uh, and I know most of the board members were very active in NACO. Um, I attended both the WIR on behalf of the state of Arizona and Coconino County for their uh, meeting, and also uh, on behalf of Coconino County and the state of Arizona, the public lands meeting that occurred as part of the NACO conference. And then we had virtual Hill visits, and quite frankly, I thought they went really, really well. Um, we uh, basically divided up the responsibilities among the supervisors to meet with uh, both of our senators, uh, to meet with Representative O'Halloran, uh, to meet with Representative Grijalva, who's also chair, of course, of public resources, uh, met with a number of the staffers from the Senate and House committees on energy uh, and natural resources, and uh, met with many of the staffers on uh, agriculture as well. So a great job team. Uh, uh, our team of supervisors uh, were heard and with our staff, Trey Williams, who did an excellent job and Lucinda Andriani uh, and other county uh, staff people in getting us prepared and uh, staffing our meetings with us to make sure that the interests of Coconino County were heard by our elected representatives and uh, to get important information from them on, on what they are doing in their advocacy for us up, us up here in Northern Arizona. Um, and so that uh, rounded out our round table. Any other co closing comments on that? If not, and I wanna point out it's only 12.01. And so it is according to our agenda, uh, time for a break. And um, we will be back here at 1.15. Madam Chair, is it the chairmanship or is it the, the supervisor that would present? I'm, I'm just going through that and wonder on that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry, you're, you're doing a good job of speaking up for us. So. All right. And, and, and really seriously, um, it was a great meeting this morning and thank you all and thank you all for your help and for the staff as usual who make us look good. So. Um, let's go ahead and take a break uh, and uh, we'll be back at 115 for some uh, obviously the facilities master plan, very important item and then moving on as uh, our county manager has indicated to the long awaited American Rescue Plan Act presentation. Uh, so thank you all. Have a great lunch. Have a good break. See you soon. Good job. Thank you.
Hey guys, how's it going? Good. How are you doing, Tom? Good. You know if Larry's going to be able to join us or? I don't think so. He's on the road. So he if he does, he'll just listen, um, but I, he won't be speaking. Cool. So Sue and I, uh, just real quick before the meeting gets started, um, Sue and I are probably going to occupy the first 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll kick it over to you guys. Sound good. Looks like we're still missing um, Matt. I see our saw Geronimo is, there he is, and Judy. Uh, let me go round up one of them, right back. All right. Apologies, Madam, Vi Madam Chair, I'm, I'm broadcasting from Colorado, so I can't go do the running today. 
Well, you know what? I don't know if it's snowing up there, but boy, we got quite a bit. It's still snowing, but it's that real light snow. But yeah. the peaks, you know, they're just absolutely covered in the clouds. So you know it's really. And then tonight it's supposed to really hit. So um, yeah, all my ways out got blocked. Um, the passes are getting it real hard and Grand Junction's even getting it. So I can't get out. Oh, oh, so oh, wait, you're snowed in is what you're trying yes. to say. You know, yes. that's really smart. I usually try to to go skiing whenever I was going to be able to be snowed in and I could call my yeah. office and say, oh, I'm snowed in. <laughs> I'm sure you figured me out already. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on to you, Sue Brown. Eh. I figured, I figured. So, so on that, Sue, I may be snowed in Thursday morning. Aha. <laughs> 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 Madam Chair, it appears everyone, four board members are present. Oh, good. I see yes, yeah, Supervisor Begay, and there's Matt, and our vice chair is with us. Great. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to good old snowy Flagstaff. We need this. So I'm very, very happy to see it. Um, today, we have a, a presentation and update on the facilities master plan. This is part two of five. Uh, and I think uh, Deputy County Manager Sue Brown is going to introduce this item. Is that correct, County Manager? That is true. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Um, as, as the board knows, uh, this is the second of our five uh, sessions that we'll be doing on the facilities master plan. It'll be presented by facilities management department director, Tom Hanachuk. Um, today, we have some guests with us and he'll explain uh, who they are and how they have helped us through our latest projects, specifically the King Street project. Tom will also have information on the rest of the five um, uh, sessions that we'll be holding on the F the facilities master plan. And I'll also do some, some um, look back at our previous meeting as well. So you'll see kind of what the schedule is. This is a complicated issue. There is a lot to know about it. Um, the county has a lot of owned holdings, a lot of leases. And so what we wanted to do is present this information to you in a manner that allows you to understand as we build the information at the end, any of the asks that we have or the recommendations that we have that you'll have complete context to be able to answer those and to make some decisions about our directions forward. So it's a lot of work, but we hope what you're learning in each one of these sessions is building upon the last session. And at the end of that fifth meeting that you'll be able to give us some direction. So with that, I'm gonna uh, kick it off to Tom. I'll be back to present at various places, but um, Tom, take it away. Tom, you're on mute. I'm still trying to figure out how to share a presentation and then also be on this screen here. So if, if I get weird and go back and forth, it's just me. It's definitely operator error. So uh, thank you, Sue. And thank you, uh, Chair Horseman and members of the board. As Sue mentioned, this is the, uh, the second out of five, uh, initially a five-part series which I think in uh, future years, depending on the direction we get, uh, we'll have uh, med many more discussions about this uh, in upcoming sessions. Uh, so let me just jump right into it. And I'll do a quick recap of where we are and what we have planned. So the first session we had back at uh, the, the first day of February, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we have a second session today. The third session is, to, is pushed back an entire month. So you will have a slight break from this. Uh, and then we have a session on April 5th and then a fifth session, which is to be determined. But in last agenda review, we were kind of eyeballing April 12th. So in theory, um, end of March, beginning of April, we'll kind of wrap this uh, the last three sessions up in those dates. So in the first session, if you recall, we talked, we gave a brief overview of the history of the facilities master plan. And we also uh, kind of highlighted how our department facilities management, specifically in the county, how we operate, how we partner with other departments, how we run projects, different delivery methods. 
And then we, we gave a brief uh, overview of current projects that we have going on, ones that we recently completed. Uh, and we also invited the Sheriff's Office and Public Works and Parks and Rec to kind of give a brief update on what they've, uh, the great work that they've been doing. Today's, today's session, which we'll obviously get into a little bit more detail here in a little bit, is gonna focus solely on the work that we've done for the King Street Campus project, which uh, is about two years worth of work at this point. And obviously there was some delays with the pandemic. Um, we have a new board of supervisors, new county management. So uh, we kind of slowed the process down a little bit. Uh, but Sue Brown and also our, our consultants, uh, DLR group, um, will kind of give a little bit of a history on that and then talk about all the great findings um, that were discovered over the last couple of years. The third session, which is, we'll have uh, um, additional guests attending that from, from the county as an organization. And that's really, we're gonna spend 90 minutes with the board to discuss uh, current needs of the organization that we know right now based on uh, studies that were done, based on our last master planning, based on space needs. And in that, we will have the uh, 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 Judge Slayton from Superior Court. We'll have Sheriff Driscoll uh, from the SO's office. We'll have uh, HHS as part of it, Kim and team. And we will also have Public Works and Parks and Recreation and our department to kind of give an overview of where we currently stand with needs. And that's specific to facilities. The April 5th meeting will we'll have uh, Downtown Business Alliance and NAPTA and potentially other community partners that, that are important to hear from because they are, they are an important factor in our decision on moving forward specific to where county operations happen, where staffing uh, is placed and, and, and all of the factors associated with that. And then the final session and an agenda review the other day will most likely be a uh, at least a two hour session where we're gonna kind of summarize all of the previous four sessions and then have an interactive discussion with the Board of Supervisors to, um, to receive direction on what the next steps are for us. So today's meeting, as I, we briefly alluded to, we're gonna provide uh -huh. a little bit of Yes. I'm so sorry. Just real quick before we leave that, in terms of that final session, and we had a little discussion you might have heard this morning, and um, I think that it would be great uh, to do a recap, you know, a pretty good recap. Uh, you know, you, you say we're having a break of a month, and that's nice in some ways, but boy, memories fade. And as I said, after a week, my memory is gone. So I think it'd be really good for that final session to have a good recap of the previous sessions and then open it up for some, some extensive discussion, hopefully with the board and, and with staff on it. So, uh, you know, I think probably we'll need more than two hours on that, but thank you. And, and that is a day, the, the tentative date you indicated is an evening meeting so it would be great, you know, and talk to the county manager and see what staff looks like to do it in the afternoon for that evening before the evening meeting. So thanks. Sorry. Excellent. Yeah. I would love to spend the whole afternoon. So we can look at three or four hours because we could talk about this all day long because we love it. So <laughs> time as you'd like. Steve's shaking his head. I may have said something wrong. And Supervisor Ryan, I saw you unmuted. I'm not sure if you have a comment or question. No, I, I just, I, I was ready to sit all day with you, Tom, but. Uh, <laughs> we can still do that, even though it's not on the agenda, so. <laughs> yes, we will, we will be sure to, uh, um, uh, to plan more than two hours, so. Um, today, uh, so the point of today specifically, as mentioned earlier, is to talk about the King Street Project, so. Uh, Sue will provide a, a, a very good background on uh, where the project, uh, how it kind of was thought initially, the initial uh, um, factors, uh, the motivating factors that, that um, guided us down the path to explore a little bit more of the King Street campus uh, and opportunities over there. And then we'll turn it over to our amazing consultants, DLR group, who are on the call right now. So uh, welcome Hans and Megan, uh, which will go over all of the very important and extensive work that they did uh, throughout many of the departments in the organization to figure out exactly what they need, what their needs are, and then how they fit into the, uh, the King Street campus. 
And then we should have about 30 minutes at the end to receive feedback from the Board of Supervisors to answer any questions about what we presented on today. So before we go in um, to talking about the details of the King Street pro project, I just want to take about a minute to, to frame what a large project looks like uh, for us as an organization and specifically the facilities management department. And it applies to other departments that are doing large capital projects also. So we'll have a series of six screens here that'll kind of go through the different stages of the project. And again, this is very high level. There's a lot of nuanced details depending on the project, the scope of it, the location of it, the amount of financing. And we're not gonna go into those details because they're not that relevant at this point. This is more to serve the function of how long something like this actually takes us, all of the steps that are involved in it as we go through it. So again, I'm gonna briefly go through this quickly. Um, if there are any specific questions on this, we can certainly feel free to ask them in the middle uh, as I'm talking about it or at the end of the presentation. So the initial phases of any large scale project, and we're talking $5 million plus capital projects. So some of the bigger ones. These days, $5 million doesn't get us too much. So let's talk $20 million projects. So a large building, large, say the size of 110 or the King Street campus. So the initial thing we have is an idea, which Sue will talk about a little bit more with the King Street project in the earlier days. And in this, as you can see right there, um, we really just kind of brainstorm about the overall goals and objectives and potential budgets. Because at this point, we never really know how much, how many of these things are, uh, how much these things are going to cost. And it's very high level planning. And it typically takes, you'll see in these screens, the time period on the bottom of them. So this could take anywhere from six to 18 months depending on what happens. And as we saw with the King Street project, we get geared up and then a global pandemic hits, which obviously you can't prepare for. So that, that um, naturally extends the timeline of the projects. The second phase that we go into is we start so selecting how we wanna deliver the project. And we briefly got into this in session one, um, but this is really where we decide how we want to uh, deliver. It's a project delivery method. So which method we actually want to follow. Um, and again, there's a lot of details of this and I'll kind of skip over that. But this is the portion that we got involved with DLR group that will speak here in a little bit. And depending on how long it takes us to select, that could take anywhere from four to six months to be able to choose the, um, the, the, the provider that or the consultant that we want to work with or the contractor that we want to work with, negotiate contract language, uh, costs and all that. And that could take anywhere from four to six months. And then we go into the really fun part, which is very engaging for the majority of the staff that are involved. So if it affects building occupants, uh, which in most of our cases it does, because it's directly affecting departments, um, this is really where we get into the nuts and bolts and actually get the design down and is really fun. And, uh, there's a lot of conversations. The most robust conversations are typically surrounding the color of walls and accent colors and furniture. Uh, that's where that's usually takes the majority of time. So, and that could take anywhere from six to 12 months, again, depending on the scale of the project and how many constituents stakeholders we need to engage with. And then we go into deciding who we want to build the project and how we actually pay for it. Um, and that could take anywhere from three to six months, again, for a contract and securing funding and associated concepts like that. And then we get into the what some people call the fun part, but for us, it's actually the most stressful because this is where the rubber meets the road. And this is where on a large $20 million project, we better be getting $20 million worth of a building. And there's always complications in every construction project. And that's why you could see with the six to 18 month timeline, again, scale of project, winter weather, there's a lot of factors that, that, that are at play here that may dictate the timeline on that. And then we get into the, the fun part where we actually move, more of the fun part besides picking out colors, moving departments in, closing out the project and starting to engage in all of the warranty items that will inevitably come up regardless of how good of a job our consultants did, our contractors did, or we did as, as a group. So that, again, anywhere from two to five years for a large capital project is about the timeline to have as a frame of reference for how long it takes us as an organization to do a large capital project. 
And right now I wanna turn it over to uh, Ms. Sue Brown, Deputy County Manager Brown, to kind of go over the history of the King Street Campus Project. Thanks, Tom. You can actually stay on this, this um, slide for just a second, because I want to point a couple of things out. Um, go back one for me. Thank you. Um, the conception portion of any large capital construction project should actually have the biggest box, because the ideas of projects we may, not, may want to do can come from a several different uh, uh, pathways. The first, the one we'd love the most is if it was all planned out, like the facilities master plan says, we need to do this, we need to do this, and then we execute it in a very um, particular way. But oftentimes it's also brought to us by trying to solve problems, trying to do something that um, needs to be done to better serve our public. Um, and that can happen with small projects and large projects as well, but it usually takes a lot of time. Um, and that's where you get the five years part is in the concept of doing, you're not only trying to decide what, but you're trying to decide where, and you're trying to decide about the budget element. What can you afford? What can the county afford to do? There are a number of different ways that the county may, may uh, fund a large scale project like this. Um, we may collect cash, which we've done in the past. We may do certificates of participation. We may do bonds. But there are a number of different ways to do that. And it takes a long time for the entire organization to get behind a certain concept, to get the sufficient amounts of information to the board that a decision can be made to move forward. Um, and moving forward is a very incremental, a slightly slow process. There are procurement rules. Um, and if the county is going to move forward on a project that's gonna cost 25 million, we'll say, then we want to make sure that, is, that we do that thoughtful process in the best manner possible. So um, this is very simple for our purposes today, but the, con the conception part of it is really a key element. And that particular part for the King Street project had elements in both the facilities master plan and in need, uh, where we had some issues and we needed to solve those problems so we could better serve our public. So it was a combination of the two. Next slide, Tom. So the King Street project was initiated really, it started in 2018 and 2019, early 2019 calendar year. Um, and it had, we had several issues. We had moved from some initial conversations about the downtown area to the, uh, the consideration of a project at King Street based on a couple of factors. Uh, one was we were having terrible problems with downtown parking. Um, it had become a challenge for our public to receive the services that they need, needed in the downtown area. The new parking um, downtown parking plan was in place. The parking district was in place. And it was, it was presenting significant challenges, especially to the courts and to our statutory officers in the 110 building. Um, so it, started, it was born really from those concerns, but it was also based in consolidating um, some folks, uh, some different services into a single area. And the consolidation of services for land-based services, what we call land-based services, uh, assessor, treasurer, rec recorder, and community uh, development was a key component of it. The assessor, treasurer, and recorder Quarter were experiencing those issues with parking um, and the public that uh, came to them for any of the services they provide, voter registration, early voting, assessor services, or uh, services by the treasurer were really having a hard time with the parking issue. Um, and we knew also that they had an adjacency, a significant adjacency with community development. In other words, there were services that if you wanted to do for instance, do a land split, you needed to access all four of those departments. So um, it was the consolidated that one-stop shop aspect that we were looking for. At the same time, we also needed to create some space for justice services, create some additional areas. We had a lot of leases at the time, pre-pandemic for adult probation, for IT, and we needed to do something about that. We had lease, lease amounts up to about $500,000 annually. And that was a major consideration. Excuse me, consideration. Um, we also wanted to optimize space at King Street. We had a large building. We had consolidated the um, departments of health, health services, community services, and career services 
into health and human services. And it wasn't working very well at the time because of, you know, sort of trying to meld those services together um, was complicated. And um, the, the building itself wasn't working as well as it could have for that purpose. So we had identified that possibility as, a, as an upcoming project, but we also knew we had about two acres of space at King Street. And it became clear that we had some options for the future that we needed to consider. The other thing we wanted to do is to create basically another campus that we could put some consolidated services like uh, employee childcare perhaps, or things like that in a consolidated campus where there, where there was easier access. And one thing King Street did have was sufficient parking. Um, so all of those things sort of took us to the point where we started to look at a consolidation of the land-based services and um, a co-location there with all of those folks and then additional an additional building on the King Street property. Now, Health and Human Services does not have that joint um, uh, customer base. Uh, it is not a consolidation of services with the, we call them TRAC, Treasurer, Recorder, Assessor, and Community Development. Um, but there was sufficient space there to create an additional campus where we can consolidate other services like employee ch child care on that location. And that's why we started to talk about doing everything at King Street, uh, those things at King Street rather. Um, and we also were, from that, we were also going to be able to see a, a, a substantial decrease in our operational dollars if we were able to get out of some leases. So that was another part of the purpose as well. Next slide, Tom. <coughs> Excuse me. So <coughs> in fall of 2019, um, <coughs> I, wanna, I wanna actually <coughs> back up a little bit because we started, um, FMD started with then Assistant Director Esler Musta and, <coughs> excuse me, um, Assistant Director Esler Musta and Business Manager Janice Bradley worked very hard on doing some preliminary programming, um, confirming the services, the needs of each one of the, the players in this uh, proposed King Street project. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so we worked very much with uh, Health and Human Services. We worked with the treasurer, assessor, and recorder. We worked with community development and spent a, a good amount of time with each of them. And they spent a good amount of time filling out reports, um, doing sessions with us where we would talk about all of the different things that each one of them do um, and get down to the, the nitty gritty of their day-to-day -day work and services to the public. Um, and how the public like to access services. We also did some, um, a lot of different um, um, surveys to the public. We, we uh, spent some time in the lobby of the 110 building asking the members of the public who came in, you know, what did they like best about how their service went? What did they like least? How they talked about parking. So there was a lot of outreach done, not just to departments, but also to the folks who are served by those departments. Um, and with that, we were better able to define what the needs were, and that allowed us to be more careful and um, thorough about how we put together um, the idea of, of procurement for services from an architectural firm and from a construction firm. Um, so we did an RFQ for design in fall of 2019. We got that approval to move forward with the project in October of 2019. The board decided that they would like to look at uh, the construction of a 60,000 square foot addition or adjacent building at the King Street site to the existing building. The existing building is about 41,000 square feet. And the new building would be 60,000 square feet, which is a substantial footprint um, in that location. Um, and when we began to really look into it, we decided because we'd had a couple of things that happened during this time. Um, and they were pretty substantial, pretty, pretty impactful. We had had two occasions where we had taken on water in the back parking lot of King Street. And we knew that some things had changed in engineering in the neighborhood on the streets. And we thought that possibly that may have had something to do with it. And we also had a couple of instances of significant rainfall in the monsoon season that have caused it. We had uh, some longstanding issues with stormwater movement 
on the parcel. So we needed to answer some questions first. So those were really key components that we wanted um, uh, to look at first. So when we did the RFQ for design, our successful, um, uh, our successful proposer was DLR and Megan and Hans are with us today. Um, and we started to look at the possibility of this large 60,000 square foot building and how we could place it on the site. That too was an interesting uh, concept because it did involve some questions of stormwater and drainage, parking, all of the main things you have to look at before you even think about construction of a building. You have to make sure that the underpinnings of everything uh, work first. And so there was a lot of work done there. We did a lot of it in partnership with uh, DLR. Before we even got to the design component, we needed to know what the site could take and um, what our choices were for adding significant square footage. So with DLR on board, we began with a master site plan. Uh, what can we do? How can we do it? What will our challenges be? Will do our initial uh, budget numbers actually work? At the time we moved forward, we had approximately $10 million in cash that we could put toward the project. And we were anticipating bonds in the amount of about 16 million. So, um, and looking at that, it was, it seemed to go. We thought we had it ready to go. And we began to work with DLR on the master site plan. Um, it was important that we know what challenges we had on site. And it was important that we understand all of the opportunities that we could take advantage of with the site. We did a lot of neighborhood meetings um, and they were very productive. We had a lot of the folks from the neighborhood coming in, talking to us about what they liked, what they didn't like. We had initial uh, meetings with the city as well. Um, and we, we came down to you know, having to understand a few real, real challenges that the site presented and what it would um, lead us to do in, when we did begin design. And next one, Tom. So with that, um, with those opening comments, I'm going to go to, I'm going to kick it off for Hans and Megan to take over to talk about their part in it. When we narrowed down initially, instead of going directly into design, we decided to look at the entire site and really have a good definition of what our challenges, our opportunities were on that site. So with that, I'll turn it over to Hans and Megan. All right. Thanks, Sue. Everyone, thank you so much for having DLR uh, present to you today, um, the Coconino County Service Center Master Plan. Um, as Sue had and Tom had mentioned, we've been working on this for quite some time. And uh, today we're gonna touch really high, high level on all the things that we've done up to date. Uh, so we're not gonna dive into the details too much, but uh, we'll leave some room at the end for questions. The agenda is going to be just to do a quick intro of the team, um, the visions and goals that we set forth at the beginning of the project, uh, look at the whole process on how we collected and mined data from all the different entities and stakeholders, and then uh, how we collected that data, processed it, and came up with some site recommendations for the King Street site, and then we put some pricing together for a couple of the options. Next. The team that worked on the project, we have Megan Duffy, who's on the call. She's our senior interior designer and uh, I'd say our program master for this project. I am the project manager. Uh, I'm an architect and also a design leader for the project. And Larry Smith, he wasn't able to be with us today, but he is our principal in charge, um, our architect of record and client liaison. Next. So the visions and goals, this is um, very important to me on every project I work on um, is to set the foundation for every project. We want the, the vision of the stakeholders, the goals of the stakeholders in the community. And we like to spell it out and, and reiterate this at every presentation. This isn't something that DLR group just makes up on our own. We, this, this vision and goals uh, statement, we sat down with uh, Sue, well, we'll call it the executive team, which was um, the, you know, county manager, deputy county manager, uh, director of facilities management, assistant director of facilities management, director of uh, information systems, and the um, business manager for FMD. And from getting uh, mining information from them, we were able to put this uh, vision statement together. And I'll just touch on a couple of things. Um, one of the main visions for this project, we really wanted to reimagine the approach 
to the services and the workplace experience. So looking at the existing building, how can we elevate the workplace experience and the service that the county can provide to its, its, uh, its county members? Uh, also, for this project to be successful, it has to serve the public in ways that are faster, more efficient, and easier to use. So looking at that uh, as an overall design element, how can we really uh, re reevaluate and reimagine this building to allow the county to be more efficient with what they're doing and for people to come in and get the services they need. Um, the, the major goals for the project include elevating the customer experience for health and human services, as well as the land-based service departments, uh, improve business practices to positively affect outcomes and optimize an innovative space that enhances both the customer and employee experience so that the county can attract and retain uh, professionals and dedicated workforce. So it's not just about the community, it's about the people in the building that are doing the work as well. We wanna make sure everybody as a whole is taken care of. Um, next slide. You know, and, and I, I guess I should have touched on and I, Sue did a great job and Tom setting the stage, but the, our real big picture was to create a one-stop shop for both the land-based services and, hum, and, and human-based services all on one site within one or two buildings. And so that's kind of where we went and, and started to dive into um, the whole project. And in order to get the information we needed, we needed to really dive in and collect data from all the stakeholders. So we, we went and, and mined data. This is the meat and potatoes of this whole project was collecting data that the county can use in the future. So we went and talked to the treasurer, recorder, assessor, uh, emergency management. We, we dove into every different department and found out what their needs are for the next 20 years. So we didn't necessarily look at what their needs are for today. We wanted to look for the, what they are for the future. Um, and with that, I'm going to let Megan kind of dive into this. This is what she specializes in, and this is where her heart and soul has been for the past year and a half of uh, mining data, uh, collecting it, processing it, and then uh, handing it over to me to do some good site design work. So, Megan. Thanks, Hans. So, like Hans mentioned, we had two groups that we were working with. We were working with the executive team, and then we also had a leadership team, which included um, department and program heads of, of every department that was going to potentially be in these buildings. Um, the first thing that we did in this process was to do a visioning session where we asked a lot of um, open-ended questions about what was working, what wasn't working. We also looked at it through the lens of pre-COVID and post-COVID, um, even though we still haven't gotten to post-COVID. Um, we were optimistic when we were doing this that we were, we were getting closer. So we did quite a few different exercises um, to figure out kind of where the county is at and where they wanted to be. Um, so you can see that we talked about um, values in architecture and design and sustainability. Um, we talked about the cultural continuum. So really establishing where the culture is now and then where they wanted to be in the new building. Um, what was working, what wasn't working within the context um, of COVID and, and post COVID. And then things that this building could potentially create in terms of better service, better function, better employee retention. Next. So we did spend a lot of, a lot of times with the departments and the programs. Um, we had each of them fill out a really detailed survey. And then we took a couple of hours um, spaced out and really talked and dived deeply into the questionnaire that we had sent to make sure that we were cap capturing all the right employee information, meeting space, work from home ratios, future growth. Um, you know, really trying to get a holistic picture of what each department needed um, for this 20 year time period. So we spent a lot of time working one on one with department heads and their um, support staff to get this correct. And that led us to this next thing. So next. So we have these really fun spreadsheets, um, which I, we do not expect you to read from here. But essentially what this shows is we took all the different department information, um, quantified it to really figure out how big the building needed to be and if the existing HHS program would actually fit into the existing building um, so that we could start to develop, develop the options for the different site um, options that Hans will cover in a bit. So we did that for HHS and we also did that for land-based um, 
programming. And so you can see how those start to layer together. Obviously there's synergy that happened between both. And so as we look at options and started to explore things, we tried to figure out what could we do to reduce square footage, um, to be as efficient as possible, but also provide enough room and space for growth. Um, and then also looking at the stats, like how many square foot per person is this? Um, how does waiting and lobby function? Um, how efficient is the building? What does it look like if we have more standardized office sizes and standardized workspace sizes? And what does work space, um, workstation sizes look like if you're doing um, shared versus, um, you know, hoteling versus owning a workstation. So we did a lot of deep dives into that to come up with our final um, program analysis. Another thing that was really important as we are looking at this kind of chunk of time is, you know, there was a lot of fear about coming back into the work place post COVID. Um, what does workplace look like now that we've all been able to be really successful working from home? Um, DLR group um, is based in a lot of research. So we have quite a bit of workplace research um, just around um, COVID and what this kind of new imagined workplace could be and what's been working and, and tested with large companies like LinkedIn, Google, Facebook, um, some of those tech companies, along with what we're also seeing trending in um, county facilities since Hans and I both work, are working with almost all of the counties right now in some capacity. And so there's just more information, like what does the data say? How do we re-entry employees back um, into a work environment so that they feel safe? Um, you know, how does the schedule work? What does that look like for real estate? Um, a lot of this is just about messaging and communication. Um, and then also space obviously plays a huge portion of this. We want to make sure we're right sizing since, you know, COVID may not always be around, but maybe a form of it um, may be around in some capacity. And so what does that look like? How can we um, attract future employees? Um, how can we retain employees? How can we plan this building in a really smart way so that you have flexibility? So if it compresses or expands, that there's opportunity for that to occur within the architecture. So one of the things that we did, these are not final plans by any means, not even close, but essentially just block diagrams of what does the program look like within this space? And so we explored what HHS looked like in terms of just fitting into um, essentially the foot plate that it has, um, floor plate that it has now, and maybe a little bit of an addition. And so that's what 1A um, program options are. You can see we tried to um, capitalize on the first level and the second level, getting as much as we could in there, but also really paying attention to public circulation. That was one of the components through all of our surveying efforts and communication that we realized was um, really lacking um, that the circulation through the building, um, how can we get minimal people to circulate all the way to the second floor and kind of create this security barrier on the first level. Next. And then how do we all fit into this space? And so how much, how many meeting rooms can we fit in here? Does the EOC fit? Does it not? Um, how does maybe the one-stop shop work in conjunction with the public capacity restrooms? Um, you know, how does the boardroom potentially get access? Can we fit a gym in? Um, so we explored a lot of different components that were requested within the programming um, conversations. Megan? Yes. Um, I just wanted to throw one little piece in here that, that um, we also were very speculative in this, in this programming. We didn't know in the end um, exactly who we would want to design for specifically. We knew um, we wanted to design for a remodel for HHS. We knew we were very interested in putting um, track in on the site as well, but we didn't know because we were looking at building a 60,000 square foot addition, which is a, basically an overbuild, but we, we had sort of planned that the top two floors of that building would be um, a dark space. They wouldn't be finished but that they could potentially be finished at some time uh, in the near future. Uh, again, this is back in 2019, this was pre-COVID. Um, so we looked at possibilities for other programs that might be able to go into those additional two floors. So we had information because we knew that if we programmed other departments who maybe weren't part of HHS or weren't part of um, the track 
of folks, the treasurer, recorder, assessor, and community development, that we would have the information about where they would fit in other places. So we went ahead and got the data and the information from the county manager's office, the board of supervisors, and for uh, adult probation, because we knew that there were uh, possibilities for uh, the admin building, what we could do in that area, possibly uh, things that we could do in the 110 building. And we knew that there were some leases that definitely were coming up and were going to expire and had, had space that really wasn't adequate anymore. So this was really an effort to optimize programming um, for any possibility. So just if you see mentions of boardrooms and things, that, that's where that comes through from. We decided to program the board and the manager as well, um, just to see for future what that may entail as well. And that's just part of what you can do. The more data you gain, the more information you gain, um, it helps your planning as you move forward. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, thank you, Sue. Um, yeah, like she said, we, we looked at a lot of different scenarios and none of these scenarios will you see adult probation because it just didn't make a lot of sense in terms of sense of security, arrivals, um, some of the nuances of adult probation um, didn't really, weren't cohesive with some of the other program requirements. And so you won't see adult probation in, in any of these plans um, purposely for that reason. Um, if you'll go to the next one, this is where we started to explore what happens if we take land base and HHS and combine them. And the great thing about this program is we really get to reduce the amount of lobby space. So you truly have a one-stop shop in this scenario. Um, so it's a little bit less square footage than option three that we'll show you, but it was just like, okay, how does this work? And then we were like, how do we, how are we going to fit a new building and an old building together? And what kind of, um, you know, structural issues will that create? And so we were thinking about all these kind of components in the back of our head um, as we were going through these scenarios and testing what we thought would work and what we thought would be more challenging. If you'll go to option three. So option three was really taking um, option one and saying, okay, we'll, we'll get HHS in the existing building. And then what happens if we take um, land base and we create essentially a two and a half story, three story building. So the one stop shop is on the bottom with some meeting rooms and functional stair restrooms, that kind of thing. And then second and third level actually have the workspace. And so that you truly create this extremely secure first floor um, and then all the land based services, including um, potentially um, the recorder um, elections, all of that go in the second and third level, and that that would be a separate building. So um, looked at a lot of different options in conjunction with all of the information that we gathered. And I'll pass it back off to Hans to talk more about how the site played out. Yeah, I also do want to mention, so all the programming that we did um, to date is in a separate booklet from the master plan. We decided to separate the two. So the county has this programming booklet of almost 200 pages of information and data that was collected that they can go back and look at and say, okay, what this department, um, WIC department, they, they see their growth in the next 20 years to be only three employees. They can start to use that as a reference guide for any up and coming changes. And so it, it even though we, we sat here and programmed for this facility itself, it can be used in so many different ways. Uh, if, if one of the departments does need to move to a different facility, you can use some of this data that we mined for that as well. So um, we have two separate packets. One is a programming packet, and then we take all that information and we decide how are we going to fit this on the site now? So that's what I'll, I'll be discussing here. You know, Megan's um, block diagrams that she just was showing they're very rudimentary and they're very, you know, just basic, but it gives us the basic square footage of what's needed. So we looked at the existing 41,000 square foot building. We can fit all of HSS and HHS in there just fine. And then we found out that through uh, the other departments that we looked at for the land-based services and county manager and board of supervisors, we need about another 35,000 square feet to, to add to those, to the existing building. Um, so what we did is we looked at three different options and um, we, we looked at a lot more than three, but we came up with three different options and we wanted to keep it very simple. Um, I'll hit them real high and then I'll dive deep into them. There's one option that Megan showed you, which is just a remodel of the existing building. 
Option two is to remodel the existing building and have an attached 35,000 square foot two-story building uh, with a one-stop shop. And option three is to remodel the existing building and have a detached 35,000 square foot building uh, located somewhere else on the site. Um, next. So option one, um, looking at the site, as Sue had mentioned early on, they've had uh, a couple significant rainstorms within the past few years at this site, which caused flooding. So we have to do our due diligence as architects, designers, and engineers to not just build you a building, but make sure that the building is going to be built correctly, last a long time, you know, 40-year life cycle plus, um, and, and is built efficiently and cost effective. And so when we looked at the site, we first wanted to look at water. So we did hire a landscape architect and a civil engineer to sit down with us and kind of look at the flow of water onto the site and how we can design around that and things that we can do. So I'm not going to dive deep into that in this presentation, but I just want you to be aware that we have looked at the site and done some civil engineering uh, design for each one of these options that allows with uh, reworking the site to funnel the water into specific zones to retain it and, and get it pumped back out down onto King Street where uh, it's technically supposed to go. So option one is, uh, go back one, Tom, sorry. Uh, is remodeling the existing building. You can see two orange boxes uh, in, on the building. The first big box uh, is the lobby space. In order to create a one-stop shop, you really need a very grandiose lobby space that's very open. Uh, it's very, it's got great wayfinding. It, uh, it's got a bunch of teller windows to where all the different departments or people can go and access all the different departments within that building. Um, the smaller orange box is another small little lobby space that would be adding on to uh, that would have a drive through window. This is uh, to help out with some of uh, the people that do not want to come into the building. They can actually get some of their services through a drive through window. It's something that uh, we've heard through the county was um, a want and a need. And so we've added that in. And then just the two boxes are of the existing building. We'd look at renovating the whole space completely, you know, tear it down to the structure, rework the mechanical, the electrical, reorganize it to efficiently work for all the different departments involved in this building. Um, there's a lot of a lot of opportunities with this, um, but with that, there's also challenges. And one of the major challenges is staying operational while trying to construct the building. Um, so there's ways we've devised some ways, high level ways of phasing the project, but I think we have um, a great hold uh, grasp on how we think we can phase the project out through construction so it stays operational. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges is creating a new lobby is how does that stay operational? Um, I think we have ways that we can do that. Um, with this site option, uh, you have an existing retention pond on the southwest corner of the building. Um, and we're trying not to touch that at all, but just because we need a lot of the site retention for the water that's flowing on the site. And you also have this piece of land on the north east corner where you kind of see like a walking track. Um, that walking track, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Is that you, Tom? Okay. Uh, uh, we, we talked about developing this piece of site uh, as like a public, I don't want to say a park, but a public space that uh, employees can use, the public can use. It could have a cabana out there um, for if, if, you know, the county needed to do vaccinations, the cabana could have restrooms, a sink. Um, they, they can have, um, you know, picnics out there, community events. It also links the, the, the main thoroughfares uh, so you can walk through the site to get to the site. Um, but option number one is, is, is really just kind of looking at remodeling the existing building. Uh, this, is, this is similar to what Megan showed earlier. You know, we took that remodel and we looked at how can we fit the space in there? Does it all fit? And it does. So uh, thumbs up that we, we, we can make sure we can fit all of health and human services into this existing building with a small little addition pop out for the entry and then the drive through access. I think that it would include emergency management too, correct? That is correct. Yes. So we, we are adding emergency management to this building. They have actually been in the building for, I think, the past year and a half through COVID. Um, and we found a way to get them the space that they require uh, for the next 20 years. And we can get that to fit within the space. And I will say, in order for this to happen, all these departments have to work together as a team. There's going to be a lot of shared spaces. There's going to be a lot of shared uh 
conference rooms and shared community rooms. And there's ways through technology that we can work with them to allow them to reserve rooms and, and share them uh, very effortlessly. And I think they are all on board. After speaking with all the heads of each department and program, um, they are all on board to work together to, to get everything in one building that functions and, and becomes more efficient for them. Next. We can jump to the next one. So option two, we looked at um, attaching a, a new 30,000 square foot two-story building to the existing building after it's been remodeled. Um, it's down in the southeast corner. And in order to attach it, uh, we looked at several different locations to attach it. And the most cost-effective one was to kind of place it on the empty piece of land uh, on the southeast corner. Unfortunately, that's a re the existing retention basin for the site. So there's gonna be a, a considerable amount of site work that needs to be done uh, to retain the water now that comes on the site. Um, with this option, you know, it's everything that I mentioned in option one, but then you get this new building attached to it and they have uh, a shared lobby space, which Megan had mentioned, um, having a shared lobby space for both buildings reduces the amount of square footage needed for a lobby space because it becomes a true one-stop shop. People can come for all their human-based services and land-based services to one lobby, and then they can be directed to specific teller windows or different conference rooms to meet with someone. And we share a lot of the different, a lot of the spaces with both buildings connected. Um, you know, uh, we, we, by adding a new building to the site, we have to add more parking. Um, there's parking codes. So we, we would actually be adding uh, quite a bit of parking space to the northeast corner um, where we had in the previous phase, we had like a, a walking track and a park area, we'd be adding parking. Um, this site doesn't necessarily fit all the parking requirements we need, but we believe it's going to work to fit and, and, and bring, have enough space for not only the employees, but then the customers that are coming to the building. Next option or next slide. Sorry about that, Hans. I'm having a hard time. My figure's going so fast, but the PowerPoint's not catching up. All right, the next one. There we go. All right. Is it frozen? You good? No, no I got it. I, I'm good. So option three. Uh, option three is uh, looking at a detached uh, 35,000 square foot building. And how we, we looked at several places to put this. And uh, it just seemed to fit up in the northwest corner very well. Um, so in this option, we do all the things we did in option one, remodel the existing health and human service building, get them up and going. And then we can dive into a different phase of the project and build the new two-story building completely detached. Um, so much easier for construction to have it be detached as opposed to attached. We also added um, a drive-through window on the first floor, uh, underground parking, um, and there's potential for, you know, some, some balcony space that look up to the mountains. Um, it creates two separate lobby spaces. So I think there's also, we can add some great wayfinding to the site. So people know right when they pull into the site, which building they need to go to. Um, functionally, I think both option two and three are great. Uh, but option three has, is a much, it's much more, um, easy to deal with during construction and easier to phase out over time. Uh, you don't have to remodel a building that you just remodeled by attaching it to it because it's a whole separate building. Um, but you know, like all, all projects, there's opportunities and challenges. There's a ton of opportunities here. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, I've listed a few of them already, but the challenge, one of the challenges here, um, Actually, one of the challenges is water retention, but we, we, we can found a way to take the existing retention pond on the southeast corner and actually build it up and, and, and re, we can use that retention pond and build up so we can retain all the water required. Whereas in option two, we had to put underground storage tanks, which I didn't get into before, but all of this, um, we looked at all these options. Uh, we've ran all these options through the executive team, the leadership team, and uh, we've taken all their ideas and compiled them into these three options. And then we also put pricing to it all too. So next slide. Uh, yeah, this that was just the program of it. Um, and then the conceptual pricing. So 
you know, we looked at this very high level. We didn't dive into the nitty gritty of all the details because we don't have all the details now. Um, so there's, you know, contingencies involved in these pricing. But for option one, looking at the renovation of the health existing health and human service building, it's 42,000 square feet. We're adding about uh, 2,000 square feet of additional space to it. Um, just for the tenant improvement portion of the project, which means just the gutting of the inside and renovating the inside of the existing building, you're looking at about $5,661,000. Um, site development, that one included, uh, you know, new entry uh, parking area, drive through, and then the uh, Northeast, um, we'll call it the, the recreation area with the, the walking place, uh, walking path uh, is around $830,000. And then the soft costs, uh, there's about $3 million and a half uh, dollars in soft costs on the project. And, and this, the soft costs, uh, typically what's included in the soft cost is uh, estimating contingency, owner's contingency, design fees, um, geotech and surveys, commissioning, permits, utilities, uh, FF&E, moving allowance, and then we also put in there a one year 4% um, cost escalation. So for option one, you're looking at around, I'll just, add, I'll just roll it up to a $10 million fee to remodel the existing HSS building. Now that only will house the HHS and emergency management in that building, and it'll be a one-stop shop for them. If we look at option two, which we're adding a whole new 35,000 square foot two-story building, all those costs will add up to around $25,777. So that's with the remodel of option one, and then the new 35,000 square foot two-story building. And then uh, option three is, it's very similar, uh, but the cost is a little bit more because we have more square footage because we had to add a whole new lobby space. Um, and uh, that cost is coming in around $26,836. Um, there's, there's also the potential we talked about is, the, Sue had, had mentioned it, if we wanted to build shell space, that's also a potential, but it's something we didn't put into this project. You could also build, you know, not just a two-story 35,000 square foot building, you could build a four-story 60,000 square foot building and shell it out. Um, that's another option, but, you know, we, we, we wanted to keep it very simple. We knew that there was a specific budget and range. And so these were the three options we came up with. And we all agreed between the executive team and the leadership team and DLR that these were the best to present to the, to the board of supervisors. Um, with that, that's, that's our presentation on uh, where we stand with the master plan. Um, I want, we want to open it up to questions and uh, see if we can answer any questions from the board. Tom, if you mind if I can add, and Tom, if I can just add one last thing for the board to, can, to understand the context of this um, information is that we are not asking for any decisions from the board. This is informational. This gives us sort of a place, a, a, a point, if you will. It's like dropping a point on a map of at this time and place, if we were to move forward with any projects related to the King Street site, um, option one being the full remodel, option two being an adjacent um, uh, new construction and a remodel, and the third one being uh, a, a building on the upper northeast portion of the site in addition to the remodel. This is what they would cost. Um, it gives us a lot of information at a time where it's difficult to get an idea of, of where we want to go and what we want to do because we're not quite out of the pandemic but it provides us with that background. It provides us with the programming information and it lets us know for this place in time of what these kinds of projects would cost. So I'm not asking for any major decisions or anything, that's the context. This is for information. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Sue and thanks for that clarification. Obviously this is a, a lot of brand new information to some of the members of the board and some of the members of the board this is um, information that they discussed back in 2019 and it seems like we're in a diff very different world than we were in back in 2019 so I, I think that is when you talk about reimagined what we were imagining back in 2019 
it's probably very different than what we're imagining here in, in 2022. But thank you. I, I'm sure there will be some questions, but I want to uh, thank you very much for this uh, overview. Um, and it was clear and concise, and we really appreciate uh, the information. And I'm sure we're going to have some questions. I know I do. Um, uh, j just real quickly, since this is up, one, one of the questions, no, the other was up. Uh, the project cost, when was that determined? Um, let me actually go find the date because I have it here. I believe it was, uh, it was uh, in December is when these project costs were put together. Uh, we worked with uh, a contractor who, you know, gave us some quotes on helping us price some of this out for what the current prices are going for, for materials, cost per square foot for specific things. Because that that is uh, seems to be changed moment. I don't know what changes faster, cost of construction or or the or the or the stock market. So you're saying December in 2021 is when you were looking at this. That's is that correct. correct. Yep, uh, December uh -huh. 2021, and you know we did add four percent of cost escalation um, uh -huh. for a year to allow for a year for this project. So when you were talking about that you need sufficient parking and early on you were talking about that there was one was the need and number two was uh, sufficient parking. What number did you come up with that you felt was sufficient parking and what did that in entail? And then I wanna ask you about the parking numbers for your various options. But going back first to um, you needed more parking in the downtown area, which is why you look to the King Street so what number were you looking for that you needed? Well, there's there's codes that require how much parking we have depending on the building occupancy. So this building occupancy would be listed as a B occupancy, which is business class. Um, it basically states that for every, uh, for every square foot, every 300 square feet, you get one parking stall. So currently the existing health and human service building has, well over the amount of parking that they need so they're very they, they're flush with parking right now um, when you add a new thirty-five thousand square foot building to that site you then have to add parking for that building so the parking requirements um to add a new a new space to it um let me see here the the it would be around 237 parking stalls are required uh, when we add a new building to the site. Okay. Um, and so that's supposed to be, uh, that's per code. I get that. I, I wish the city of Flagstaff realized that when they put their, their, their uh, city courthouse up, but that's another point. Um, <laughs> the 300 square feet, one parking stall, uh, 35,000 building is 237 parking stalls. That's not based on the number of employees that will be in there or the number of, um, of uh, community members that may be accessing the building. It's just a code number, is that correct? That's correct. And and I will say that's depending on how the building's used and, um, you know, we looked at, um, you know, how, how do people work in, in today's world right now uh, nearing the end of COVID? And there's a lot of work from home, you know, providing a drive-through access might limit how many people are parked on the site. Um, but yeah, it's it's a code driven number. It's not based on employee counts. And, and also, uh, you know, you're the county and the county is the one that would be reviewing these drawings and reviewing the parking codes. So we can also apply for a variance. Um, we can do parking studies to see how many, you know, how many people would actually be parking on the facility and, and reduce the number down. But um, we are actually only short seven spots and we didn't include any off street parking. So it's, it's not like we're well, way off the mark here. So you're short and seven spots for uh, the, for your, for your drawing. Okay. All right, yeah. For sorry. option one and option two or option, okay. option two and option three. Sorry. Yeah. Got it. So, and then my other question is when, when, when a long time ago on a galaxy far, far away, when, when they were looking to leave the downtown area for some of these administrative offices or administrative buildings, when they said, and, and Sue, I believe you said that parking was at that time a concern. And I guess my question is, what did you believe you needed in terms of numbers for parking 
um, that you didn't have for for downtown uh, for downtown offices. Uh, thanks for the question, Madam Chair. Um, at the time, we felt, um, and actually, what we were buying was about seventy five spaces. Um, that was sort of our our um, established shortage of spaces. Mm -hmm. um, challenge with and then a bit of unknown in terms of the in terms of the departments we were working with we knew we also had issues uh with jury parking as well um that was an un that's an unknown number because it moves so much um depending on the oh. jury calls the number of jury calls the number of juries that we have um i can i can say though without question the most interesting thing that we've learned from um the way that we have virtualized our services is that um, I think anyone who comes downtown has seen since the start of the pandemic that that virtualization of services has changed the parking conversation substantially. And I think we have a large unknown what our, our established shortage of parking is right now. Um, I'll tell you that I don't know that we filled a parking lot since the pandemic began um, for either service because we virtualized so much. Um, so, uh, you know, that's what we paid for. That's what we purchased was about 75 additional parking spaces annually. Mm -hmm. But right now we still do, um, but they're not full. Um, our, none of our parking lots with the exception sometimes of 110 on a particularly busy day um, might be full, but the rest of them are not. So I think, you know, when we started this project, we were basing it on our experience, what we knew and what we were working with and the challenges we had. We would add space and we would add lease space when we simply did not have any own space. We changed that um, during the first pandemic year. We got rid of most of our leases and changed instead to telework, uh, shifts of telework in our um, adult probation, in uh, human uh, resources and in information technology and we're able to use county owned space instead of a lot of leases. We still have one major lease at the 420 North San Francisco building. So we we have used the pandemic uh, not just to respond to such a significant issue, but also to re-envision how we work. And we did it very quickly. Um, some works, some didn't. We've adjusted and we've adjusted again. Um, and we have new ways of doing things. But what has been highly successful across the board is the general virtualization of work and workforce has been incredibly good, as has our leadership in working through the issues of telework. And um, I believe that uh, the public is also seeking virtual service uh, uh, on a greater percentage of the time their initial reach out is virtual um, rather than in person as much. Uh, we certainly, you know, I think this is a statement that we always make, but it's always worth restating is that we will always have a, a presence, a physical presence, a physical place for the public to seek services from the county. Sure. We'll always have that. That's, that's, that is just us. We always, we always are with our public in person. Um, but there is a large section of our public that now demands virtual services met that, I think, across the board as well and adapted. And as Hans mentioned a couple of times, uh, the use of older, te uh, not technology, but design has worked well for us as well. Drive-throughs have become our need as well. Um, they have really worked for us in terms of the treasurer's office for elections. Um, in fact, and we would love to see a more, um, a local one uh, for the HHS building at King Street for not just things that are pandemic related, but flu clinics, uh, uh, different kinds of things that they could do. Um, technology, not technology again, design works, uh, drive through. The public doesn't have to park. Um, they simply go through, they go to the window or they go to the in-person service right there outside their window and get their service as well. So I think we, and DLR has been great about bringing information about uh, what the rest of the world is doing in terms of pandemic response and change of services and those kinds of things. Um, and I think there's still some additional imagining to do on how we reimagine we provide service, but it's a, I, I truly believe it's a combination of things and the problems that we defined 
pre-pandemic, uh, the problems look different today. Uh, some are, we maintain some of them, of course, if things are too crowded. And, and I say this with all love and respect for the King Street building at 2625 North, North King Street, but it still has some design issues that could certainly be amended uh, to help HHS provide their services in a much more easier way for that staff and those customers to seek those services in that building. But I think um, a lot of the issues that we were trying to solve have, have evolved through virtual service and the public seeking service differently from us uh, since the pandemic began. Uh, well, well said. So I, I, I think you, uh, you, you really outlined it pretty completely on what we learned from COVID and, and, and doing business, uh, you know, post COVID. So uh, thank you for that. Um, mem uh, members uh, of the board are, do we have some other questions? Lots of information to go through and shift through. And I'm sure there will be some questions that will be bubbling up um, as we move forward. But other questions, I see Vice Chair Geronimo Vasquez. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the presentation, very enlightening. Uh, the piece that, that I was curious about is, it's a pretty big, significant jump from option one to two and three. And so my, my, my initial question is, if we were to go with one, which departments or which stakeholders wouldn't be moving over? Because I assume if we're building another building, that that would mean that there's more movement of departments or stakeholders in to fill that building. And so it just seems like option one is like the bare minimum option and then two and three are a little more uh, extravagant. And so I'm trying to figure out where, where are the differences in terms of departments and staffing and placing and whatnot. Who gets left out if we do, do option one, I guess is my question. You gonna take it, Sue? Yeah, I'll take it if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, go um, for it. Do you mind? No. Thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Vice Chair uh, Vasquez. Um, so the first option is for the remodel of, of health and human services. It is to leave health and human services in the building and to add the specialized space, uh, particularly a more uh, substantial uh, um, emergency operations center for emergency management in that location. Um, the building was actually constructed uh, in 1997. Um, and it's a good building. It's a quality build. Um, it occupies the site well. We have some uh, tremendous uh, solar installations on that building. But unfortunately, it's built on uh, what will, was designed in an older paradigm of service. So the public, when they seek service in the King Street building, have to go throughout the building to get it. They can't walk in the front door, get what they need, like a dog license or any of the huge array of human-based services that we have um, that actually don't take a substantial amount of time. So it takes them a lot of time in the building. And as you know, many of the folks seeking services in the King Street building are families. Um, and so that becomes even harder uh, when you have to go up the elevator, up the stairs, down, everything else. So it needs redesign. So that's the focus of op option one is to redesign that building, a good building, um, a, a well-made building so that it follows those more service-based, client-based protocols that we recognize today are, are the most important for serving the public. Um, option two do, and option three do the same thing. They add substantial square footage that would allow the treasurer, most likely the treasurer, recorder, assessor, and community development to occupy a new addition on that side as well. So those are the, uh, those are the departments um, that would stay where they are, so to speak, or could stay where they are. There are other options out there too. Um, but for this project, these project um, plans, it would leave the treasurer, recorder, assessor, and community development in their current location. Okay. Thank you. Now I appreciate that clarification. The other piece of it, I just want to say, uh, as, as far as design, I think I personally like the design of option two best, but I have issues with the water, water retention uh, piece. And so that, that's a concern for me, considering how much, how much flooding we've had. And so um, I just wanted to kind of point that out. But I, I do like the design for option two, but 
the the water the potential for floods and and having to do underground cisterns and whatnot that that's a little bit of a concern yeah and i think our you know the, int the intent of the this presentation was just to kind of inform you we have a lot of more data that if if you guys need it i know it's part of this presentation you can read into the opportunities and challenges but we also have more data we can send for you to to look into but you know, option two, there, there, it's not just the underground water cistern that's a challenge, but there's disruption when you attach another building to an existing building that happens that um, adds more challenges. But like I said, there's great opportunities. You get a, a true one-stop shop lobby where you can have the, the land-based services and, and health and human services have one lobby that's shared. So everyone knows, hey, this is the building I need to go to to get my services from the county. So I love that option too. Great, thank you. Any other supervisors have some questions? Um, Judy, um, Supervisor Begay. Um, I guess in all of this, um, I'm, I'm really interested. Supervisor Begay, can you turn up your volume? We're having a hard time hearing you. Now? Now? No. about now better okay i'm done with what i had to say <laughs> that was so eloquent <laughs> i want to i want to thank everyone for doing the presentation and um getting us you know to uh, information as to what you know we can um uh what scenarios we can see so um, going forward, but one of the things that I'm kind of really into is that we, yeah, we fixed it, yeah. And one of the things that um, that I would like to really see is that you know uh, we keep all our uh, our administrative um, um, uh, keeping um, all of admin together somewhere. Um, I know that you know at times you know it's it's hard for people to be going from one place to the other. And you know, confusing, confusing and stuff. So I, you know, if there's anything that can help us to keep the administration together, that would be second. Um, um, and then uh, I know there's an existing admin building, and uh, there's another, uh, maybe another admin building. I know uh, a, a statement was just made earlier, but you know, I think it's so important that we keep um, administration together somehow. So that's the only comment that I have to make. And I, Chair Ryan, I saw you pop up, or former I'm not Chair, sure. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that forever. So, um, Supervisor Ryan, I saw you popping up. He, he who used to be, I need to develop a symbol. He who used to be gone, you know. That's better than he who cannot be named. Uh, yeah, I, I almost went there. No, no, can't do that. Do the Prince thing instead, you know. <laughs> All right, um, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot for everybody, uh, for what we have. And, you know, it's important uh, for all of us to get grounded on, you know, what assumptions we're making. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, for the presentation and the direction that was sought associated with it, uh, you know, uh, it's really interesting. I like, uh, I like aspects associated with it. Um, uh, you know, the real challenge that we're going through, and, and as you're noting, we're adapting as we fly because our world just got turned over. And what is our new world? And so we are trying to adapt and, and put the new uh, template together uh, for what that is. I'm not sure if we've fully achieved understanding uh, what that is, uh, but, but I'm also curious. There are a lot of assumptions uh, that are made associated with this uh, uh, behavior modifications, what they are, uh, uh, adaptability of space, uh, uh, what they are. So, you know, the devil's in the detail associated with it, while we're also in a state of flux as, uh, as we navigate through COVID and maybe start to maybe get a Spanish flu thing or a flu behavior. Uh, that society starts to return 
And so we'll have a modification of our norm again. So um, while we're doing this, and I really appreciate it. I also uh, want to approach it cautiously. And, and then, you know, it, it does become uh, a question. It's really important that we see all phases uh, of the presentation so that we can see the cause and effect. Uh, you know, there were assumptions made associated with uh, downtown and it wasn't just parking associated with it. It was cost of space uh, associated with that. Uh, but uh, another piece that we went out on tours uh, and we took a look at communities uh, and where services were provided knowing that the populations were there. You don't put down the template of the county and assume everybody's gonna go there. Uh, you know, some of the models we looked at was, you put it down where the services are needed uh, and uh, access to them and, and it provided a better model. But that also was pre-COVID. Uh, so uh, there are those pieces, uh, you know, cost for land around here. Uh, <laughs> and well, look at cost for housing. It's an indicator of what's going on uh, associated with that. Um, you know, another element, you know, part of the question was, uh, and, and I think, you know, uh, that cost of uh, supply, uh, you know, and I'm making the assumption, you know, it was back in December, uh, as, as Hans noted, uh, and really appreciate that. Um, you know, we're listening to different jurisdictions, depending upon which committees we sit on and what's going on, of uh, at minimum 10% uh, that people are hitting uh, associated with their bids and what they're trying to do. Uh, so our buying power, uh, we also are wanting to be careful with. Uh, another outlay, that $25 million, well, we put together a financial piece, but we're not going to see that until later on. And what are the implications associated with that uh, $25 million that we put together? So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to mine into the details too much because we need to see the picture as it develops. But then we're going to, you know, that time that you were noting, uh, uh, Patrice, Madam Chair, uh, in terms of um, discussion, as we get through these and we see the cause and effect and what's going on, it gives us a better opportunity to see, okay, so what does that mean associated with recommendations and how are we considering um our, our state of flux, where we are as, as a, a, a community uh, on it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to surprise those that have been a part of this. I, I still question uh, our direction associated with uh, um, the land-based services. Uh, a lot of what we had seen was, you know, again, similar to bring it to where the people are versus, uh, you know, do we fit it? And no, I'll not surprise you with this, the Polygon also uh, on that. Um, uh, for what you've done and those services together with those uh, that are there, uh, looks like you know a lot of preliminary work, but, but they are, are pieces uh, associated with the assumptions that you know, it'd be better to see what you work through, how that uh, fits. And then, you know, obviously you're talking about the virtual world uh, uh, in your analysis as well as what you're, you're presenting, Sue, for adaptability of our workforce uh, uh, for that. It, it, is, um, it is a new world, but uh, I, I'm still pausing uh, of what is our new world uh, with that. Um, so, um, I know a lot led up to this. <laughs> well said. So, and, and, and I think there's a lot more discussion that, of course, we need to make. And that's why I was thinking a good half a day, two hours is certainly not enough, a good half a day on, a, on, on reviewing this. It's a great overview. And, you know, I, I especially given the way we look at the workplace nowadays, uh, and, uh, you know, I can see the King Street remodel needs to get done on so many levels. Um, I have some real concern about putting in a uh, 30,000 plus office building in King Street 
when we have our own downtown area and downtown campus. So I think those are all questions we really need to look at, take a look at how much land we've got, what, what's the cost analysis. And, um, uh, you know, it's, I'm sure it's frustrating because you probably were on a path in 2019. And since 2019, the world as we've known it has, has, has uh, totally changed. And so I, I think we need to put all of that in perspective when we are looking forward to it. And I, and I think we don't have to do all or nothing. In other words, I, I do think that we could look at a King Street remodel uh, concept, which I think uh, Sue, it's got good bones, but you're right. It's kind of a, a a difficult building for the reasons you've indicated, much less much like our sweet administrative building where where we all have our offices. And so all of those are things I, I think we need to add to the picture and really look at it and look at what our needs really are at this point. Um, and how can we best serve those needs? And, and I know we're going to be hearing from uh, the, the courts and from the county attorneys and and from others who, who also have very strong beliefs uh, on what our needs are too. So, but th this is an excellent overview. And, um, and I would love to sometime, you know, take a, a, a walk down memory lane or at least a walk down the area, uh, probably with you, Sue, and you could kind of point out, or you, Tom, and you could kind of point out, you know, where these buildings are aligned on the property down there at King Street. That'd be helpful to me, so. Happy to do it. And Sue, I, you have your hand up. Madam Chair, if you just, if you don't mind, I just want to add one last detail, and I know Tom would echo this, and that is the work that we've, that Hans and, and Megan have completed and that we've done for this project, we were very much aware when we got in the heart of the project and the pandemic really got going, that we didn't know where we were going with the pandemic, and we were not sure, and that we needed to, to get information um, and that we needed that information to last to some degree. So what, you know, Hans and Megan did a great job coming up with these options, but they also did a superb job in really programming each department separately so we would have that information for posterity and we could use in any way we needed to. That's why we did program uh, the Board of Supervisors, we programmed the County Manager's Office with the Board of Supervisors uh, to Supervisor Begay's point. Um, so we would have that information too, because we weren't sure as we went into this project what we didn't know. We had no idea of the parameters of the future with the pandemic going on. So we felt like it was better to have the information. We knew we didn't have sufficient space for adult probation in their previous location. So that's why we also programmed them programming we did with everyone, Health and Human Services, uh, Assessor, Treasurer, Recorder, Community Development, Board of Supervisors, County Manager, Emergency Management, um, and uh, I will also say finance was included in that, I believe as well. Um, I need to double check that one, sorry. Um, but we did it, we did, we chose all those groups for a very specific reason, is they, we knew that they had space need or space challenges that were significant. And so we wanted to get that programming information so we could use it for the future, whether it was in the King Street project or some other projects to come. Um, we wanted the info because it makes us fleeter in, in you know, doing that conception for projects and uh, working through what our opportunities are. So all of it is excellent work that carries forward and is not, um, is not useless in any way, shape or form. Thank you. Absolutely. And Supervisor Ryan. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair. And that's, that, you know, that was the final piece I was going to ask about was just seeing, you know, as you noted, that you had that information and those assumptions that are out there. It's a lot of detail. It sounds like a, uh, a lot of reading that we'll probably need guidance on. Uh, but uh, by the same token, you know, that would it'd be really good to, to be able to uh, uh, process that. And we can do that. We um, we had to at the time. Um, it was an election year, of course, um, and there wasn't a lot of extra time in 2020 when we did a lot of the programming of the board. Um, and we had to base a lot of that on our experience and working with the board in the admin building um, and with the county manager's office and working with the county. If you if we do nothing else, facilities 
management does know the space pretty darn well. And so we were able to use a lot of that in terms of speculating on what uh, a different boardroom should look like, uh, what executive session uh, conference rooms should look like and what amenities they should have. Um, that's part of what facilities management does on the everyday is figure those things out. So we were able to um, really brainstorm and also DLR brought with it extensive experience on the way that other counties work. Um, and that helped a lot to also understand the service-based model and that we have in every one of our departments and how that translates, that service translates into the need for space. Now we just have to figure out where that virtual component comes in. And we're not quite finished with that, I don't think as a culture yet, um, but I think the combination of what we know from our programming and then what we've learned and continue to learn today from the pandemic, somewhere at the end of that is, is like the sweet spot of, of our answers of what we need to do um, across the board. Yeah, and get real numbers, uh, you know, plugged in on, you know, who, how many people do they have in the department? How many are working for home? How many are there? What does it look like in terms of customer service? And, you know, really take yeah. a look at Absolutely. And that was the other point, too, is, is that it's a, it's a bold person who goes out for a, a rough order of magnitude right now because it's a it's got a sticker shock right now. And uh, it's difficult to even get to, to get the interest in it because it's such a busy, busy contracting is extraordinarily busy right now. Design is busy. Um, but um, I appreciate the work the DLR did to put this all together. It was not an easy no, absolutely excellent excellent information and and obviously this is um, hundreds maybe thousands of hours of work that has gone into this and that's very apparent and really really appreciate the information and the time uh, it's so important for us to have this type of information and background for us to make good decisions for our community so thank you so much any, any other questions any other comments Right. Well, it was wonderful to meet you, um, Megan and Hans. Uh, this is the um, uh, it, virtually. I'm sorry that it's still virtual, but this again may be our new reality. So it's great to meet you both, and thank you for your service to the county and working so closely with our staff. And uh, you know, Sue and Tom, as always, you you make it understandable. And thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We appreciate you allowing us to work with you. It's been great. Uh, you know, I will say that Megan and I have built some great relationships with Coconino County over the past two plus years. So uh, I can't wait for it to continue on. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Um, County Manager. I'm probably the only per person here who really likes the admin building. I know it drives people crazy. But I also like the 60s and 70s edition of the old courthouse. But again, that's just <laughs> so, uh, Madam Chair, it might be a good time to take a short break uh, so we can convene at around three o'clock. So uh, for the next item, but again, that's your call with the board, please. Excellent. What great advice. Thank you all. We have 10 minutes and we'll be back at three. Uh, thank you so much. 10 minutes. You're on. Wow. You're planning ahead. You're doing great, Madam Chair. And I want the orange cap carpet back, Steve. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna muzzle you. We're gonna actually meet you. <laughs> See you soon.
Siri, are you okay out there? I see your hand. I'm trying to promote you, but you need to accept the promotion. Thanks, Lindsay. I had it on the wrong screen and didn't see the request. <laughs> Thanks, Siri. Hey, Lindsay. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I'll share my slides on my end. Okay. Okay. Steve, it looks like I've got Janet, Rose, Scott, Siri, Kristen, and Erica and Kim all on as passes. Let me see if there's anyone else. Okay. Well, Kristen, is it Kristen Curtis? Yes. Okay. Kristen, if you can accept the promotion, that'll bring you over. There we go. Great. All right. Steve, I, I, it's 3.02 and do we have everybody we need? And I, it looks like uh, Judy is with us and Matt is with us and um, Geronimo um, is Geron, there he is. <laughs> uh, our vice chair is with us. And so do we have everyone from uh, the county who's presenting on the ARPA discussion? Um, yes, we. Yes, we do, Madam Chair. Let me just tee up my slide here. So we are ready to go whenever you are. I can go ahead and share my screen. Absolutely, and uh, County Manager, please take it away. Okay. Uh, let me get to the slide show. Are you able to see the title slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, county staff, uh, we're here today to discuss the ARPA process for allocation of funds um, to the community through grant partner through procurement partners. And so uh, I know we've had several discussions and the process has taken a little longer than we anticipated, but I'm going to go to my next slide to give a little bit of background on this. So. So one of the things, and I, I don't wanna take any information from the county attorney's office, but I think I can provide just a snapshot or a thumbnail uh, process step here. So the guidelines for, for our um, putting the ARPA funds into, into play, into service, if you will, of course, begins with what the federal guidelines allow us. And so the requirements and guidelines have been developed by the US Treasury, Department of Treasury, 
uh, as a result of the Congressional Act that enabled American Rescue Plan. And then from there, the, uh, then the, the authority switches then over to what we as a county can do. And so our statutory authority is, is derived from, from Title 11, uh, Arizona Rights Statutes, uh, and that focuses on what counties do. I also want to add a, a couple of the footnotes to this. We also have, of course, when we look at comparisons, the city of Flagstaff also received funding through the American Rescue Plan. They are guided under a different title. So they're, they're guided under Title IX of the Arizona Revised Statutes. And I wanted to just provide this, this bit of a thumbnail sketch because as a political subdivision of the state, uh, you know, we, we, we do what we are allowed to do by statute. And so the enabling statute it provides the authority for us to act in certain areas is, is, is totally governed by, by statute. Um, cities under Title IX, uh, there is some flexible, additional flexibility if, if, a, if, a, if a city is chartered. So there's a couple of different levels, but not to get too far into weeds there. That's the differences, and I think you'll see some sometimes locally when, when we see certain things happen at the local government level that are similar in some ways, they're administered very differently, and so that's an important part. The other distinction when we look at the process that we're going to outline to you today is that we're looking at this from the standpoint of the county is procuring services from the public. And I want to differentiate that from grants. And, and I think when we look at how, you know, having been you know, associated with nonprofits and many of us have been for a number of years, uh, we look at grants as, as, as a very important and commonly used a term in the nonprofit world, grants. Uh, in this case, however, our, our, the county, in this case, Coconino County, is procuring, uh, not granting. And that's an important distinction because because uh, our, our enabling statute provides us the opportunity and the authority to procure services, not to issue grants. And so that's another, another distinction to make. Um, the other thing that I want to uh, put out as part of our introduction here is that when I came and the staff came to you several weeks ago, if not months ago, to talk about the American Rescue Plan, one of the recommendations I made at that time was for Coconino County to uh, contract uh, or uh, contract out the management of this process to a third party. Uh, since then, uh, you know, we've learned again through our uh, review of our statutory authority that the county is not able to delegate uh, that process out. And so because of that, uh, what we are presenting to you today uh, will be a process that will be entirely staff uh, driven, staff managed um, um, at this point in time. So again, for that reason, we're not contracting any portion out. You know, we will be engaging individuals to help uh, staff uh, this and I'll, I'll introduce you to that person in a moment. But again, we're, we're, we're not doing the contracting out of this process. So again, those are two important parts to, to, the, to the information we're, we're gonna be presenting to you today. So any questions so far before I go to my next slide on board? So a little bit of background, and I've asked, I've asked Siri Mullaney to, to help um, um, walk us through this slide because this provides a little background, good, good information background in terms of the allocation and what the, pro, and what the county has done uh, to put these, uh, these funds into service to the community. So Siri. Uh, thank you, County Manager Pru and Chair Horseman, and members of the board. So just as a reminder, we did receive an allocation of $27.8 million. Of that, we have received our what they refer to as our first tranche. So they actually sent us the cash in advance of the first half, and then we will um, be receiving the second half here in the next in the next upcoming year. And so we have uh, that available to, to spend in accordance with the guidelines. And we've been before the board a few times um, to talk about eligible uses and allocate those funds. So the first part is that first bullet of 13.6 million, which has gone towards ARPA eligible programs administered by the county. Um, certainly many of those are uh, public programs, similar to what we're talking about with community projects, but they are programs that are in alignment with some of the services we already provide. Uh, for example, support to our health or our HHS division,
provision um, for, for COVID relief costs and mental health programs and uh, funds to address the criminal justice backlog or that caseload relief that we talk about in the criminal justice system. The second bullet is revenue loss. So the 9.2 million was what we had originally calculated as one year of lost revenue for the county. Um, and it was eligible under the interim rules under a calculation formula. Subsequent rules have allowed us to capture up to $10 million if we choose for revenue loss. Um, but at the time we, we had recommended the full amount of 9.2 that we were calculating at the time. And that has been allocated towards projects, um, one-time project needs within the county as well well, um, things that may not have been eligible under some other allowance of the ARPA Act, but things that um, were needs that the county has, for example, improved ventilation in some of our buildings um, and to help with the technology aspect of the pandemic and really bringing our services available to the public in a remote format. So that's what the 9.2 represents. And where we are today then is still the unallocated $5 million for uh, community projects and partnerships. Thank you, Siri. Uh, footnote on the five million um, from previous board direction, up to two million dollars uh, has been um, has been uh, reserved, if you will, within the five million for mental health, behavioral health uh, related programs. So, so again, those that's just a snapshot of the expenditures in which we've programmed in up to the five million dollar amount. Um, so, Madam Chair, I'll go to the next slide. So again, this graphic, again, it's a good graphic that shows that the investments that we've uh, chosen and programmed into the mental behavioral health nexus really uh, runs the gamut of health and human services uh, programs, the schools, superintendent schools programs are included, uh, community and clinical service providers, again, through HHS. We've also, of course, invested in the criminal justice program, a, a caseload, a backup that was brought to us by the courts uh, and the court, uh, uh, the court's request uh, for us to consider uh, programming funds in this area. Originally, the uh, rule interim rule from Treasury did not include uh, the criminal justice connection. Uh, we lobbied um, uh, Treasury uh, through the National Association of Counties and our and our local federal uh, advocates, uh, uh, Bob Holmes and Anna Ma to have this included. And as a result of Coconino County lobbying Treasury, um, our ability to invest in the COVID backlog uh, in, the, in our court system was granted. And so that's a really important distinction. Because again, originally it was not included, uh, but knowing the, the, the backlog that was brought to us by the CJ system, we did um, move on that. And as a result, as I said, that's been worked on. Uh, community and social, social and community context. Again, some of the work, programs we're, we're working on today will we in the gamut. Economic stability programs, especially when you look at uh, some of the business supports uh, will be included in this, in this uh, area. And then finally, addiction, substance, misuse, trauma, resilience. And uh, with that, some of the funding will be used to invest heavily in, in um, our, our community, especially as it relates to deflection, diversion programs, or we're looking at uh, that also in the juvenile uh, uh, court area, uh, where we're looking at deflection programs and, 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 and alternatives uh, to, to, to other, other types of paths in that area. So again, uh, the point being here is that we, we've looked at the community very broadly. Uh, you know, mental health, behavioral health of youth is very important. Our superintendent of schools and others have brought this to our attention. We all know that just being uh, parents and, and those that live in the community and, and, and have, um, you know, uh, our eyes on the community. So we know that. And, and so we have a, a, at the board's direction and with your approval, as I said, have invested heavily into the community. Uh, the community is wide, community is countywide. And so looking at how we program in, in every area that we can, uh, it was going to be important. And so when we get to the next part about um, when we look at procuring, an important distinction on that is going to be how we make this and how, how we make this available and known to the entire county that we are doing this. Uh, you know, being that Flagstaff and the, the population is in Flagstaff, we tend to see the concentration of partners in Flagstaff, but we will be making an extra 10 times effort to get the word out countywide on the availability of, this, of these funds. So with that, Madam Chair, 
So this is kind of the one pager on the process. And so let me just walk through it. Of course, we receive, uh, we receive this brought to us from, from uh, American Rescue Plan that was approved congressionally. From that, and based on input from the board and other sources, we've identified uh, categories and probably easier to talk to them as categories. So housing is a category, education, support for vulnerable populations, business support, behavioral health, COVID impacts and workforce development. These are the categories that we have identified based on conversations and input from the board uh, as, as categories across, the, you know, across that ARP area. So this is an important, you know, important part to, 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 to consider here is, are the categories. From there in this red circle here, we will need to identify specific services that we will be procuring through a formal procurement process. And again, I wanna emphasize the word procurement, formal procurement process. However, in order to inform us, the county, and you as the governing board, on what services might those be, we will be issuing a request for information in each of these categories. So the request for information, we're working with, with, uh, with finance and, and Scott Richardson up in, up in purchasing to identify um, how that is gonna be structured. It is not a, it is not a, 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 a very complicated um, step in the process. It, it is just that. We are, we are asking the community as well as providers in the community to let us know based on their experience, their work, uh, the work of their organizations, as well as the work and the observations from, from the general public, what are some of the things that we should be considering in each of these categories as it relates to specific services to consider to procure? So again, that will be the request for information. This is where, as I said, we want to make sure that the entire county, to the best of our ability, knows about the availability of their bill, of their opportunity to let us know. And it's not a formal needs assessment because that, that, that is another process that probably has another numerous steps to that. But we're just wanting to hear from the public as well as the provider community, not only the provider community in Flagstaff, but provider community countywide on what these services are uh, in their community or their areas that the county should consider. So again, in each of these categories across this, this line here, uh, is what we're going to be seeking information for, as we as I indicated. <clears throat> then from there, we will be receiving probably numerous inputs on each of these category areas. Um, and from there, we will then be looking at <clears throat> a process of identifying through ranking and prioritization with, with full board input, what those services would be in each of those categories. And then from there, Based on those services that we've been that, that have been that have been identified in each of those categories, an RFP will be issued. And again, so we're differentiating from an RFI or request for information to request for a proposal. The county is then procuring the services that have been that have been that have been identified in each of the category areas. So I'm going to stop there a moment to see if there are any questions, Madam Chair, before I go on to the next steps. Any questions or comments from the from the board members? Um, doesn't look like it. And, and Steve, I, I think that if, if you and correct me now if I'm wrong, but the the uh, request for information, as you and I want to just underscore what you had said, is part of a procurement process wherein we can hear from members of our community of our nonprofits about what kind of services that are out there that can be offered through that nonprofit based on the priority categories that we have identified. Is, is that a good way to say that? Yes, Madam Chair, that is, that is, that's exactly what it is. Thank so you. the procurement is a, it's a formal procurement process and let me back up. So when we do issue the RFI, we will, we will, you know, build into that timeline adequate time. Um, I'm going to say, three weeks, approximately three weeks for that, for it to be out 
out on the streets per se. And that provides the opportunity for, for individuals and, and organizations to respond to that RFI. And then from there, as I said, we'll go to the process of ranking and prioritizing with board input on what those services would be in each of those categories. And then the RFP would be issued again with that building in more time for it to be on the streets per se, probably at least three weeks, if not more, so that prospective proposers can then come and submit an, a, a proposal. Now, a process step here, if someone does not request an RFI, that does not preclude, preclude them from submitting an RFP. So you do not have to go through the RFI process in order to, 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 to participate in the RF, RFP process. And, that, and, that, and that's just an important process step. Um, the RFP process, of course, will be uh, uh, put together so that uh, a framework for, of an application, if you will, or proposal will be submitted, just like we do. The county uh, and, and Scott upstairs participates and he manages you know, numerous procurements during the year. We're adding a few more to his, to his list. But again, uh, based on, on, the, on the proposal format, then the proposers would be following that and, and filling out what we're asking them to fill out uh, that would allow us the opportunity based on that input to make a determination of, of who these successful awards would be. Again, from there, the staff review and recommendations for board, board approval would happen. And then the RFP, the final award would take place. Now, this is where it gets, you know, this next step is really important. So when we go through the process of the RFI and we receive feedback back from the, from the provider community and others in the community, and we're gonna to go to a procurement process, then the county will need to determine, and it certainly is something we want to determine, is this something that uh, a service that the, the general community, the provider community can provide, or is this a service that the county chooses to provide on their own, or is this an IGA meaning that can we establish a, re a relationship, but basically an IGA relationship, which of course is the agreement that governments have with each other. So, so public agencies, which mean other, other uh, municipalities, towns, we're talking other uh, uh, taxing districts, uh, fire districts could be in this library district. So, so this, would, this is where the IGA would take place. And that would be the vehicle by which that relationship would be formalized is through the IGA. Uh, again, it would, could also be an RFP. So the pro a proposer, depending on what that is, could be a successful proposer of that service. And then we would enter into that process of negotiating the final agreement at the award there. Or is it a service that the county would choose to provide on their own? Um, and again, I, I, I don't wanna to comment too much more on that because this is a formal proposal. This is a formal procurement process. And so this is an important part that, that we're not making comments that would, that would tend to imply that, 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 a, that a particular service would be eligible for one or the other. So again, we're, we, we need to be very, uh, very careful about how we discuss proposals because this is, an, this is a procurement process. The other point I wanna make here is that many of us and some on this on the Zoom um, have, have been, have participated in similar processes through our nonprofit partners. Uh, and you'll know that many of us have been volunteers in reviewing proposals, um, in providing input uh, with some of our nonprofit partners who are in the grant or the grant management um, realm or, 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 or space. And, and you'll know that it takes a lot of individuals in order to get this work done. So we're talking, you know, in, in, again, in our experiences, anywhere from you know, 40 to 60 volunteers that help review proposals. Uh, we're, not pro we're not proposing that here. Uh, we have uh, staff uh, that cover, I believe, all of the categories above and that we feel that we have that, that uh, skill set to be able to review and to provide a turnaround on the proposals that we do receive. Uh, it's a big lift. Uh, because again, depending on the number of proposals we receive, 
uh, you know, our staff will be looking at uh, a lot of different proposals and then going through a rubric and identifying, okay, what, what are the elements of the proposal that elevates that proposal uh, to be considered? And so again, it's a process that we're embarking on uh, to go through the procurement here. So again, and then uh, a couple of notes at the bottom, you know, specific services must be identified to be procured. And so it has to be, of course, within a category. Uh, so you take any category above, uh, the, specific, the program has to be specific. It has to be, uh, of course, uh, measurable, uh, outcome-based, results-oriented, uh, because in essence, we're procuring that service from, from, a, a, uh, uh, from, a worthy, from a worthy community partner. And then the services that are provided or, or considered must be within the legal authority of the county to provide uh, if we were to choose to do it on our own. So again, uh, all the services that we do receive feedback on, uh, we'll need to make sure that the county has the authority uh, to, uh, to um, participate in a procurement that would deliver that service. And, and that's another important distinction because um, not everything that um, that may fall in any, any of the categories above may be something that the county can legally do as, as, a, as a matter of, of our statutory uh, scope. Um, I'm going to stop there, Madam Chair. I'm sure the board has some comments or some ideas or some questions that I can. And then also with us today, we have the staff team, uh, several individuals here that you see on the, on the panelist uh, group. Uh, uh, Siri Mullaney, Scott Richardson, uh, Kristen uh, Curtis. Uh, we have Erica Shaw, Kim Musselman, um, uh, Sue Brown, um, Cinda Andriani, uh, and I'm missing somebody. If I am, I'm sorry. Janet. Janet. Oh, hey, Janet. And oh, and then someone that you you know well. So I've invited uh, Janet Regner to help uh, join us uh, on a consultant basis to help us manage some of the process. And so, you know, Janet, she is formerly our, our community services director, uh, formerly uh, director of the Arizona Community Action Association, well-versed in social services and grant programs, uh, and also uh, just a, a very close friend and ally of Coconino County. So Madam Chair, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna keep sharing the, the screen here because I think that's an important reference point. Good, and, and I know there's probably some other board members that would like to, to speak um, on this. I will underscore again that we were as a county hoping that we could set this as a grant process. And if we were legally allowed to do that, we were hoping that uh, we could even possibly as a board uh, consider the possibility of looking to outside uh, third party uh, grant um, uh, providers, if you will, that could do some of the background and analysis for a grant award. Um, because the county attorney's office has indicated that that is outside the scope of our abilities as uh, a county, since we are not uh, a city and we are held in strict compliance with statutes. Uh, since that is the case, we must do a procurement process. And thank you, County Manager, you did an excellent job of going through uh, the process in, a, in a, a very potentially complicated and you did it in a very straightforward manner. So I appreciate that and, uh, and appreciate uh, the fact that we have two procurement methods one is through the RFI and then from there going out for an RFP for actual services or the possibility of IGAs, intergovernmental agreements with governmental partners such as the city of Flag, the city of Williams, et cetera, that may be using some of their ARPA money or other funds with regards to some of our priority categories. So, you know, I think you did a good job of taking a lot of confuse, confusion and making it pretty straightforward. And um, hopefully that will help our nonprofits and our community partners that are taking part in, in our conversation this afternoon. Other board members, comments or questions that you might have? Uh, uh, and Madam Chair, I, I, I will, I can go to the next slide if you want, but that is kind of the time frame 
So I can do time frame and come back to to the chart, but um, I, I I see some hands up, uh, county managers. So uh, Supervisor Ryan and then Supervisor Begay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, lot of information. <laughs> question here, question here. Uh, but uh, very good information. And and just uh, you know, I'm, I know some of the answers, some I don't. Uh, but I want to go through a couple, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, so um, for the sake of uh, people that want to use the process and or organizations, uh, um, agencies, et cetera, uh, I guess the, the important piece is, as I understand, there were proposals that people were trying to submit prior to us establishing the process. Uh, and uh, whatever, you know, I haven't seen any of them other than conveying them over when we receive them uh, to staff. Uh, but for the sake of those organizations, um, uh, we needed to establish a process uh, rather than uh, here's what they are proposing. Let's see what our process is. And then they need to match that up to our process and seeing if they achieve the objectives uh, uh, in, in putting in for through an RFP process, et cetera. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Supervisor Ryan, that is correct. So the uh, information that we received from nonprofit partners and other advocates, if you will, over the last few months, uh, um, of course, we've received them, we've logged them, we've acknowledged them. Uh, we did let some of the, uh, as many partners as we could know that we were having the discussion today uh, but at, at the same time, that information was not part of a formal solicitation. And, and so we certainly do want to thank those partners and advocates that, that sent in communication on a number of different uh, areas. And so we thank for that information. But uh, since it was not part, since we did not really know at that time what the process was going to be, uh, uh, it, 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 those, that good work will not be considered uh, as, 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 there's, as a place in the process. So, so based on that, we will be issuing the RFI, then the RFP, uh, then individuals and advocates and non-organizations that want to, to uh, participate would need to then put together uh, the RFI, uh, uh, which would again, is, is not a very built up item. Uh, it's, it's, it's intended to be general because that's what it is. We want information from the community on what are the specific areas that could be considered as a, as a, as a potentially procurable service. Uh, so they would, need, they would be participating there and they would then, or not and, and they would then need to also participate through the RFP process where we would have a set application proposal format to follow that asks them, the pro potential proposers, to respond to a number of different um, categories or questions that, again, we would be using to base uh, uh, an award, a potential award on. Hopefully. So, so along that line, being an RFP process, um, board communication uh, does not happen during an RFP process to allow for equal opportunity for applicants to submit their, their applications, correct? That is true. So uh, when the RFPs, um, Actually, when the RFIs are sent out, uh, that is that becomes it's a, it it becomes it's the start of a formal process uh, where uh, communication to to potential proposers is is limited and if not restricted. Uh, there's we cannot do anything that would in any way um, uh, uh, advantage someone over anyone else. Again, it's a competitive process, and so it needs to be absolutely. Uh, uh, objective. And so again, any communication uh, from board as well as staff would be, uh, would be uh, forbidden, if not limited. Any questions that would come uh, from a proposer would come to our purchasing director, uh, Scott Richardson, as he's, he's uh, served in that role um, for many years. And, and that was one of my next questions, but just to, uh, to uh, uh, provide that opportunity. There, there's a limited scope uh, in which uh, Scott can answer questions, but uh, those that are trying to find out process, uh, that, that would be the procedure that's the go-to for that kind of opportunity. 
Yes, sir. And um, Madam Chair, Scott is on the panelist. Um, if you would like him to respond or if you felt that. Um, uh, you know, I think it will happen later on, Madam Chair, but it would be nice, you know, for just people to understand. I, yes. In fact, I was actually going to ask our our, count, our uh, Deputy County Attorney Rose Winkler to, to explain sure. what the legal ramifications would be in terms of uh, starting the procurement process and the important guidelines. But I guess uh, Supervisor Ryan, I think you summarized it. And so unless she has anything further to say about that, uh, and then I think we can take a look from uh, Scott, uh, see if Scott Richardson has anything further to say. No, Madam Chair, I, you know, I would agree. It'd be good to hear from Rose and, and also Scott. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon, Chair Horseman and, and members of the board. Um, so I, I, and I, I'll kind of go generally, but certainly if there are specific questions, I can address those. But as a county manager who has uh, put forth, um, you know, the ideas to, to uh, issue the request for information and collect um, responses from that, um, and, and maintain that is obviously a completely separate process from the request for proposals that would come later. Uh, you know, the RFI is the opportunity for the county to learn uh, from members of the community um, across the county what services are necessary. Um, and certainly the county will have to take those responses uh, and review them and consider them and, and determine what is within the county's authority. Uh, and finding what's in the county's authority, then determine what is the, you know, one prioritize certainly those services that have been suggested, but then also determine what is the best way if, if those services are a priority, um, how, to, how to then provide them, uh, as the county manager has explained. Um, and then as I believe uh, uh, you were addressing just uh, at that last moment before you um, uh, referred to me, uh, you know, there is the, that as that RFI process is, is going on and, and certainly as the RFP process is going on, um, the ideal um, communication arrangement is certainly for uh, communications questions and so forth to go through um, Scott uh, Richardson as our purchasing manager um, and to just maintain um, the integrity of the process and uh, you know, ensure that staff can address questions um, as, as they are you know, the experts on the process and, um, and, and then that way staff, you know, when it's ready, uh, can certainly bring uh, matters to the board that the board then uh, will provide its input on. Um, so if there's something more specific, please let me know. And, and, or if there's something I missed, um, I'm happy to address that. I think it was maintaining the, uh, that, that since we are now as a board going to be um, basically approving a procurement process, it's very in, uh, or a procurement award, I should say, it's very important that we maintain our independence and impartiality on uh, the uh, RFPs that come before us. And so in order to do that, you would recommend, I assume that we not engage in communications discussions um, with the uh, providers, would you agree? Yes, yes. Thank you, Chair Horseman, for 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 nailing that down and and really to think of this as we do any of our other requests for um, proposals. Uh, you know, any other time that the county has issued those to to seek out services. Um, again, there is a system and a process by which staff uh, analyze the the proposals that come in. And that needs to be maintained at the staff level, um, you know, rather than any communications going through individual board members. Um, you know, staff staff will handle that just as they have all, all prior RFPs um, and uh, measure those uh, proposals in an objective manner so that they can then make recommendations to the board. Um, but certainly the board should avoid communications with anyone um, uh, responding to the RFPs. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate that, Rose. So, and Scott, do you have anything to add for uh, um, uh, what the process that's been outlined? Good afternoon, Chair Horseman and members of the board. Um, Rose really was quite eloquent with all the components for it. Um, as she mentioned, it is um, very standard that 
vendors do not contact pretty much the second floor during an open solicitation so that, as you said, you can remain independent <clears throat> when the recommendation for award comes in. Um, this one being very different from everything else, however, that standard still is in place. So we would ask, you know, if you guys do get any communications, please do have them contact me. Um, we don't want them to be, uh, their proposal to have any diminished effect on it by contacting somebody out of line. So in order to protect the, the vendors, the nonprofits, um, anyone who might propose, um, please be sure that if you do get those communications, they get forwarded. Other than that, Rose really hit it all. And, and Madam Chair, I will note that Scott Richardson is a, is a, is a team of one. <laughs> one purchasing person in the entire county. And so when we looked at this and we started walking down the procurement path, uh, it was a couple of times I had to reassure him that we love you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> we really do. So again, but again, when you look at the amount of, 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 of attention, this is an important process. And so looking at the, the, uh, our experiences and in, in, in working with some of our nonprofit partners and doing this similar kind of work, it, it truly does take a lot of staff time and it's good staff time. It's, it's certainly good. And so we'll be working with Scott to create the, 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 uh, the evaluation, the scoring, all of those pieces need to be put together so that when the award does come to the board, it has gone through that process in which it's been scored, it's been evaluated, it's been reviewed. Uh, and, but more importantly, that it has been deemed a, a service that the county can legally provide. And so that's an important distinction. I also wanna make another note on the, on the, on the chart here. Uh, the other process is subrecipient. So as a result of us, uh, of the funding coming to us from, from the federal government, uh, we will need to go, uh, responders will need to go through a process if they're chosen uh, to, be, uh, to, to, be deemed, to be deemed eligible as a, as a subrecipient of federal dollars. Uh, and so that process will be included in, in, in that, in the discussion and the application so that proposers know uh, what that means uh, in order for them to participate. Um, and then the other thing, uh, compliance monitoring, uh, we've got uh, uh, a new addition, a uh, relatively new addition to our team, uh, Kristen, who's up in finance. She, she came to us uh, recently and uh, she's responsible for subrecipient and monitoring and reporting. And so it's her good work that rolls up into our uh, re reports back to treasury as required by, by, by ARPA. So Madam Chair, I, know, I think uh, Supervisor Vasquez may have had a question. I think, and that's the, who I was going to next. Hello, Vice Chair. Where am I? I think Judy was before me, so I'll, oh, I'll, and Judy, I'll I missed back you. and let Judy go first. All right, uh, Supervisor Begay. Um, okay. Um, I, I'm kind of a little um, confused here. Um, I'm trying to follow up um, everything here. Um, I'm thinking that um, are there any guidelines that have set precedents for any kind of procurement services that the county has already done? Um, that's one. The other thing is that um, I know that these um, procurement or RFPs or procurement services that we're having, I know that it takes a lot of work at times. And so are we gonna be given any kind of services that will not be allowed. Um, and we don't want to be telling people that ears that qualify after they put all these and they put their hopes up too high, stuff like that. So the other thing is up here is this housing, education, we're supporting all this and that. Um, and then and then to me, I was thinking, well, maybe it is um, that um, where we or anybody that wants to, uh, nonprofits that can come by that get, can we, um, apply for these uh, funds. And, um, but down here at the end, it says service, services must be those that are within the legal authority and maybe currently or formally provided by the county. So I'm just sitting here thinking, okay, I'm scratching my head and I'm trying to put uh, all the pieces together. So um, 
I, I, I'm just thinking um, in those in, in those lines. So we don't want to make it um, where um, I wouldn't like to see as a board member that you know people are um, the whole about it in the end, you know, or not. So uh, maybe some point along the way we can say these may not be eligible services or specific services that will be considered, you know, just for our information too. So um, those are some of the things that I was kind of thinking um, about sitting here as the conversations are taking place. I think it's good, um, but if there's not, if when we save um, um, ARPA funds and we're staying within the guidelines of, of the funds, and that funding is very vague and then also you know um we do, and then then for authority that has you know uh, along with it um so so i'm just kind of trying to put all the pieces together here um and and it's just kind of um bothering me in some way that i i i maybe i don't understand it you know um in a certain way i don't know but anyway, that and then the request for information would just be a, a person coming in asking them for for this process or procurement process, um, maybe the packet that we're putting together, or you know that that's, that those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm maybe out in the left wall field, but you know I, mm -hmm. I want I want to be set straight here. So um, maybe it's a lot of information overload that I have in my brain now that you know it's just driving me crazy. But that's that's my thoughts here on this whole thing here, but. You know, maybe as we go along, you know, um, things would, you know, come to play. But, you know, there were a lot of good questions and comments that were made by um, um, Matt, Supervisor. What was your last, what was Supervisor Matt Ryan? Okay, Matt Ryan. So, anyway, um, I just want to say, you know, um, those are some of the thoughts that I have. Um, are we respinning the wheel? You know, do we have any guidelines for, for procurement of services? You know, maybe we could, you know, go back and take a look at that, see how. So we're not reinventing anything different. Uh, but I'm pretty sure there were fundings that were given to us way back where we did the same scenarios, you know, the same thing um, happened. So that's the other thing. Um, we don't want to be challenging what that ha happened before, saying that the last time you guys had our request for uh, procurement processes, this was going on, you know, what, what's the difference when you're using the guidelines developed by the federal, uh, the federal, and then also you already have the authority of the county to expend funds, you know, using your, uh, the statutory authority, you know. So those are just some of the things I'm thinking about. Um, maybe as your presentation goes on, that I may be a, uh, better understanding this process and um, how it's going to really pan out. I know this is probably good one of the few that's going to be uh, and of others presentations that might be coming through maybe i'm uh, jumping way ahead at this point in time so th those are things that i was thinking about so thank you madam chair thank you supervisor Begay. and and i don't know would you like a a, a response on that um before we move on to to, to vice chair vasquez or vice chair vasquez uh, is yours related to the questions that Supervisor Begay just asked? Uh, it's more of a statement. I can wait if if Supervisor Begay would like uh, would like a response. No, it, 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 um, no, just just go ahead with the presentation. You know, I I might get my answers of uh, process too. So uh, I did ask a lot, and you know, maybe a bit further down the presentation too, uh, I, that might be elaborated on. All right, Supervisor Begay, then uh, Vice Chair Vasquez. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to say I appreciate the update and the clarification of procurement over grants and, and how important it is to go through the procurement process. So I really appreciated the way you uh, you framed it, Steve. So thank you, or can, uh, Manager Pru. Um, uh, the other piece, though, that... Um, well, I appreciated the piece of, of how the... The vendor, the part that stuck out the most for me, or the mo most important piece of advice from the staff, was from legal counsel about when dealing with these nonprofits, if they approach any of us from the board, to just refer them to to purchasing and, and or procurement. Excuse me. And, and my my as people have approached me during this time, I've always sent them to our county manager. But it sounds like even that's. Uh, sending it to the wrong place, that it needs to go to procurement. And so thank you for that clarification, because I would hate to accidentally uh, 
you know, send someone to to the county manager and then have that action uh, count against them as they were going for this procurement process. So I just really appreciated that clarification because I don't want to make that mistake. Thank you. Good point. I, I'm sorry. This is Scott, and I don't know where the raise my hand thing is. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, Hi, Scott. <laughs> I, um, I, I'm used to Zoom. And not so much. Um, I, I, I would like to emphasize that the, the no contact is when there is a solicitation out on the street. Like if somebody calls when you get off the phone today, we're not in that um, situation right now, today. Um, it, it is um, restricted to when there is a solicitation that's open to the public. So again, Madam Chair, Scott, just to clarify, when we get to the procurement, when we've issued the RFP, that is the solicitation that yes. then regulates the contact. Yes. In this area, we're still providing, and it's a good point because as I think Rose put it very well when she said, there are two different processes happening. One is the RFI. And, and we did at the staff level, Madam Chair and board members, at the staff level, we, we did grapple with this quite a bit in terms of, of, of you know, we, we certainly have, I think, the talent and the skill set to identify services within each of the categories. But again, you know, that is certainly something we have that we have that competency and that expertise in. But at the same time, we also wanted to kind of channel your thoughts to say, well, what is what is the community? You know what does what do providers what do what do individuals, you know, in Page or Williams or you name it or 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 Cameron think about this category? And that's where we really wanted to to provide the opportunity for for full availability of input by the community to say here are services now and and again RFIs can you know the request for information can be provided to us by an individual by an organization. It's just information that helps guide us in making uh, the determination of the services that will in fact be on that list of, of, of the RFPs to, to be issued. So again, it really was defaulting to, we don't, you know, sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And we get that uh, and we wanted to again, have it a very open process. And then, so that's the information part. Then the RFP part is okay, based on, on all we've gotten and it's gonna be, probably be a lot of information uh, we'll be going through a process, and this is where we'll be having uh, Janet and others help us distill information, and and then and then coming back and getting full board uh, input on on those services because ultimately it's it's you know the county but the board of supervisors that that are procuring the services that we're talking about. So it's a kind of a two step process there. Uh, Madam Chair, I can go to the time frame, uh, and then we can kind of uh, just to uh, complete the slides and. and it, provides more information and possibly answer some of the questions Supervisor Begay had. So confirming the framework and the categories that have been recommended and adopted by the board, we're doing that right now. Uh, we're here now, we're going through, we're confirming the, the framework and the categories. The issue request for information, the RFI to obtain input from communities and potential partners on specific services within each category. Proposed services are then ranked and prioritized to determine services which will be procured. So that will take place during the month of March. And then to, we expect a pretty, you know, fairly large amount of RFI information that's gonna be coming our way. And then from there, we will begin uh, looking at the information so that we can begin issuing the RFPs for specific services, uh, which will be procured. And so we're looking at the month of, of May, hopefully by the end of May, the procurements will be out on the streets. Uh, and then receiving proposals back, uh, evaluating, scoring, and ranking. Uh, we're we're looking at, at June, June and July to take this to take this work on, and then recommendations to the board for subrecipient qualifications. The award, the contracting would happen in August. Uh, you know, all of these and beginning award in August, September. All of these, we would like to fast track it as much as possible. But again, depending on the volume of inputs that we receive. Uh, it's going to be important. I think a couple other things to, to, to keep in mind is when we look at the services to consider, 
and the awards uh, that that would follow. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm not gonna say anything more because I, I think what I was gonna say might might actually again I'm trying to keep away from the procurement piece too much, but I, I think when we're looking at the num the types the numbers of, of services to provide uh, uh, in terms of uh, the number of I mean who knows how many services would fall into each category. Mm -hmm. uh, each of those services will, will require an, a, a, an award, grant, contract monitoring. Uh, and so uh, while we do have, I would say, uh, substantial funding, important funding to program into the community, um, you know, we'll be looking at uh, the impact and the effectiveness of those proposals that we do receive as, as part of the, the ranking process. And then performance monitoring will will be continuous, you know, mm -hmm. through, through the obligations through for this money, kind of things we've heard before. All of the funds need to be obligated by the end of December of 2024, and then funds need to be completely spent down by December of 2026. I want to go back to Supervisor Begay's comments, though. So the, the, the process steps, we do have a, an RFP process policy. We have an RFI policy, and so we're not needing to recreate. Uh, anything will be relying on on, on current uh, procurement uh, policies that we do have in place right now. Um, you're, you had a, you raised a good point, Supervisor Begay, about proposals or pr prospective proposers that will go through a process. And and yes, that we will not know until we receive the proposal if that service is appropriate, I don't want to say appropriate, legally, if we can legally provide that service. And, and yes, proposers will need to submit the proposal in order for us to determine if that service that they're proposing can be legally provided through the county. Having said that, though, I think we've all participated in, in, in procurements and, and, and other types of grant awards where the application was so cumbersome. And, 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 and we, we understand that, and we wanna make sure that the application that we put out through the procurement in which proposers will need to propose to will be an efficient application that provides as much information, but does not overburden, if you will, a proposer um, too much. Now, since we are financially, you know, of course, accountable for the funds, we will need to take that you know, and balance that out with, we do need information. We'll need some specific information to, to make the award on. So again, we wanna balance just how much proposers are gonna to need to put into it, but uh, um, not knowing that in the end, if that service that they're proposing will be in fact uh, allowable given our legal parameters. And, and Madam Chair, I believe uh, Sue Brown has her hand up. Sue? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add that the actual procurement itself is competitive. So by that nature, uh, some proposers will be awarded and some will not. Um, so we do understand that and, and it's unfortunate, but um, we are looking also for the best proposal um, into the matrix that we will have for each one of the requests for proposals. Um, so yes, there will be disappointment in the end for some of the proposers. Um, but it will be um, it will be based on what the best uh, proposal is based on the rubric um, for the service that we are are looking to achieve. Um, for the request for information, it will be a, not a strenuous process. It's a really short process, uh, and a request for information simply asks the community to give us their ideas and the information they hold that we may not have. Um, we know from our needs assessments that are fairly constant in health and human services that uh, vulnerable populations that the, the top, I think is it five or six um, issues that we have in our community are mental and behavioral health, poverty, food insecurity, affordable housing, and well-paying jobs. Um, from our assessments that we do continuously through health and human services. But that may, that may not be the end of the story, and nor are those titles specific. So we'll be looking for the community's input into that RFI. Um, and the RFI is not a competition at all. It is simply everyone who has, all of our community members who have information they feel we should know, and specific services, we ask them 
to give us that information. And we will have parameters in that issuance. This is what ARPA allows us to do, and this is what we are statutorily allowed to do. And so we'll be asking the community to give us services that we can actually accomplish with ARPA funding. So just a, some little nuances. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sue. I think that's important information. And, and also, for example, two or more nonprofits could elect to work together to submit uh, a proposal. Uh, and that certainly would definitely be on the on the table and a possibility uh, for some of the smaller, for example, nonprofits uh, to work with some of the other nonprofits and they could add services and add um, um, uh, service provisions to possibly an RFP. So that's a possibility. Um, one thing too, and I know that the county manager talked about monitoring that's gonna be important because we need to not only monitor to make sure that our county money is being used to the highest and best efforts, but it's also gonna be a requirement because the federal government is going to require uh, this monitoring of the county and insurance that the money is being spent by the county for ARPA matters, in fact, are being spent appropriately. And as the county attorney and Rose, you can, underscore has indicated that if in fact um, we do not um, uh, spend our money according to the requirements of the federal government or the requirements of the county and that it's misspent that in fact uh, the federal government could go after Coquino County and after our general fund quite frankly to, as he says claw back the money that was given to us so I think that that's really important as well important for us to understand that in some ways this procurement process, which is a little bit more than what we were looking for. We were hoping to do this as grants, but it provides a certain, uh, 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 it provides us a monitoring, if you will, and a criteria for that monitoring um, because of the whole procurement process itself. So it provides an extra uh, layer, if you will, of, of um, safety for the county on how the money is being spent and being well spent. So, Madam Chair, I think the, the final note on that too is that we do this process every day. Um, we do it in all of our departments almost every day. We either have RFP out, RFPs out or we manage proposals that have been awarded. We manage those contracts. We negotiate contracts at, at every level of our organization every day we're in some form or another of the procurement process. So um, that's a lot. We do it a lot every year. So we're prepared for this. And I, and I um, in some cases, we're actually quite expert at it. Scott is definitely an expert in, in our procurement policy. And each department has its own expertise with its subject matter and service matter. So I hope that is um, a reassurance for uh, Supervisor Begay that uh, unfortunately, we know it too well, <laughs> more than anything. Thank you. Thank you. So any other comments, um, and members of the board, or any questions? Uh, Super, uh, Supervisor Ryan. Yeah, I, uh, I may, Madam Chair. I'm looking at, you know, since priorities are one of the pieces that we're trying to lock down on today, we've seen them. Uh, and by the same token, we're uh, having more explanation associated with the process. And so, you know, one piece that I, you know, I want to put out there uh, kind of as a question, but more as the process continues to develop, uh, moving towards uh, from RFI into RFP would be um, uh, COVID impacts. You know, I think of the uh, fire departments uh, and how they brought them up uh, uh, and yet we're seeking a service. So, you know, how you delineate the, the opportunity to uh, address COVID impacts, uh, uh, you know, begs for, you know, uh, the type of process that, that is set up for that. Uh, uh, we know there are some agencies that can, uh, uh, can be uh, delivery of services associated with businesses that were impacted, uh, but, but the, the IJA uh, component is a, a piece to explore uh, uh, with legal and how we lay that out, you know, what that may be. Uh, one piece of 
this, uh, no matter what, people will be bidding on this, um, you know, for the sake of all the bidders out there. Uh, you know, I want them to show, you, you know, as noted over and over, and you keep emphasizing, Steve, as well as other board members, um, how they will address that, that broader geographic, not just win a bid, and therefore I'll only delineate uh, for this area, but, uh, uh, you know, how, how they capture that geographic so that uh, we get candidates in there that are truly attempting to do that uh, would be a, a key piece with that. Uh, about three more quick comments. One would be on the mental health. Uh, there might be creative solutions set up for the RFI and, and requests uh, that could be considered. Uh, but part of the intent was also knowing that internally we're working on mental health within the system where we need services uh, outside the system associated with mental health. So, you know, for that, uh, you know, a consideration of how that might be delineated uh, uh, to, to under, you know, provide understanding associated with that. Two more comments. One is admin uh, that we uh, attempt to uh, capture costs uh, so that we can staff this. You know, that's, uh, you know, it's usually built in federal processes. Uh, and I think that that's a key uh, component. And then uh, housing, you know, my perception of housing goes uh, broader than uh, you just uh, provide uh, affordable housing through a particular model. Uh, we, we, uh, we just got hit by COVID. Uh, the cost of housing for our entire workforce uh, has been impacted one way or other whether it's our cost of housing or what people went through uh, with COVID. So, you know, I, I put a broader definition associated with that. And I hope uh, at least that could be explored. Uh, and, and so otherwise, you know, as far as the categories, we tried as best we can to, to be comprehensive, but fit within our own boundaries. And that's what I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. And that's a good point, uh, uh, Supervisor Ryan. Uh, and, you know, I think that the, the, through the RFI process, I think it's going to be able to use that to identify um, areas and categories that, in fact, do meet the criteria that we as a county can enter into procurement for services on. And um, I think that's what the whole process is, is going to allow. What, what, um, I'm sorry, there was one piece on this. So on the RFI uh, and on the procurement, you know, uh, it's an encouragement of uh, proactive attempts to do outreach so that people are aware of what we're putting forward. And I'm assuming that there will be, in fact, a, a good outreach and good communication, marketing, if you will, to market what we're doing uh, to get the word out to all parts of Coconino County and all parts in our community. Definitely, Madam Chair, members of the board, that's going to be the key to us uh, engaging countywide is the, um, you know, we do have, in terms of the statutory responsibilities and advertising RFPs and RFIs, but we're, we'll be going like, you know, 10 times greater than that just to get the word out countywide, so. Um, you're muted. So, Madam Chair, if I could. I'm sorry, Scott, take, you've got your. Yeah. Hand up and uh, uh, feel free. Um, hi. Um, uh, uh, as far as the the marketing, the outreach goes, um, this is where I, I may look for some assistance from your district directors. We have bidders list. We have it for office supplies and road construction. We don't have it for ARPA funding. So if there is, you know, if you know of people, if people have reached out already. I, I'm not sure who to send the RFI to other than everyone, but um, if there's any contacts that have been made, email addresses was what really works for me, um, to start building a, a bidders list, if you will, or just a list of people that need to be contacted. So any help available through that would be greatly appreciated because this is not normal for myself and office either. And, you know, uh, Michelle Axler has been active in the uh, COVID social safety net, which has a list of all of the social service uh, providers here at, in the 
County, um, certainly with the greater Flagstaff area, but it really has served all of Coconino County. And I know she does have that list. I would highly rep um, recommend, Scott, that you work with Michelle to get that list. And then, of course, um, so the district directors and, and uh, the supervisors may also be able to provide additions. But my guess is that that's going to be a pretty good list. Yep. <laughs> and that is countywide. Where I haven't seen a lot from that list, because I also sit on that social safety net board, is from the Williams area. So some of like Williams, Fredonia, I know Paige is involved in it. Um, and so some of um, uh, Tuba City, if um, there's anything in the Tuba City area. I know some of these nonprofits that are part of the social safety net provide services out there, uh, but you probably want to reach out to um, some of these rural areas uh, and uh, see what they've got and those that may be interested. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, you have uh, Lucinda has hand her, has her hand up. Oh, she does. Hi, Lucinda. I didn't see that. Sorry. Good afternoon. No, I was just going to add that there's the resource inventory. There's the group that participates in that. As it, and then there's the resource inventory as well, um, which has a lot of the smaller agencies listed. So Scott, Viviana, um, Reyes, uh, and that should actually be on um, the website as well, can provide that to you as well. That's right. Michelle and Viviana, I forgot. Yeah, that. both. Right. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I also, I know Janet Regner needs to leave in a moment, but I wanted to introduce Janet. We're going to be engaging with Janet, and so she'll be doing, you know, her knowledge of Coquino County and the communities is deep. And so, uh, Janet, if you could just say, hey, we're, we're okay. putting her back into service because, uh, you know, when we were thinking of, okay, who knows the county is, as much as we do from that, from those dimensions, uh, Janet, of course, she, she was right at the top of the list. So Janet, it's uh, good to re-engage you back into county service in this role, just with your, with your talent and your knowledge. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. This is very exciting. And I know uh, we got a lot of, we lot, got a lot to do in a short amount of time. We'll, we'll get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Thanks for joining the team. So we appreciate you. your help on this. Nice to be back. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so, um, so Madam Chair, uh, again, um, questions that you may that board members may have after today, please reach out to any of the team here. Uh, but uh, in the closing moments, if if I could have just our team members, if there's a question or comment that any of the team wants to make. Uh, please do so uh, now, because sometimes I don't, I don't always remember everything. And then afterwards, people said, oh, did you, you should have raised this issue. Uh, sorry, I didn't know that. So this, if, with, your, with, your due, with all due respect to, to the chair, if you could just ask the team members if they have something to add, I would, I would appreciate it greatly. Does that mean speak up or forever hold your peace? Is that what this part is? Pretty much. <laughs> um, team members. Anybody? Wow, I guess I must have done a good I've job. I've had my say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Scott, for all the information. Actually, you've been very helpful. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Any other board members, comments, uh, questions from board members? Steve, uh, this is a, a very complicated area. I think you did a great job on the overview. I hope that members of the public uh, that have listened in. I know at one time we had 44 um, uh, participants here uh, listening in at this afternoon meeting, and I know there may be follow-up questions. Who should they direct those questions to? I'm process. Um, me. All right. And then also, <laughs> Madam Chair, we will brief Supervisor Fowler uh, on on the on the presentation today, uh, provide in-depth briefing to her. Thank you, County Manager. That would be excellent because th this is a lot to take in. So, uh, and uh, so those who are listening and are interested or have questions on the process or procedures, um, County Manager has opened it up to say call him. So uh, feel free. We really look forward to our community partnership with you. We have always looked to our community partnership to make sure that we have services for our community members. And we have for the first time, 
uh, a pot of money. Uh, maybe the only time we're going to have this type of pot of money to provide these types of services for our community. Uh, so we really hope that you will join with us uh, and uh, will join us in this ARPA process and procurement process um, because it is very, it's once in a lifetime money. We've heard that a million times, but it is true. And we want to make sure we get it used to the best and highest use for the people in our community. So um, questions, call uh, Steve. And uh, he just put on uh, on the website, it's uh, speru, S-P-E-R-U at coconino.eaz.gov. Um, so please take him up if you have any questions, take him up on his offer. So any any final questions? Supervisor Ryan, I see you popped up again, so. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear it, and I, I think the assumptions there, but just to, to say it, uh, uh, reaching out to the uh, uh, the various jurisdictions associated with the uh, IGA, uh, you know, each wouldn't be looking to us for this kind of thing. So uh, I presume it's in there, but just in case. Good point. And I believe it is. And by the way, that IGAs can be used across uh, for uh, tribal as well. Yes, included. So. All right. Well, that was excellent. A lot of information. I'm sure we'll be talking about this as we move forward as well. Uh, and um, Mr. County Manager, anything else that you have here for our afternoon uh, board meeting? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Actually, this item wraps up the afternoon agenda. Um, earlier than we had thought, and I don't see anything beyond this on the posted agenda. So I will note that it is 4.16. Um, I don't know when the previous chair would have ended a similar meeting, but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> That's why you got, got, had to get rid of me, you know? <laughs> Be nice, Petra. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, Ju Judy, I didn't mess up too bad, did I? No. Okay. And I told you to be nice too. <laughs> right. Madam Chair, Thank we will you. work on the RFI portion and get that work going out quickly. And uh, appreciate all of your patience and your uh, your uh, your thoughts and your uh, guidance. Uh, this is the first time we've done something like this. Uh, and, and so uh, we're kind of um, cutting new territory here, but appreciate it. And the staff team is excited to get this thing going. And more importantly, to get the funds out into the community assisting individuals. And, and, and we're, we're anxious for that as well. Money, money in, the, in the bank isn't helping our, our community right now. And uh, there are a lot of services um, that are needed out there. COVID has only added to that need. So um, really appreciate you're you expediting the process. And as usual, your staff has just done a, a, an excellent job and, and I wanna thank them all for going through this very time consuming process on uh, the ARPA. So thank you. Good. All right, any other comments? Vice Chair Vasquez, anything to wrap this first board meeting up with? Uh, I'm just really impressed with the efficiency of our chair because we got done like 45 minutes earlier than expected. So I commend you and uh, I, uh, I look forward to uh, to working with you and everybody else moving forward with, with the rest of our projects. And we'll see you, I guess, at six o'clock. We will see everyone at six o'clock. Thank you all very much. Take care. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Supervisor Ryan, see you soon. Is this kind of a hazy? It's a kind of a hazing. Go. Thank you for your service, but I, I have a lot of responses. But I'm, I'm just being so nice, my fellow board members, the chair, vice chair. Take care. See you. See you in about an hour or a couple okay. hours. Bye.
Good evening, Steve. How are you? That's coming down fast and furious here. Yeah, it, looks, it looks nice to see the window. It's actually, you can see the snow coming down behind me. Yeah. So FUSD's called it closed for tomorrow already. So. Yeah, it's. Uh, it looks like it might even go into Thursday. We're trying to, as you know, get out of town on Thursday to go camping. We'll see. So, yeah, we're supposed to be to Phoenix and then fly out on Friday to Texas. So. Oh, that's right. That's right. Anyway. The big move is happening. <laughs> that's good. Well, hey, it's, it's, is that is that former chairman Matt Ryan? <laughs> he who shall not be named. <laughs> so you get a month. You get a month long hazing as part of your stepping down. Instead of getting hazed while you step in, you're getting hazed while you step out. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, no respect. Is it because I kept them muted all year long? Gosh, now they're really. Uh, Good thing we all get along so well. Yes, it is. I'm a middle child. Yes, no, I don't know. Maybe. What do you want me to say? <laughs> oh, you're so right. You're so right. I am, I am actually the middle child in our family. So. <laughs> The peacemakers. Yeah, I'm. I am the bottom. I have pride in my position. I'm the bottom of the top half. <laughs> Five, <laughs> not six, which is top of the bottom half. Top of the bottom. Well, if this really does keep up at this rate, it will, we'll get over a foot. No. So. We need it. We need it. We need it. I saw one of the radio, uh, Calf put on a nice, uh, you know, reminding everybody when you come up, follow the signs, right. or, you know, be responsible, which is really nice for Dave Zorn to put that out. Good. It's a good thing. Supervisor Begay, do you want to try your microphone? There she is. Do not see uh, Supervisor uh, Co Chair Vasquez, is he, or I should say Vice Chair Vasquez. And uh, I think Judy, is she there at the office or did she go back to the hotel? Supervisor Begay is on. She's here with the purple J. Okay. The purple box. And then um, her um, Supervisor Vasquez is not on yet. I think we need Lucinda as well. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, I think it's important that Supervisor Baskin is on considering the district.
We just don't want anybody traveling tonight. Uh, Lucinda's on the way. So Judy is having some technical difficulties, but she says she is on and is listening. So, but she's having some problems with her, the mute switch. Of course, we need to be able to get her to vote. She can hear everybody. I'll be listening. My mute is going in and out. All right, Supervisor Vasquez is on and is coming over as panelists now. Mm -hmm. um, All right, so Lindsay, we've got everyone with us, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we All just, right. um, Vice Chair will not be here tonight. Very good, thank you. And yes, uh, Vice Chair Fowler has indicated that she left for county business this morning and she is in Window Rock. Uh, so she um, is not going to be able to meet, uh, to make it to this special session. So, and good evening, everybody. Uh, the, the snow is coming down fast and furious out there. It's, it's gorgeous, uh, but certainly, uh, anybody, any members of the public, please, if you can, stay off the roads. Tonight is not a good night to travel. Um, and my name is Patrice Horseman. I am the chair and also a supervisor for District 1. And so we should start out calling to order and calling this meeting, special meeting, back to order after our daytime meeting. Uh, let's go ahead and District 2, Vice Chair Vasquez, are you present? Present. Good evening, everyone. Glad you're here and, and can be be with us tonight. And again, be safe because it, it looks like it's getting wet out there. And uh, uh, Supervisor from District 3. Well, hello, everybody. Glad to be here and look forward to uh, our, our hearing tonight. Very good. And District 4, Judy Begay. And Judy, if you can, I know you're having some problems with your mute button. Are you able to uh, indicate you're here or, and if not, we will indicate that you are present on having some problems with your mute button, but are able to hear us. All right, so um, members of the board, members of the staff and members of the public, uh, we are, and it is listed on this agenda to do a second call to the public today. Uh, call to the public is an opportunity for members uh, in our uh, public to be able to address the governing board and to present issues to the governing board or comments to the governing board on matters that are not listed on the agenda. For those matters that are on the agenda and there will we will have a public hearing this evening, uh, but for those items not on the agenda, you can at this time uh, go ahead and address the governing board. Because these items are not on the agenda, the governing board will listen to your um, concerns or comments. Uh, they may ask questions, however, because it is not on the agenda, this is not a time to engage in any discussion, nor can the board take action on these call to the public items. So with that, our uh, very able uh, clerk of the board will inform the public on how they can address the board uh, during this virtual meeting. So Lindsay Daly, tell the public how they can address us if they choose to uh, um, to respond to our call to the public. Thank you, Chair Horseman. If you would like to make a comment on items that are not on the agenda tonight, you will hover your mouse down at the bottom of your screen and an icon should appear that looks like a hand that says raise hand and you'll wanna click on that icon. That will notify us that you would like to speak and provide a comment. If you are on the phone and you'd like to provide a comment, you're gonna hit star nine on your phone and that will raise your hand in our virtual meeting so that we can see that you would like to speak as well. 
And at this time, I don't see anyone that's in the meeting that is on the phone. So it, again, it would just be the raise hand icon that you would click at the bottom of your screen. Chair Horseman, I do have somebody by the name of Andy Barnett with their hand up. I'm gonna go ahead and allow them to talk. Thank you so much. Andy Barnett. If you, you just unmute, you can go ahead and speak, Andy. Andy Barnett, are you are you available? You need to unmute, and you have uh, up to three minutes uh, to uh, present to the governing board any item uh, that you'd like to discuss that's not on the agenda. I'm sorry, I had a mute on, so I turned that off, and uh, I just would say that after 16 years living on the road and on the north end of the road, where we go the far, the longest uh, on the dirt road. Uh, this is very exciting that we're moving along in this. And, uh, I'm, I'm sure. I think you know that this is for the next item. I, I, I and I'm sorry, Andy. Are, are we we are? This is on call to the public. These are for any items that are not on the agenda. We have not opened the public meeting on the. Uh, Onika Lilac Road Maintenance uh, uh, District. We are going to be considering that here in just a minute. So if you're here for the uh, Road Maintenance District, we're going to ask you to go ahead and wait on your comments until we open the call to until uh, we open the public hearing. I will do. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andy. And and uh, we will move on. Are there any other call to the public? Lindsay, it doesn't seem like anybody has raised the call to the public. So we are going to move on. And as I promised, we are here this evening on a public hearing. It's a consideration of possible action to approve resolution 2022-04, establishing the Onika, I think I'm pronouncing that right, the Onika Lilac Road Maintenance District and appointing uh, interim board members to serve uh, on the district until an election is held. So at this time, um, uh, we are going to ask uh, for a staff presentation uh, and to let us know we are opening the public hearing at this time. And I will ask for comments um, uh, uh, for, from the public after we have our presentation from both staff and also our legal counsel to let us know what are the process and procedures for a road maintenance district and what are the findings that must be made in order for the board to even approve a road maintenance district. So I see that Deputy County Manager Lucinda Andriani uh, is on and Lucinda, if you could please give us an outline and then ask our county uh, attorney to provide us uh, a legal briefing and overview of what we need to find for a road maintenance district. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. It's Lucinda Andriani, Deputy County Manager, and I also serve as the Public Works Director. And as I think you're aware, um, it's actually titled Onica, Onica uh, Lane and Lilac, uh, a road maintenance district is what's under consideration this evening. Um, I'll start with a little history and a uh, a set of facts that I want to share with the board. Um, and certainly this is reiterating much of what you saw in the in the uh, uh, packet of information that's been shared with you in terms of the uh, petitions and other information. Uh, first, we began working with a group of citizens um, oh, about now, probably at least three years ago. Uh, from this area that were interested in making improvements to their roads. And um, as you know, because we recently had, a, had a, um, a work session covering kind of overall more general information about uh, road districts and road maintenance districts. And um, this is a citizen driven process. The county doesn't take a position pro or con, you know, relative to the formation of districts. This is a statutory um, ability for citizens to that may want to improve their roads to go through a process like this, secure petitions, 
bring those petitions to the Board of Supervisors and then the petition Board of Supervisors make a decision whether it's in the public benefit and necessity and, and our county attorney, Ms. Winkler, will, will go through that process, the kind of the elements of the legal process, but it's a citizen driven process. They reached out. Um, I believe that we did two meetings uh, with the community uh, that's involved and early on in this process. And um, we shared with them, you know, kind of what are the steps that you go through uh, and recommended that they hire their own engineer, that they hire, um, um, you know, if they're serious about pursuing this, we always recommend that they hire their own engineer, uh, that that engineer consult with, uh, with a bona fide uh, road uh, contractor, uh, and that they hire their own attorney to formulate the language of their petition and follow the statutory requirements. And um, it's not the county's responsibility to conduct those processes. Um, and um, they did, the individuals did go through those processes and they then worked with the community members within the proposed district. The, the dis these citizens, they identify their own uh, geographical area, they identify the district boundaries that is not set again by the county, it's driven by the citizens that want to form the districts. They identified those boundaries and then they began to communicate with those within that area, uh, what the proposal was and the information that they had gathered from the engineer, contractor, et cetera. Um, we were not a party to those communications and shouldn't be. Those communications need to happen neighbor to neighbor, citizen to citizen. And those took place. The outcome of that is that 84% of those within the proposed district boundaries submitted petitions. Those, the, the, the names of those petitions were uh, provided to, from the clerk, were submitted to the clerk. The petitions were submitted to the clerk. The clerk then shares those with the assessor's office. And I believe our assessor is on this evening. Thank you, uh, Assessor Ruiz. Um, they're shared with the assessor's office. The, set, the assessor basically validates that, that those are the owners of the property because it has to be the owner of the property. It can't be a tenant or a renter who signs the petition. They validate that the petition was signed by the owner of record and um, they validated that and indicate back to the clerk, uh, did they meet the 50 plus one threshold, which is required by the statute? And they exceeded that, as I indicated, they, she fed back to the clerk that and to myself that it was 84% had submitted petitions. Um, <clears throat> so in addition, they also, Road Maintenance District has its own board of directors. And so um, the, the county supervisors do not sit as the board of directors. They have their own directors. So they submitted names, which is required by the statute to of people who would serve as their board of directors. They submitted five names. Those names were shared with the recorder's office. The recorder of office has to validate that they are electors within the district. So they have to vote with, they have to vote from within the district. So for example, let's say someone owned a second home within the district and they lived in Phoenix or didn't matter where, they could live in Bullhead City, didn't matter where, but if they're, and if they vote from that other location, then they can't serve as a board member. They must be elector within the district, must vote from the district, be registered to vote from within the district to serve as a, as a, as a board member. So the recorder's office validated that that was the case, that all the five persons that were, names were submitted, which are in the packet, um, that they were electors within the district. So those are kind of the two checkpoints by statute that the, that the county has to review. We don't validate the petitions beyond that. We don't, um, you know, there's no judgment made about the quality of the district board, you know, that that's all comes out of the citizen process. So with those, um, uh, those two elements being validated by the respective assessor and the recorder respectively, um, then uh, the clerk, uh, Ms. Daly, moved forward with 
uh, a notification process. There's both a letter that goes to all the district proposed district members, as well as a public notice that appears in the newspaper over a multiple week period um, that indicates that there'll be a public hearing, which was noticed for this evening, uh, February 22nd. And so we're here tonight, as you indicated, to conduct the public hearing. Um, the person that has led this effort, one of the persons that's led this effort is Richard Conkle, and he is on with us this evening. And um, uh, typically the way this would be managed is that first we'll turn to, Ro to Ms. Winkler, our uh, county attorney and um, a deputy county attorney that for this effort, and she will um, review the legal aspects and then um, the chair will turn to Mr. Conkle to see if he has any comments that he wants to share as in effect um, the applicant uh, representing the proposers for the district. And then there'll be a public hearing and those who are either in favor of or opposed can testify um, under the public hearing. And then it will return to the Board of Supervisors to ultimately make a decision whether to form the district or to not form the district. And again, Ms. Winkler will walk through kind of the process to make that, that determination. So with that, I think I've covered the process. If, if you have any specific questions um, before we turn it over to, to Ms. Winkler, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Members of the board, do you have any questions on the uh, process as outlined by Deputy County Manager Lucinda Andriani? So if I can, just to summarize then from what you've indicated is that um, in fact, uh, there was um, uh, a petition uh, did identify the district boundaries. Um, it did provide application provided an outline of the proposed improvements um, and that 84% uh, of the owners of record, uh, which exceeded the 50 plus 1%, in fact, uh, validated the petition and they did submit a board of directors, an initial board of directors consisting of five names uh, that are electors within the district and are registered voters within the district and that they did do the uh, notification process to all owners and also had a uh, notice of the public hearing in the newspaper. So. Is it, is it safe to say then, based on your overview of the process, that the um, statutory requirements of the process were in fact met by uh, this um, um, applica application? That's probably more appropriately uh, responded to by the county attorney, but from my vantage point and having worked on numerous districts in the past, I, I believe that they followed the process. Very good. Thank you. I think that's important that we need to list. And then, uh, yes, I would love to hear from our deputy county attorney on the legal aspects for this as well. Good evening. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, and members of the board. Um, as you just heard, Deputy County Manager Lucinda Andriani, you know, certainly addressed the process very thoroughly. Um, I would agree with her assessment that um, the petitioners. Uh, um, uh, met all of the statutory requirements in terms of process, um, you know, filing the petition, having the, you know, requisite and more than the re requisite number of signatures, um, you know, doing all the other things that were necessary according to the statute. Uh, and then the, the clerk of the board proceeded with her duties under the statute with regard to publication and notice. And this hearing today is being held within the statutory time frame that the county must hold the hearing. So uh, process-wise, I believe we have, have met every requirement, both the county and the petitioners, for the board to actually consider the merits of the uh, formation of the district tonight. And so uh, with all of that process completed, then really what is left for the board is to hold this public hearing, hear um, the uh, evidence um, that will be presented either through uh, you know, presentation by the petitioners or by uh, members of the public uh, in support or uh, against the formation of the district. And the, the board is directed to determine uh, whether the public convenience 
necessity or welfare will be promoted by the establishment of the district. Uh, and if it does uh, make that determination, if it finds that um, the public convenience, necessity, or welfare will be promoted, it shall make findings um, on the record and then shall uh, proceed to establish the boundaries and declare the improvement district organized. So uh, it's really a matter of the board members to hear uh, what is being going to be presented to them uh, tonight in the presentation and in the public hearing. Um, and make a determination about whether the formation of the district itself will promote the public convenience, uh, necessity, or, or welfare. Thank you, uh, uh, Deputy County Attorney and members of the Board of Supervisors. Any questions on the process or on the legal advice from legal counsel? Hearing none, then we Madam, are. Madam, Madam Chair. I'm so sorry. Yes, uh, Supervisor Ryan. Actually, uh, no, I, I'll wait until the uh, uh, process is explained. Then, uh, you know, it, what I'd hope to do is just get affirmation from uh, uh, County Assessor on the review, uh, uh, just noting those key points associated with it. Uh, I just got Supervisor Begay just texted that she has done. She's having a hard time with her mute button, but she's texting. In and since she has no questions at this time. So Supervisor Ryan, you're gonna hold off on your questioning. Is that quite correct? So at this point, I understand that the applicant is in fact present and uh, I understand he is available and would like to speak on this application. Uh, and so Lindsay, would you uh, mind uh, bringing him up uh, so that he can address the board? Mr. Kunkel, we can see that you have been um, brought up as a panelist uh, and you are now unmuted. And so uh, good evening, sir. And thank you for being here uh, present with us this evening. And we look forward to uh, having you provide information in your review of this application. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Rich Kunkel. I live on Annika Lane. Uh, I have been working on this project on again, off again for about a decade. Um, some of the other members who are volunteering to sit on the, on our board, such as Kirk Young, have also been working on this on again, off again. Um, all of our attempts at any sort of intermediate remediation of the condition of our road um, have not been successful over the last many years. Uh, so. Kirk worked with Lucinda on this, like Lucinda said, probably three plus years ago, and determined that this is really the, the best option that we have left to build a, a decent road that's going to serve us and uh, really just be a better uh, conveyance than what we have now, which is just ground down to, to basically dirt and potholes. Um, so we, like Lucinda said, we, we retained counsel. We have contracted with Woodson Engineering to do the surveying and engineering study. They actually helped create the plat that came with the petition. Um, we have great, great enthusiastic participation from the nearly 85% of the people who signed the petition to present to you. And all I can say is we could, have, we'd really appreciate it if you would uh, agree to form the district so that we may move forward and seek our financing and our bond and get our engineering study done and move forward to getting this road banned. And, and Mr. Kunkel, part of uh, our findings that we, the Board of Supervisors, must make um, is that the public convenience, necessity, or welfare will be promoted by the establishment of the district and that the property to be included in such a district will be benefited. Would you mind just giving us just a brief overview as to why you believe these standards are being met by your request for this uh, road maintenance district? Um, for one, for the public convenience, for the sake of all of us who live on this stretch of road, it is very, very pitted with 
potholes and other areas that are washed out. And when the monsoons come, we have uh, very large puddling problems. Uh, it's, it's just, it's a nuisance of a road. It beats up our vehicles. It, it really uh, taxes our suspension. Um, it's, it's a dust generator for those of us who live here. We're constantly dealing with dust problems. And there, there, I don't see anywhere where there would be a downside to improving this road and, and having us take on the, the responsibility of financing the construction. Thank you. And, and members of the uh, Board of Supervisors, any other questions uh, or comments uh, to for Mr. Kunkel? I have a question. Um, so have you determined what the cost will be to maintain this road once you get, uh, if you're able to, to take on this, this road district? Working, working with uh, several of the engineers and uh, in particular, uh, one of the guys who paves a lot of the roads up here, we had conversations with him about what it would partially cost and we generated uh, estimations which were included in our package. Had I, had I known you wanted that information, I could have sent you the package that we originally sent to Lucinda, which had all our cost estimates in it. And we figure for the maintenance to do chip sealing every five to six years, pothole repair if needed, other minor maintenance to the road, snow removal and things of that nature, it would cost approximately $250 per property owner per annum. Can I That's comment? Really? Yes, yeah. Supervisor Ryan. Uh, just Ryan. If, if I may, uh, we're, we're uh, in a district formation process. So everything's an estimate. Uh, the process by design, by statute is in some sense uh, inverse. Uh, you won't know until the district's form, until uh, you go out to bid, what the actual costs are. It's designed that way by statute. For, for uh, you know, people to, to uh, uh, want to know what the, uh, uh, the cost will be, uh, you know, it's not set up that way. And so, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's part of the process. Uh, you know, for some it's, it's difficult because you, you all want to know what you're investing in, but you have to make sure you have an appropriate process led by statute that provides estimates and then actually goes out to bid and meets those estimates. So, thank okay. you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank, and Supervisor Ryan, did you have a question or a comment other than the cost comment? Well, I, I, on that one, I, I think uh, Supervisor uh, Vasquez still is questioning. I'll wait until he's done his question and answer. Yes, Supervisor Vasquez? Sure. Um, first off, thank you. Uh, it was just a curiosity, and, and maybe we haven't gotten there yet, so I apologize if, if I ask that question. Uh, sooner than uh, than you were ready or or the presentation was ready for. Uh, I am appreciative that we are working on creating this road di maintenance district tonight. And uh, you know, I just uh, I want to make sure as we're going through this and 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 looking at at the um, the public hearing that that the the property owners who are involved understand that you know as they move forward, if this goes through the way it does, then the county will no longer maintain that road. And so that's why I'm just asking those questions just to kind of have that conversation. But I, I fairly am pleased for you to know that you all this hard work has gotten you to this point. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. It sounds like your dreams are starting to come true for this road. Supervisor Vasquez, if I may, the, the county does not maintain this road. It is a private road. Ah, okay. Which, why, which is why we don't want to bring it over to the county. The county does not want to assume the responsibility for this road, but this gives us an opportunity and a mechanism through which we can improve the district on our own and improve our neighborhood. And well, that's thank our motivation. You for that clarification, I appreciate that. I misunderstood that piece. And so uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm really pleased that through this public process that you were able to, to receive the support you have and are here tonight for this, this hearing. And, and I just thank, you know, the community who emailed in and, and left comments uh, in both in support, but also asking for the cost analysis for this road, uh, for participating in this process. Thank you. Thank you guys for the support. 
absolutely. And uh, um, we are going, unless there's other questions from members of the board or unless there's any comments uh, that uh, either Lucinda Andriani um, or um, uh, Rose Winkler would like to make on this process, I'm getting ready to open this for the uh, public hearing. Ma Madam Chair, I do have a few questions. Uh, okay, well, there you go. Okay, please. Ms. Supervisor. Mr. Mr. Conco, could you just explain your process that you used? The process that we used to get the signatures. Oh, well, as I said, we had retained counsel and they helped us draft the petition. Um, then we, uh, I, I sent an email out to everyone and said, guys, here's the deal. We have our petition. It's been blessed by the county. The county doesn't approve it, but they've reviewed it and said they didn't see anything wrong with it. I sent an email out to everyone. I have a, an email list with everybody's name in it. And I said, come over to my house and sign the document. And for the few people that we have that are out of, out of town residents, people that own in, in Phoenix, we have uh, another gent that owns who lives in Texas. I emailed them their signature sheet, had them sign it in ink and mail it back to me hard copy so I have the actual ink so they could be notarized. And, and, and that's where I'm going. Uh, your attempts to reach out to people, how you communicated, uh, you attempted to, to reach uh, every parcel member. Uh, sometimes that's unattainable, but you made those attempts uh, uh, to do so. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. And so, and we also have in our packet uh, the description that you sent to everybody along with the petition. Uh, signatures that are included in there. So it explains mm -hmm. what you sent out to people. Well, Supervisor Ryan, if, if I may, um, please. just a bit of background on me is I'm a, I'm a professional IT project manager. That's what I do for a living. And I am all about communication. So I make sure that we communicate openly and freely. Uh, we even actually have a professional Zoom license that we use for our, our own internal meetings, one of which we had just Saturday. But we're we're very much in contact with each other regarding this project. All right, thank you, Mr. Conkle. Uh, and Madam Chair, if I may, I'd like to ask uh, Lucinda Andriani uh, to answer a question. A absolutely, Supervisor Ryan. Uh, Lucinda, I heard your review of the, the process itself. And can, you know, I'm looking at the map provided, which is a parcel <laughs> map, but uh, can you explain the roads and, and where they may join our system road. Uh... They, uh, my understanding, Chair, is that they will connect to the county road system at K Campbell Avenue. It's the eastern uh, segment of of Campbell. Richard, is that correct? Am I articulating that correctly? Yes, it is. It's the uh, eastern side of Campbell. And so if you're driving north out on 89 and, and typically you would turn left and go up Campbell to go into the Timberline area, you actually turn right. And there's a spur of Campbell that goes to the east. And we maintain a little piece of that spur, but not the entire length. So um, I believe, you know, what I understand from reading the information and, and conversations is that they intend to improve a little bit of that road and then the roads that have been mentioned in the district themselves. So to make yes. that connectivity, they have to make a connectivity to a public road, right? As, as you're, you know, yes. and yeah. so they, they are making that connectivity. So. And, and just clarification, and I saw it in the petition, uh, but uh, for the sake of the record, for those listening, if they go back to review this, um, Mr. Conco, uh, the, the portion of Campbell Avenue that we don't maintain, you are uh, you have it included in in the uh, explanation of the road maintenance district that you're proposing. Is that correct? Yeah. The, the road connects at Campbell uh, and the intersection of Campbell and Soaring Eagle. So you're doing a portion of Campbell that the county does not maintain up to yes. where the county maintains. Thank yes. you. All right, and, and Madam Chair, uh, if I may, I believe uh, our assessors here. Uh, our assessor is here. 
Ar like Armando, there you are. Hi, Armando Ruiz, our assessor is here. You have some questions, Supervisor Ryan? Madam Chair, I, and I saw in the packet, uh, uh, the assessor had done a review, but having the assessor here and for the sake of public hearing, uh, you did review uh, the petitions and, and uh, they are uh, parcel owners and uh, they have met the percentages as required by statute as well as by uh, the county's uh, uh, own ordinance. Is that correct? Madam Chair, member of the board, Supervisor Ryan, Armando Ruiz County Assessor, yes. Uh, great to see everybody. Uh, my office in partnership with the clerk of the board did review um, the parcel list uh, that was given to us uh, in regards to the, um, based on the parcel description boundaries. And then we verified the petitions to ensure that the current owners signed the petitions. And so based on that information, um, there were 50 parcels identified within the district boundary and 84% uh, of those property owners signed the petitions. All right, thank you. And then I don't believe we have anybody from the recorder's office, but I'll note that we have, and I read in the record here uh, that the recorder's office, uh, there is a proposal if we find that it does meet uh, the objectives uh, and intent, um, but they, they uh, verified that the proposed uh, uh, board members, if this is to be formed, uh, are uh, uh, registered voters as required by statute also. All right, I'm, I'm just uh, going through my due diligence here, Madam Chair. No, I appreciate uh, that. And, and um, uh, we wanna make sure that the process has been checked off. And we did hear that also from both Lucinda Andriani and also from the um, uh, county attorney's office. And now we're hearing it from uh, Assessor Ar Armando Ruiz, and we have the underlying testimony of Richard Conkle on this. So sure. excellent. And, and I assume all the documents that we have presented before us are also part of the record that we will receive into uh, our hearing as well. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Any other questions, Supervisor Ryan? Not at this point, not until after uh, public then, hearing. Very good. Any other comments from the staff or uh, Vice Chair uh, Vasquez, uh, Judy if, uh, Begay, if you want to text questions in, if I don't hear back from you now, I will open the public hearing at this point. And remember, this is a time for members of the public to be heard on this. Uh, Lindsay will give instructions to you on how you can access this public hearing and make your comments. I'd like to make it clear that we need you as when you are um, uh, identify to testify here at the public hearing. We need you to state your name, your place of residence, and your uh, um, comments will be kept to three minutes. And Lindsay Daly will, Daly will also be our timekeeper uh, as well on this. Uh, so at this point, Lindsay, can you please explain to the public how they can join us and make comments at this public hearing? Thank you, Chair Horseman. If you would like to make a comment during the public hearing, you will hit the raise hand icon that looks like a hand at the bottom of your screen if you hover towards the bottom of your screen. We do already see three hands up from our attendees list. So it is working. So again, if you hit the raise hand icon, you will um, make us aware that you wanna speak. If you are on the phone, you'll hit star nine and that will raise your hand. Although I do not see anyone that has joined via telephone tonight. And we do have four hands up at this time. Chair Horseman, if you if you would like me to go ahead and call on the first person. Yes, would you mind, Lindsay? Thank you. Andy Barnett, I see your hand up. I am going to allow you to speak. So you will want to just hit unmute and then you should be able to um, speak and we'll hear you. There Thank you go. You. Thank you. That hand, this is Andy Barnett. I live at uh, 11947 North Island Colony. Uh, and uh, I uh, raised my hand out of order as of early in the beginning of it. So I don't have any additional comment. Thank you. Andy, thank you for joining us. And, and now is the good time to make your comments.
I don't have any additional comments. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, just for the record. Okay. Yes, and, and Andy, the, given the fact this is a public hearing and given the fact that we, the board, have specific findings that we need to make, uh, hearing some comments from you um, about uh, the road and your your belief about the road, especially with regards to whether you believe it, it is a for a public convenience and a necessity or welfare that uh, will be promoted by the establishment of the district and that the property to be included in the district will be benefited. So your comments are very important and important for us to hear from you on this. So please, if you wouldn't mind, just take it 30, 60 seconds and let us know uh, whether you're supporting this and why or why not. Well, I am definitely supporting it. Uh, it's exciting to see this progress. Uh, we live at the north end of Annika, uh, and down, downwind of uh, all the dust and all the construction materials and everything else that come across that road in front of that road. And uh, we uh, have actually had damage to our vehicles uh, while driving down the road and not driving too fast. It's just the holes are deeper than the uh, clearance of the vehicles. And uh, uh, it, it can be a very dangerous situation uh, uh, when the uh, snow is there and actually when the rain and other things uh, fill up some of those holes, we have no way of knowing. And uh, we also have a concern about uh, the uh, transportation of, uh, of ambulances and other first responders along this road. It's a, it's a very, uh, uh, when we moved in, there were vacant lots all the way to the Summit Fire Station, so they could get there across the, the lots much quicker, but they, they cared about that. But now it takes them a long time for them to get all the way down or up uh, on a going, uh, and somebody's life could be in jeopardy, and property can certainly be in jeopardy, even though, uh, they seemingly aren't far away uh, out on 89 or some of the fire stations. So thank, thank you, Mr. Garnett. That, that is helpful to hear uh, from um, uh, a property owner that lives along that road as to what you see the benefit of uh, this uh, district. So thank you for your, your comments. And would you mind for the record also providing us your address? Yes, my address is 11947 North Annika Lane. Very good. And any other comments, uh, Mr. Barnett? No, thank you. Very good. Chair Horseman, the next person I have is John Kay. John, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and allow you to speak. And John, once again, we want to remind you, if you could, to please state your name and your place of residence, and you have up to three minutes to provide uh, testimony on this road maintenance district. So thank you for joining us this evening. Can, can you Mr. Kate, uh, we, we okay, can great, you? Great, great. I'm I'm John Kukowski. I've been a resident of 11326 North Bilac. Sorry, Mr. Kukowski, are you on two devices? There's a little bit of an echo, so you may need to log out of one device if you're on two. How's that? There you go. OK, great. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, there for 17 years at 11326 North Lilac. My name is John Kukowski. I think the, uh, the local neighbors have, have done a lot of due diligence, which I really appreciate. I also have a background in project management, as well as uh, some, I've worked in the space of road construction in the city of Phoenix. And before we come up with estimated costs, we generally have designs, road designs, and drainages and permitting and all that. So we have a better understanding of what the overall cost is. I share the same concerns as vice chair does. I feel like a lot of the 
folks that have signed the petition has basically, quite frankly, signed a blank check. I, I don't really have a good understanding of the overall costs. Um, there's no go, no go, no go criteria. So if it costs 1.5 million, do we do gravel or do we still pave? You know, there's none of that. Any experience I've had in the past, we usually put boundaries and criterias around a project to determine if it's a go or no go. Um, the other issues I have is going forward, I, I recommend that the, the county look at doing this by road because predicated on how you draw the boundaries, you can come up with your 70% just by virtue of how you design the district. If you note on the map, majority of homeowners that are gonna benefit from this are all on Annika. Those that are on Lilac, North Lilac, they are unpaved, but those that are on South Lilac are all paved and they will receive no improvement in front of their frontage. So I, I struggle with the overall approach in terms of understanding why there's only one option. I really would like to avoid perpetuity. I really would like to see us look at in the future, turning this over to the county. I've been told that the county doesn't have the budget for that. I've only heard that from my, from my neighbors. I struggle with that to understand why in the future the county wouldn't want to maintain that so that law enforcement can write the appropriate tickets and enforce the speed limits. Right now on the dirt road, people go flying past my house. Um, it's unsafe. There's a lot of dust because of the high speeds. Um, so it's very challenging. The other part I struggle with is can a homeowner who receives a road improvement from the road maintenance district not be part of the district? So there are gonna be lots that are gonna receive an improvement, but they're not part of the district. That makes no logical sense to me. And I, I think I need legal counsel to uh, let me know if that's, if that's, if, if that's viable. Uh, this is the case. The homeowner is at 11289 North Soaring Eagle Drive they will receive uh, pavement on their lot, but Mr. They will Kukowski, not. you're going to yes. need to wrap up. We've just hit the three minute mark. If you could wrap up, thank you. Okay, great. I'd, I'd like to leave the board with um, uh, with this. Can the can the organizers draw the boundaries accordingly to ensure they have at seventy percent concurrence? This is the case. Thirty six lots on Annika plan to have frontage pavement compared to just five lots on North Lilac that will have frontage pavement. I don't know how fair that is, but I think there's a lot more due diligence that we need to do before the board decides in perpetuity. And if I may, I also note, Mr. Uh, Kukowski, that you did provide a letter uh, to uh, the county uh, with regards to some of your questions and concerns and comments, is that correct? And I believe the date is February 21st, 2021. Well, that's where I had asked that we should look at more than just one option and that we ought to have road design so that we have really more solid understanding of what the scope of work is. Very and good. And I just, I'm pointing that out because that letter will be included as part of the record. And then at this point, I would like to ask uh, our legal counsel uh, we are here um, based on our own maintenance district and we are caught and, and required to follow the statutory requirements of 48903. So my question is some of the concerns that have been raised here, is that within our scope as, um, uh, as Board of Supervisors in deciding a road maintenance district uh, uh, is, or is this outside of our process at this point? Uh, I mean, I, th I think the, my answer is that it's a bit of both. Um, you know, certainly some of the issues raised ultimately will be matters for the, if the district is formed, for that district board to consider and determine. So, um, so you know, getting into the details of, of the projects and expenses and all of that, um, that is really something that eventually, uh, if the district is formed, you know, a, a board is appointed initially and eventually, you know, will have to go through elections. Um, and they will be the ones making those decisions. Um, outside of that, uh, you know, to the extent there's any question about, um, you know, certain properties being included within the boundaries or not, certainly the board can, you know, look at the maps, uh, look at the boundaries that have been proposed for the uh, district. Um, and that is what will 
play into the board's determination of whether the properties are being uh, served by the creation of a district, uh, whether there is, um, you know, convenience and necessity and, and welfare promoted by uh, the formation um, specific to the boundaries being proposed. Does that answer your questions, Chair? Kind of. Okay. <laughs> You gave me a yes, no, I'm going to, I'm going to say the same, but no, I really do have another question. And, and that is that, so we have in fact received the boundaries that have been included uh, and that we have then also received um, that uh, the, the petition in which there was 50 identified um, uh, property owners affected by this road of which 84% in fact signed is there anything further we need to look into other than that to meet the requirements of 48903? No, no, aside from, again, you know, just it all has to come back to the board's determination that the uh, public uh, convenience, necessity, and welfare will be promoted. There's no other, you know, details or, or, or um, you know, specific circumstances that the board needs to look at specific to the maps and boundaries. Thank you. Um, and, and with that and with that explanation, I, I think we have more people that would like to um, uh, present comments for our public hearing. Is that correct, Lindsay? That is correct, Chair Horseman. I have Craig who will be the next speaker. Craig, I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to speak and you'll just have to unmute yourself. Okay, uh, my name is Craig Jensen. And I have a house at 11793 North Annika Lane. And I've owned that house since uh, really the beginning of 2014. And I'm no longer a, a permanent resident there. I'm just a, I'm some, a summer visitor. Uh, but I've been working on this road for three years, this, this road uh, project. Uh, and I'm terribly excited about it. That, that road is very bad. I reiterate all the concerns about the dust and the, the first responders and all that. Uh, and I think everybody that that has been on this call uh, will benefit. They, they drive on some portion of this road uh, and the, the very front portion off of Campbell and then onto Lilac, Lilac is by far the worst part of the road. Uh, and so even though it's the short, short drives for somebody like the last speaker, uh, it, it, they still benefit immensely from having the road there. And this, the community support is just incredible right now. There, we have a lot of new neighbors uh, and they're all asking about the road and wanting to get going. And so uh, I support this in, in every way, shape or form. And I'm very interested in, in working with the county and, and even looking at any assistance they could give us uh, financially as we move forward with this. So that's it. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate your your uh, um, comments. And uh, Lindsay, do we have any uh, further uh, individuals who would like to present here at our public hearing? Yes, the next person I have is Jennifer Brown. Jennifer, I went ahead and allowed you to speak. You'll just need to hit unmute. Jennifer, also please state your name and your address and you have three minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. This is Jennifer Brown. I live at 11037 North Lilac. I am on the south side of what everybody's talking about. I am parcel 50. So I have a very short distance down Campbell to travel on that horrendous road. It is terrible. It is unsafe. Um, and as I have lived here since 2009, um, right before the fire and then the floods, um, and that road used to be just a, a, a small two lane road. And now as traffic tries to avoid the potholes, um, they are traveling more and more onto the property owner's lines, widening the road. That in turn is causing huge dust and a dip in the road. So for someone like me that drives off of, Cam off of Lilac, um, the South Lilac onto Campbell, the visibility has become a huge concern for us. The weeds are high, the road is low, the dust is blowing. It's extremely unsafe. The road is not smooth. It is not easily traveled. Um, we have had some emergency vehicles needing to travel down the road and their um, travel time has been delayed um, because of the condition of the road. We have a lot of... Um, 
I would say unhappy neighborly relations that occur because of the fast driving that is occurring, causing the dust. Unfortunately, people are of the understanding the faster they drive on the rough road, the smoother it will become. However, that lends itself to many accidents. Um, many, actually, one gentleman had somebody land up on his rocks not too long ago at one of the curves that takes you onto Annika. It's extremely dangerous. Um, you know, I don't know what all of the costs will be. I think what you heard before is valid. We don't know all of the details, but yet it's still to be determined. And I'm telling you from being plot 50, um, I am very interested in the paving of this road. It's dangerous without it, and it's just worsening. I appreciate your time. And thank you, Richard, for all of the work you've put into this. We appreciate you greatly. Thank you, Jennifer. We appreciate your comments here. And thank you for joining us this evening. And do we have anybody else who would like to make comments during this public hearing? Yes, Chair Ryan, we have Melissa. Melissa, I'm going to allow you to speak. If you can just unmute yourself and then state your name and address. We'll have three minutes for you. Yes, hello. Can you hear me now? We can hear you just fine, Melissa. Fantastic. Please state your name, your address, and you have three minutes. Yes, ma'am. My name is Melissa Granke. My husband and myself, Mark Granke, live at 11660 North Onica Lane, or Onica. I see there's some different pronunciations. Um, we've lived here since 2017. And my husband, Mark, is on the um, board for the road maintenance. Um, we are 100% in support of the road maintenance and paving, um, as we have firsthand seen many of the safety concerns that have prior been spoken about. Um, in addition, previously, there was a few comments or sorry, one individual comment that some of the questions he had were not addressed. And I have not seen that person or heard them previously on any of the Zoom calls where um, I believe Rich has actually commented on the cost and how that would be divided and how that would actually affect certain people on the road differently. And that the dividing of that would not be, um, it would be taken into account that we wouldn't give somebody who has a very small parcel of that portion or has already had pavement um, a whole chunk like the rest of us, and hopefully he'll be able to speak on that after. Um, but going back to uh, the actual road, we are 100% in support of this. As far as safety, we have two children that are four and six years old. We've lived here since our oldest, or our youngest son is a newborn, and it is extremely concerning to me, the lack of safety due to the dirt road. Again, someone else spoke about the potholes. It's not just potholes. These are huge huge holes. Um, we have ATV, Razor, um, Quad, dirt bikers come flying down the road because they know that it's dirt, trying to go through private properties into the woods. Um, they're young children. They're going very fast. We personally take this liability on individually, owning that part of the road. That's very concerning for me and my husband. Um, there are many other children in this neighborhood. There are about, um, I think, about 12 to 15 children just on our road alone on Annika. Um, we watch postal workers fly down the road. We see how dangerous it is for them. Uh, delivery drivers, fire, police. We've had the sheriff come down our road. Again, it hinders their ability to get here quickly. We've had to call the sheriff in the middle of the night when we've had um, people trying to intrude um, into our home. And that's very concerning for me, especially with a husband who works on call. And so we are definitely um, pro the road being paved and um, support it. And there has been a very clear breakdown financially as what we expect to pay for this. Yes, it's not 100%, um, but it has been conveyed to all the neighbors. And they think if someone doesn't have that information, they haven't been able to tune into the Zoom calls we've had, because again, that information has been covered. Um, and then again, on our last speaker, she spoke about the road how it's slowly widening into everybody's property. And we have also seen that affecting our drainage issues as well, which after the fires, is very clearly a concern for the entire neighborhood. Um, so that's pretty much all I wanted to share and thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. And just a, a point of clarification. That's why I asked Rose uh, Winkler, our legal counsel, just to make some comments on some of the questions were being asked and in, in, uh, by a, a commenter earlier and also on an email. Uh, just uh, and what we were told is really those are not questions for us to consider 
while we are considering whether to uh, accept a road maintenance district, but those are the questions. And if a road maintenance district is formed, that that board of directors for the road maintenance district will be responsible for answering uh, and uh, uh, you know answering those kinds of questions and making those kinds of decisions. So just a point of clarification on that. Uh, that is not what we're here tonight to decide. Uh, is that and I, Rose, were you trying to come up? Um, Yes, here I am. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would say that is that is certainly true. Those are those really are not issues for this board today. Uh, those are issues for the uh, if the district is formed for the board that will be uh, governing um, that the district itself. So the the board today is is only to be uh, determining the the value of formation and, and whether the information it's hearing tonight. Uh, indicates that the formation of the district will promote uh, public convenience, necessity, and welfare. Very good. Thank you again for that clarification, Rose. Thank All you. right. Any other members of the public that would like to address um, uh, uh, the public hearing? Chair Horseman, we do have Bob H. Bob, I've allowed you to speak. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and state your full name and address, and you have three seconds to speak. Good evening, uh, Robert Hallstrom speaking uh, for my wife, Joanne, 11893 North Annika Lane. Uh, we've been residents here since uh, June of uh, 18. Um, our most important, I think, issue to raise here is we have a tremendous sense of community here. Um, and the road issue has been a uniting factor here. Um, it would be very difficult to uh, throw a dart around here and hit somebody who does not want to see this road brought up to uh, 19th century um, levels. Um, the road is simply terrible. Uh, we joke that we don't have a road maintenance district. We have a dust abatement district. Um, I come from California, I hate to admit that, but um, we had roads where the post, postal service would not deliver mail because of dogs running loose. Uh, they happen to be pit bulls, but uh, you know, pick your favorite uh, negative. I can easily envision the post office telling us to put a group mailbox down on Route 89 so that they wouldn't have to drive this ridiculous wreck of a road. Uh, we have people shoveling gravel and sand and filling in potholes. And every time we get wet weather, we just recreate them. I don't know what color my cars are anymore because I don't bother to wash them simply because one one trip in and out, and the cars are the same color as the roads. Uh, I hate to think of the damage. We, we drive like little old ladies winding our way around the potholes. It's a slalom ski event. Um, because we don't want to go through the ones where we scrape the undercarriage. Uh, and that stretch, that 75 yards of Campbell, is, is a used minefield. It's an absolute disaster and it, it is a lawsuit waiting to happen. And we're all sitting here going, geez, people, we all get along. We all love each other. We will certainly get together and pave this road with just a little bit of guidance and permission from the county to do it. And uh, that's our point of view. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us this evening and for your comments. Um, any further comments? L yes, Lindsay? Chair. Chair Horseman, we have Judy Hall. Judy, I'm going to allow you to speak. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and then state your name and address, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you so much to the Board of Supervisors for allowing me to speak with you tonight. Um, my name is Judy Haw. My husband is Jim. 
We live at 11485 North Annika Lane. We are new residents to the neighborhood. We love our new neighborhood. We are retired. Um, this should indicate, or at least to the two of us, it's important that ambulance and fire are able to access our home um, quickly and easily. Um, when we moved into our new home, we shortly thereafter met with Richard and found his explanation of what he was doing. And we found that the process was totally transparent. We jumped on board. I agree with Mr. Barnett about car issues. I drive a Prius. A Prius is not an off-road vehicle. It, I, I love my Prius, but I'm damaging it every time I go to the grocery store. I, when I moved in, I had a lot of Amazon packages being delivered to me. My USPS and my UPS guy con conversed with me with their frustration of having to go down our road. And as a previous neighbor said, um, I don't wanna have to drive down to Highway 89 to get my mail. Um, I, I think really that I just wanna say that my husband and I agree with most of what everything was said today. We, um, anyway, I will just leave it at that. I would like to take this time to say, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard, for your legwork. Well, well, thank you, Judy Ha. We appreciate your comments. And now do I unmute? Oh, there we go. Thank you very much for your comments and for joining us this evening. Uh, and Lindsay, anyone else would like to make uh, comments? Yes, we have several more. The next person I have up is Kirk Young. Kirk, I have, um, let's see, you may be on a different format of Zoom, so I'm going to promote you as a panelist. You'll need to, there you go. Then you can go ahead and unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Thank, thank you, I, I, I love starting meetings out with a promotion. Um, I'll look forward to that page deck. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair, supervisors for your time this evening. We really do appreciate this. We appreciate um, uh, the county's assistance on this, Lucinda and her staff. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, an adventure together, um, beneficial to this community. <clears throat> I, I won't go over all the great points that, that people have added on this. I'll just add that um, the safety aspect is, is paramount in my mind. Um, I've, from my house, which is less than a mile from the pavement, it, it takes me going at a pace, a reasonable pace, but not a jostling pace, about eight minutes to get to pavement. And, and I think about what eight minutes means with, uh, a loved one in distress waiting for 911 to get there or waiting for a police officer to respond, that kind of stuff. It's an eternity. It's just by the time you hit the, the unpaved portion of our road. Um, the other thing that was brought up too, I wanted to emphasize, which is the uh, uh, essential services that I think could be at risk if we don't do something about this road. Um, about two years ago, I actually saw a mail truck stuck in the mud in front of a mailbox was it stuck down the axles? No, but it wasn't moving and the guy was out pushing. Um, and, and so these sorts of concerns aren't, aren't hyperbole. <laughs> um, and I guess the only thing I, other I'd mention is I think that um, the, the neighborhoods that have been, uh, the neighbors that have been involved in this with Rich and, and others have made every attempt to be transparent and to think of this equitably um, we've done a, a number of due diligences with um, getting uh, estimates, knowing that there's a lot that can't be seen, but you know, we've had Corky Heckthorn, who I think the county uses a lot to, to pave roads in the north, knows what he's talking about. He's paved probably half the roads in Flagstaff um, out to give us an estimate. And, and we use that as a benchmark for our communication to the rest of the neighbors to, to try to inform that question that we can't get to until we advance on this process, but at least going into this, um, we, we have an idea of what this is gonna cost. Um, the, the, um, and, and I think that's where I'll just 
end it again. Thank you all for your time. Mr. Young, if you can please um, state your address for the record as well. You bet. Um, Kirk Young, 11890 North Onica Lane. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young, and thank you for your comments and for joining us this evening. And next. Next, we have Rebecca Seeger. Rebecca, I've allowed you to speak. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself. I believe I have. My name is Rebecca Seeger. I live at 11407 North Onica Lane. Um, I reiterate what everybody said. I agree with everybody said that just for this road, um, I've lived here for 11 years. When I first moved here, we were talking about this. Abel Garland was one that was kind of running the show and told me we were gonna make it happen. And 11 years later, we're still working on it, but we're finally close. Um, I'm just gonna bring up some different issues. Um, one person mentioned the car that was up on the rock, somehow they launched up onto that rock. If the rock was not there, they would have taken out the person's fence um, and gone halfway into the yard and our yards are rather large. I've had twice where people have gone into my ditch or between mine and my neighbor's ditch, I've had I put in some uh, reflector poles because we don't have any lights out here. They have taken out my reflector poles. They have come close to taking out my, my mailbox because I do live at a corner. I live at the corner where Annika um, goes from heading east to heading north. Um, talking about dust. Uh, yes, dust is a common issue because I face north. I mean, I'm sorry, I face east. I face the or west. I face the mountains. So. A road will solve a lot of those issues. And I also have a, a huge concern with getting emergency vehicles down. I have had to call the sheriff before um, because apparently it was some kids, but I didn't know at the time, but they were ringing my doorbell and running away and I didn't know what it was. So I called the sheriff and it took them a long time just to get down our road. Same thing with the fire. I've seen ambulances and they take a long time. So. I, I think this is what we need to do. Yes, we don't know all the costs, but I think we have a, a fairly good idea. And we are taking into account the people on South Lilac who um, already have a paid road. We are not having them pay the same as everybody else. Um, thank you very much. And hi, Matt, it's been a while. <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, Rebecca Singer, and uh, for your comments this evening. And. Our next uh, commenter. Thank you, Chair Horseman. The next commenter we have Missy. Missy, I've allowed you to speak. If you can unmute and then state your full name and address, and we'll give you three minutes to speak. Thank you. And can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Missy is my nickname. Melissa Oates. Melissa Oates and John Oates at one one seven eight three North Onica Lane. Uh, we bought our property in 2004, built and moved in in 2006. Um, we have been on board 100% from day one to have this road paved. Uh, I did at one point try to get Unisource gas in here and that kind of fell through, but now we just want the road paved. Um, part, of, part of so many issues, everyone has touched on so many things, but I want to I, I do want to say how much we appreciate the whole board, Richard, um, for sure, and, and the rest of the people that have been working on this. I know from just what I tried to do with Unisource, it's a project. Uh, we, about four years ago, replaced all our culverts, had our ditch redone, um, mainly because of after the Schultz fire, we had some serious flooding issues. Our neighbors, Craig and Joanne, which has already commented, they their property was uh, pretty much in, in a precarious situation to being flooded. Um, that's, that's a real big issue. Um, we get some heavy rains out here and it washes out our drive and everything. We, there's not everyone in this area that has culverts. I don't know why the developers did not do that. I kind of put that back on them. Um, emergency vehicles. We had a neighbor that was in Craig and Joanne's house, uh, almost lost their baby because 
of emergency vehicles not being able to get down the road in a timely manner. We have been notified at, at times from UPS and other deliveries that they would discontinue service due to our road. Um, the autos, I mean, everyone has issues with the, the cars and everything, but the drainage that we recreated in the front of our house to hope, hopefully keep that flooding out there, we paid a good amount of money for that. And the school buses that would come down here that had to turn into driveways um, basically we're having issues with that too. So I am, we are 100% for this. And I, I just, I can't believe anyone that wouldn't be. Um, we do know the expenses and the estimate because Richard and the board has um, shared that with all of us. So we do have an idea for that. So of course we don't know, it's not gonna be exact, but, um, I, you know, I don't know what else to say there. We can't go backwards. We have to move forward on this. It's, it's the whole neighborhood needs this for the safety of everyone. Children can't even ride their bikes out there because it's so bad. That's three minutes. Thank you, Missy. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Missy Oates. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening and our next speaker. Thank you. Next speaker we have is Fritz and Margaret. I have allowed you to speak. If you can state your full name and address, and we will um, set your time clock for three minutes. Thank you. Hi, Fritz and Margaret Mootville, 11465 North Lilac Lane. Um, my comments are fairly short. Everybody's pretty much touched on all the issues. We've been here since 2008. Um, we've seen this road deteriorate to where it's become pretty much impassable and extremely hazardous. We've had the need to use of emergency vehicles and they took a long time getting here. I've seen emergency vehicles travel on this road and they have to crawl, they cannot drive anymore. Um, we're at a point where, as others said, we cannot go back, we need to go forward. This is not a road anymore, this is a dirt track that's extremely hazardous to traverse. I'm also concerned about the mail, UPS, package deliveries, these, these things. We've also heard in the past that they were thinking about discontinuing services in this area, which would be horrible. Um, I thank Rich and thank everybody else for all the work they have done. I just hope that we can get it done this time because we definitely need a new road. We need a paved road and we need improvement. My comments are fairly short. Everything else has been touched by other people. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. And thank you for joining us this evening and our next speaker. Thank you. The next speaker I have is Andrew Bickert, B-I-C-K-E-R-T. I have allowed you to speak. If you can unmute yourself and state your name and address. Hi there. Thank you for your time. My name is Andrew Bickert. We live at 11803 North Onica Lane. Um, we share a lot of the, we're 100% for the road. We've lived here about a year and a half, um, going on two years. Um, and from the get-go, you know, Richard and the rest of the board have been very much open to communications and I can't remember how many Zoom calls we've had now, but any questions we ever raised were immediately answered or followed up via email. Um, we do share the concern though about the cost of the road, but um, you know, we've gotten a lot of estimates and I know those can change, but we're still on board with it. We felt like those were communicated very well overall. Uh, the emergency services are is our main concern um, just because we have uh, quite a few kids and um, you know, some have had a health problems in the past and just getting those ambulances and things like that out there um, is definitely a concern. We've also had private employers refuse to go down the road. Um, and I've heard several other people mention that services may not um, happen in the future just because of the condition of the road. Um, and then the last thing was just the, the degradation of the Campbell Road. That's the main uh, area that seems to be the worst. I think Craig pointed that out, but just as that road keeps encroaching onto the private land, we do also have a concern that it'll eventually just slide into the culvert there um, if it keeps going farther and farther along uh, without erosion that would cause other issues down the roads. And that was our, our main points. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, and thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, our next uh, commenter. Thank you. The next person I have um, noted as Big Al, I have allowed you to speak. If you can just unmute yourself and state your name and address, please, we will um, provide three minutes. My name is Alan Strayer. I'm at 11984 North Annika Lane, which is the very north end, right across from Andy Barnett, where the, we're going to benefit the most, I suppose. But with that concern, we also have a handicapped adult daughter living with us who gets transport twice a day down this road. And we have concerns for them and of course for emergency vehicles as well, which all these have been mentioned now at this point. And when I first raised my hand, you know, I had a lot of things I thought I might say, but we just wanna put in our two cents and say, yes, we're hundred percent behind it as well. We've been waiting for it for years. We've lived here since 2006 had the property since 2004, I guess. And so we're very concerned and yeah, would, we're 100% behind it. Would love to see it paved as soon as possible this year, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, we appreciate your comments this evening and thank you for joining us. So- uh, Alan, can you please state your last name, Alan? I didn't catch that, sorry. Strayer. Strayer. Strayer, S-T-R-A-Y-E-R, yeah. Thank you. Okay, the next person I have is Lynette Kukowski. Lynette, I have allowed you to speak. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself, state your full name and address, we will provide you three minutes. Thank you. My name is Lynette Kukowski and I live on 11326 North Lilac Lane. Um, me and my husband both feel like we are being unfairly burdened with the cost of this road, seen as there are only two other residents that live on Lilac Lane that are in favor of this. Almost really all of the residents who want it are on Annika Lane. And considering that Annika Road is an extremely long road, we feel like that is an unfair burden, especially considering that the residents on the other side of Lilac who already have their road paved are not going to be, or do not have to pay or pay less and what about the residents on Soaring Eagle? Um, are they not going to participate in this road district? That was our question. Um, we feel like the road should be returned to its original state um, in, in, instead of pavement because we feel like people will drive much faster than what they're driving currently. We see people go, um, go off the road because they are going so fast on a dirt road. They are not driving for the conditions. With a paved road, it'll be a racetrack and people that are on the road, children on bikes, will be more at risk than they would have been on the dirt road. At least on the dirt road, you can get out of the way. Um, the speeds are great and we have observed them from our porch uh, many a summer evening. And that's, um, I don't know, I guess that's pretty much all that I have to say. Well, once again, thank you for your comments and thank you for joining us uh, this evening. And, and next speaker. Next speaker I have is John and Aaron Motes. I have allowed you to speak. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself, state your name and address, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we don't really have anything more to, to add other than what's already been added. We totally agree with those that are in favor of the road. Um, and we just want to get it on record that we support it. And we appreciate all the hard work that um, Richard and the board has gone through. We've been here um, for 17 years. Um, our address is 11488 North Annika. And um, we just want to make sure that, you know, you, we have a voice that is heard and we appreciate it. Um, I do have just one comment. I'm not sure what the comments are about Soaring Eagle because it's already a paved road. So I'm not sure why that's even an issue, but maybe I'm missing something, but just throwing that out there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much uh, again for your comments and for joining us this evening. Uh, next, Lindsay. Thank you. I have Kathy Soper. Kathy, I've allowed you to speak. If you can unmute yourself and state your name and address, and you will have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Kathy Soper. My husband, John, and I, we live at 11274 North Lilac Lane. And uh, Lilac, that's the house that's on the corner of Campbell and Lilac. Uh, we've lived here since 2004. So we are the residents that have lived here probably the longest of anybody that's been here. So we we totally support the road district uh, being formed. We do, uh, John and I, where our house is located, we have the least amount of distance out of anybody to travel to the highway and we have four wheel drives. So this isn't even an issue for us necessarily getting to the highway, yet we do support it for our neighbors because we do agree it's a, um, an issue of dust, a safety issue. And my husband and I, we have personally um, contributed thousands of dollars over the years, over the 18 years that we have been here to help our neighbors have the smoothest drive as possible to get to their residences. However, this, you know, as more houses were being built, more um, construction vehicles, you know, if you can imagine, now we have 50 houses. There was only a handful of houses here when we first moved here. So all those trucks, all those workers in and out, up and down through our property, because our property is an easement and we, we own property on one side of the road and on the other. So literally all the residents that come through here are going through our property where we have grandchildren and we have animals and we have seen um, people drive real fast. And we are just really excited that now our neighbors are wanting to contribute and help make this safe for everybody. And, and, I, and I just wanted to clarify this because we have the least amount of interest in this as far as getting out to the highway and back, yet we are here to support it. And I have been and attended every meeting and Richard Conkle and the rest of the board members have been superb at reaching out to all the neighbors, clarifying the cost, welcoming, inviting them to attend meetings, yet the ones who are opposing it have never attended a single meeting. They just wanna complain and say that they're uninformed, yet they do raise valid points, I agree with, but yet they haven't attended the meeting to have their concerns addressed. So um, that's mostly what I have to say. My husband and I can no longer financially continue to um, improve this road on our own, nor can we physically do it with our tractor. We have been doing it for 18 years, and this is why everybody thinks that it's a county road, because we have been maintaining it. The signage that is that says Campbell and Lilac, we purchased that. So that is our property. It is not from the county. It is Kathy, Johnny. That's, that's three minutes. I'm sorry if you could wrap up. Thank you. I am wrapping it up. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, thank you very much for your comments and for joining us this evening. Uh, ne next, Lindsay. Thank you. Next, I have Georgia Adams. I've um, given you permission to speak. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself and then state your address and we will um, provide three minutes for you. All right, great. Um, well, there, we're, there are two homeowners here. So Georgia Adams is my mother who's attending. And I am Victoria. I'll spell the last name because it's a doozy. Uh, D is in David, A-M-J-A-N-O-V-I-C. Um, and I'll be very quick. Um, oh, I'm at 11380. Onika, 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 whatever it is. Um, we are the newest homeowners here, I believe. Um, we moved in October and um, we absolutely support this road. In fact, we almost didn't purchase this, uh, this home because of the road. Um, so that's just, I think, a, a point that hasn't been made is it does affect property values because we love the home, but we had to really think. And the only reason we purchased this house 
was because of the work that Richard Conkle and the board did. Um, they had documents showing that this was in progress and that this was a possibility or we wouldn't have purchased it all. So I just wanted to share that we are 100% on board um, and I agree with all of the issues that have been addressed. Thank you very much and thank you for your comments uh, this evening. So, uh, anyone else, Lindsay? Yes, um, Victoria, did Georgia wanna speak or um, not at this time? Uh, can you still, am I muted? No. Um, do you want to add anything? Else? No. She concurs. <laughs> I concur. <Okay. laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. So, um, Chair Horseman, I do see that John Kay has his hand up again. I believe this is John Kukowski that commented earlier, but what I want to do is allow him to speak so I can ask him if there's somebody there with him um, in his presence that would also like to speak. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, Mr. Kukowski, I have allowed you to speak. You have already commented tonight, but I wanna see if there's somebody there present with you that you are um, enabling with your device to speak that needed a chance to speak as well. If you can just unmute yourself and answer that. I'm sorry, say again, this is John Kukowski. Mr. Kukowski, I saw your hand was raised again. You already commented tonight, but I wanted to verify and, and just make sure well, that there isn't somebody with you, um, a neighbor or something that's with you that needed to speak as well. Uh, no, I'm by myself, but I wanna thank the board. And I think going forward, no matter how they vote today, I recommend Mr. that- I'm, I'm really sorry. sorry, but we do have to have uh, equal access and equal rules that apply during the public hearing. And so, Everyone was given three minutes. Uh, we uh, did hear from you and your uh, spouse, and we do appreciate you here this evening and, and have heard your comments and quite frankly, your email as well, which are part of the record. So thank you again for joining us and thank you very much for your comments this evening. So anyone else that uh, has not been allowed their three minutes, uh, Lindsay. Chair Horseman, I did want to check. Um, Mr. Kunkel, your hand is up. I just wanted to verify if there's somebody there with you that um, needed to speak during the um, public hearing or not. I actually do have someone sitting here with me because he uh, does not have a computer, so he couldn't join from his house. Thank you. If you could just please state your name and address, you'll be provided three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harold Motes, and my wife is Ruthie Motes. We live at 11675 North Onica Lane. We agree strongly that this is needed. The comments that have been made is definitely true, and we do need the road as soon as possible, because it is terrible to drive on. I live approximately halfway uh, down the street at 11675 North Onica Lane. And even I drive a pickup truck most of the time, and it's terrible to go up and down this road. And especially if you have a lot of snow or mud and rain, it, it just aggravates it that much more. I'm 100% with. John and Kirk and my neighbor, Abel Gallant, who's been working on it, and uh, I want to get it done ASAP. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for uh, joining us this evening. And uh, Mr. Kunkel, thank you for letting him use your, your computer this evening so he could uh, uh, provide his comments. So appreciate as, that very much. As people have said, we have a, we have a really good neighborhood. <laughs> very good. All right, anybody else that has not been provided three minutes to address us? Chair Horseman, at this time, there are no hands raised um, that I can see in the attendees or panelists. Very, very good. Well, this is gonna be the last call then for public comment. Uh, if there anyone else, please raise your hand now so that you can join us and provide your comment. And if not, I am at this point going to close the public meeting portion 
Uh, and I, at this time, will turn to the board and ask the board if they have any follow-up questions or concerns or comments to be made at this time. And okay. Supervisor Ryan? Yeah. I have problems getting my hand into the screen with these uh, backgrounds here. Uh, Madam Chair, you know, uh, just uh, out of deference to Supervisor Vasquez, would it be okay if uh, I, I proceed with comments ahead of you? Yes, absolutely. And I did yeah. note, I, I asked, I guess this is uh, Vice Chair Vasquez. I understand this is in your um, a district. So if you would like to start out with comments first, we'll certainly turn it to you. Otherwise, uh, Supervisor Ryan uh, has some comments to make. Go ahead, Supervisor Ryan. I'll save my comments for last. Thank okay. you. Uh, thank you. Uh, oh, and Vice Chair, pardon, pardon me, sir. <laughs> Um, we just changed chairmanship and vice chairs today, so uh, a little levity back and forth. Uh, this is a, a very serious matter, though, and an evaluation that uh, we all take uh, uh, seriously. Uh, I've been through, I don't know, 20, 20, maybe 30, maybe not 30, some lots of road districts, uh, including uh, uh, big ones uh, associated with communities. Uh, and they're hard to do. Uh, it's it's hard to to go out on the line and attempt to provide an estimate. Uh, and yet the process is designed uh, by statute and in the inverse. Uh, you need to form the district in order to hire the engineer in order to uh, actually uh, initiate your estimates uh, before you go out to contract. Uh, and still you go out to contract and you have to work through that. Uh, I, I am very impressed uh, by the process that's been put together uh, that, uh, you know, uh, good faith efforts to uh, inform uh, the community of uh, the process and what you're trying to do, uh, guaranteed, uh, not uh, almost uh, uh, impossible to get a unanimous. Uh, uh, quite frankly, by statute, you only have to meet a 51 percent. Uh, however, uh, we raised the curb at the board level uh, a long time ago uh, to assure it was more than just a couple of people uh, that you had uh, a reasonably uh, decent support beyond the 50 uh, percent for road maintenance districts. And, and just more recently, we upped that number even more so. Uh, and uh, uh, you far exceed uh, those numbers. So. And, and what we need to look at, um, you know, uh, initially we went through questioning. We had validation provided by uh, uh, our attorney's uh, evaluation of what we looked at, but also by our, our own confirmation uh, for our sake. Uh, we heard from our assessor uh, that you have met um, the basic guidelines of, of forming a district uh, to uh, have achieved the percentage needed by residents uh, of the district. Uh, and uh, you have a proposal of uh, board members here uh, that are also uh, registered voters, which is a qualification needed uh, should we decide to approve the district. Um, and, and listening to the public testimony, even beyond uh, those measures, uh, to help us uh, further achieve our perception of uh, public convenience, necessity, and welfare. The hard one for Rose to pin down because you have four, five different board members or four different board members in this case uh, that will interpret that. Um, uh, my interpretation of it is uh, uh, you most certainly uh, are achieving those objectives, uh, not only for the concern uh, of uh, public safety as outlined uh, with first responders, uh, 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 safety measures caused by uh, the condition of the road itself, uh, also impact uh, associated with uh, property even further on, uh, the shared uh, well, actually, the liability that each member has, uh, if you form this district, you have noted in there uh, an assumption uh, of that uh, uh, the district 
uh, putting together a liability component uh, associated with this. Uh, so you achieve that objective uh, with that. Um, dust, speed, uh, uh, also uh, damage to property, um, excessive speeds, uh, and, and the other piece, uh, you know, and actually hearing it, uh, as I've seen over and over again, often when you have private easements, uh, uh, you get one or two or maybe five people that contribute. It sounds like you, you have a lot more, but not everybody does uh, by forming a, a, a public uh, road maintenance district. Uh, it, it achieves some level of equity uh, and the benefits, uh, uh, distance, uh, that's all, that can always be argued. Uh, uh, you have a board that will help you with that, but you also have an engineer uh, on uh, if you, this is form to help lay out uh, the most reasonable um, application of formula if you decide to go by formula, which you, it sounds like uh, you have been uh, suggesting uh, with that. Uh, so it, it, it's easily, it's very easy for me to make the findings that this achieves the uh, intent of uh, uh, or uh, a public convenience, necessity, and, and welfare with it. Uh, the, the question about whether you can get into uh, uh, the county system, uh, road maintenance districts could also be a mechanism uh, that uh, ha allows you to incrementally move towards what our standards are. So it doesn't prohibit uh, the approaching us in the future informing a regular road improvement district where the county uh, assumes maintenance associated with it. Uh, but the burden is, is quite high. We had set standards uh, uh, because we have uh, limited retrieval of uh, uh, the revenues that we need for the full maintenance of uh, county systems. So uh, in essence, you might even achieve a better uh, objective uh, through a road maintenance district. So, uh, from all the testimony uh, I have heard uh, tonight, um, you know, it, it will be very easy for me to make the, the findings. And, and I, you know, I'll return the shout out to uh, 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 Rebecca Seeger, who serves on the governor's uh, military uh, uh, affairs committee. Uh, it was nice to see. It's been a long time, Rebecca, uh, on that note. Uh, however, for the sake of uh, the district, uh, uh, you know, that, that helps me lay uh, my interpretation uh, of achieving uh, the bar that you need to form a road maintenance district. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, uh, taking us through the uh, requirements and uh, the information that was presented here this evening. And Vice Chair um, Vasquez, this is in your district. Do you have any comments to make at this time? Yeah, I'd just like to say um, I recognize this is important uh, for the community out on Annika Lane and, and uh, I, I based on both the written and oral uh, support for this uh, for this uh, road district. Uh, I'm leaning towards supporting it because of the fact that the majority of the community has mentioned uh, their support for it. I do recognize the concerns and, you know, just want to really recommend that your board look into those costs and, and see how you can make it beneficial for everybody and uh, be aware of any of those hidden costs or hidden uh, surprises that come out. But based on the majority of the, the support, um, I look forward to seeing what this, uh, what this road maintenance district will do moving forward. Thank you, uh, uh, Vice Chair. And I have received a text um, from Judy indicating that she believes that the, uh, has no further questions and, and believes they've met their burden at this point. Uh, and I will just for myself make a note that I also find based on the information presented uh, in our packets and also in the testimony that was presented by the numerous uh, witnesses that came before us on this public hearing, I find that the process was in fact uh, uh, met by the applicant and also that the uh, statutory requirements for the application uh, as required by the, the statute were also met. And that based again on the public testimony that was presented here, the extensive public testimony, 
uh, that the requirement of public convenience, necessity, uh, and welfare was met, both because of public safety, uh, because of concerns on essential services, because of excessive dust speeding the terrible driving conditions of the road, uh, that this is a danger to the property owners and, <clears throat> and children that live along the road, uh, that has affected property values, uh, and that this road improvement district would in fact be a benefit to the property owners uh, and would meet the statutory burden uh, for a road improvement district. So given the comments that were made, are there any other comments uh, by members of the board? Supervisor Ryan. Yeah, my apologies, just uh, as noted and as uh, uh, outlined in the position, uh, uh, one other uh, uh, condition to, to benefit the uh, convenience and welfare of the community is uh, uh, drainage. Uh, uh, improvements to be added to the district as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that was a good important point. So um, with that, we're really down uh, to uh, a time for me to entertain a motion uh, by the board on uh, the resolution before us for the creation of a road maintenance district. Uh, do I have uh, a motion by a member of the Board of Supervisors? Uh, to defer to uh, uh, Vice Chair uh, uh, Vasquez. Vice Chair Vasquez, I would do that, and he was raising his hand, so I was going to go there. So, uh, Vice Chair Vasquez, would you like to make the motion? Yeah. You're, yeah. you're muted. You're still muted. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Apologize for that. Um, I said, uh, I would like to make the motion that we approve the road maintenance district for Annika Lane at this time. And uh, would you accept the uh, resolution number 2022-04 as presented and set forth in our packets? Yes. Then we'll that'll be part of the motion then. Yes. <laughs> Madam uh, Chair, I, I, I would like to second the motion noting uh, as outlined uh, in the discussion prior to the motion that the findings have been uh, met uh, for uh, forming this uh, road improvement district. Thank you. Will you will you accept that addition to your motion, Vice Chair Vasquez? Yes, I accept that addition to the motion. Very good. So we do have a motion and a second to accept the resolution number twenty twenty two zero four for the establishment of the Annika Lilac Road Maintenance District of Coconino County. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those against, nay. Any abstentions? The road maintenance district, and there's an I from Judy Begay, the road maintenance district is uh, unanimous and passes unanimously. All right, Mr. Conkle, thank you uh, for joining us this evening and for bringing this to the board. Uh, and uh, I know you'll be working forward on getting the road maintenance district board up and running and uh, thank you, it's good to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Madam Chair. Um, and I'd like to thank all the board members who are here tonight and I'd like to apologize right now if you hear that shrill shrieking in the background, that's my neighbors. I think the party's getting started. <laughs> Very good, well. Appreciate this all your efforts to your support. In, in, in this weather, I hope they're all very careful and stay off that road, so. The same to all of you if you're driving tonight. Very Thank good. you for your time. Thank you. All right, members of the board, we have now come to the end of our meeting. It is 7.50 uh, and it is time to adjourn. So once again, it's been a long day. Thank you all very much. And, and uh, uh, Mr. County Manager and your staff, thank you so much for uh, being here with us and for assisting us and Lucinda Andriani for assisting us on this road maintenance district. It's the first time I've done the road maintenance district, so it was a learning process. And thank you, Supervisor Ryan, for your help taking us through this. So you all have a wonderful evening and uh, be safe out there. We'll do. Take care. Thank you. Bye. I, I didn't take you through it. Uh, uh, you know, that was a very impressive, uh, a very impressive process that was put together. Uh, uh, but uh, you all did a great job. And, uh, thank you.
Yeah. 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 Our staff makes us look good all the time. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Madam Chair, you'll notice that we're no, we're finishing a lot earlier than we had anticipated. So, awesome. yeah, I'm, uh, just, I'm, I'm just noting there's a board member that is not commenting. Uh, her, she's in a coordination position there. Sorry about it. <laughs> Chair is the chair now. Take care. Bye. Good night, all. Have a great night. Be safe out there. We'll do. Yeah, take care, everybody.